The Old Case of Poetry in a New Court by Francis Barton Gummere From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humour, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Craig Franklin Sonia Jason in Canada Lian Yao Thomas Peter and Fong. The Old Case of Poetry in a New Court Although hailed as queen of the arts and hedged about by kind of divinity, poetry seems to sit on an always tottering throne. In nearly every age known to human records, someone has chronicled his forebodings that the days of poetry were numbered. And again, the critic or the poet himself has plucked up his courage and uttered a fairly hopeful defence. Yet even this hope has been absent from periods which now seem poetic in the highest degree. Michael Drayton could find scant consolation for his art, dedicating certain poems to gentlemen who, in these declining times, love and cherish neglected poesy. The enemies of poetry are always alert, and often come disguised as friends. When, at the end of the Middle Ages, moralists ceased to attack the poets, there appeared the man of science, a far more formidable person, and, under cover of the dust and smoke in strong battle waged between these open foes, poetry has been spoiled of one cherished possession after another at the hands of a professedly ardent ally. Horace Walpole's alternative neatly implied the whole question under debate. Poetry, he complained, is gone to bed or into our prose. An odd speech for one who helped to ring the romantic rising bell. Bulwer, writing ponderously on certain principles of art in works of the imagination, was sure that prose had come to be the only medium of artistic narrative. Malicious people point even now to a language which never had any prose, and yet has lost its splendid heritage of verse. Barring Grilparza, silent long before his death, Germany has not seen a poet for the last fifty years. But, answers the optimist, who knows what ambulando argument for poetry is not now preparing somewhere in the fatherland. And as for Bulwer, his ink was hardly dry when Tennyson began those charming and miscalled idylls of the king. If epic poetry seems dead just now, it seemed quite as dead four hundred years ago in France. So this harmless war is waged. What comes of it all? What has been done? What progress? Other causes come up. Find a hearing on the evidence, get a verdict more or less in agreement with the facts, and go upon record. This case lies hopeless in chancery. Why must it wait here, along with all the old metaphysical questions, for a decision that never can be handed down? If one may do nothing else, one may at least take the case to a different court. Demand fresh evidence an appeal to another code of laws. Before all things, it behooves both parties to this argument to come at the facts in the case. Barring a threat or so of historical treatment, as in Macaulay's famous essay on Milton, writers who handle this matter of the decline of poetry invariably pass either into critical discussion of more or less value in itself, or else into amiable hysterics. To speak brutal truth, hysterics are preferred, and little else is recognized. It is all very well to say that the study of poetry has been put on a scientific basis. The mass of readers who are interested in poetry, the mass of reviewers, and one finds this true in quite unexpected quarters, care for no scientific basis at all. In other words, they exclude from their study of poetry a good half of the facts of poetry. In any living science, one begins by finding and grouping all the facts, 
high and low alike and one then proceeds to establish the relations of these facts on lines of record and comparison the facts of poetry should be conterminous with the whole range of poetic material and when one faces this material one has to do with an element in human life although the ordinary writer seems to think that he degrades his subject by taking such an attitude he searches for the cause and fact of poetry in a sphere outside of human life removed from ordinary human conditions and touching only an infinitesimal part of the sum of poetic material true there is nothing nobler than the effort to reckon with great poetry and competent critics who succeed in this must always hold a conspicuous place in letters but great poetry and the great critic are not all poetry high or low as product of a human impulse and as constant element in the life of man belongs to that history which has been defined of late as concrete sociology the study of human society itself and it is on this ground and not in criticism that the question of the decline of poetry must be asked and answered the task of poetics as yet almost untried is to make clear the relations between higher and lower forms like war marriage worship magic personal adornment and a dozen other institutions of this sort poetry is an element in human life which seems to go back to the beginnings of society trustworthy writers even say it was one of the more conspicuous factors in the making of society and when one is asked whether poetry that is emotional rhythmic utterances must be regarded as a decreasing factor in contemporary social progress one faces a question of sociological as well as of literary interest and one must answer it on broader ground than biographical criticism in clearer terms than can be furnished by those old hysterics about genius to treat the question as it is almost invariably treated to make it an ingenious speculation whether any more great poets can arise under our modern conditions whether goethe if he were born now would not be simply a great naturalist and whether robert browning or huxley better solve the riddle of the painful earth all this is to keep up an unwholesome separation of poetics from vital and moving sciences and to make the discussion itself mere chatter the advantage in this sociological study of poetry is that it can keep abreast of other sciences the oars dip into actual water the boat moves whether with the current of opinion or against it and the landscape changes for one's pains anything is better than the old rowing machines or rather than the theatrical imitation of a boat with the sliding scenery and the spectators that pay to be fooled moreover it is wide scientific work not laboratory methods so-called like countings of words curves of expression and all such pleasant devices that rarely mount above the mechanical in method and the wholly external in results in sociological poetics one is dealing with the life of the race and with the heart of man f schlegel's famous word about art in general holds firm here the science of poetry is the history of poetry history in its widest and deepest sense the futile character of poetic studies springs from that fatal ease with which a powerful thinker sets down thoughts about poetry and from the reluctance to undertake such hard work as confronts even our powerful thinker when he is minded to know the facts to get the wide outlook one must climb to get the deep insight one must analyze and order and compare now the pity of it is that this outlook and this insight this appreciation of a masterpiece and this knowledge of the vast material of which it is part are not only rarely achieved in themselves but are seldom if ever united the great poems are studied apart and as a group more or less stable they form what is known as poetry detached from the mass of verse and so from the social medium where all poetry begins and grows 
they are referred to those conditions of genius which can tell at best but half the tale while that the very mass of verse which one concedes to the social group that unregarded rhythmic utterance of field and festival in which communal emotion the agitating joys and sorrows of the common people found and still finds vent is left as a fad of ethnologists and folklore societies but the material thus divided belongs together each half should explain the other half and such an unscientific rejection of material must take poetics hopelessly out of the running this plea for a more comprehensive range of material holds good not only in the discussion of poetry in general its origins history future but in the study of the great poem itself take something that everyone reads and even macaulay schoolboy studies the lycidas of milton reader critic biographer have long since come to terms with the poem it stirs heart and mind it belongs to the masterpieces it voices the genius of milton it echoes puritan england here one usually stops but here one should not stop lycidas as a poem is the outcome of human emotion in long reaches of social progress it is primarily a poem of grief for the dead a link in that chain of evolution in rhythmic utterance which leads from wild gestures and inarticulate cries up to the stately march of Milton's verse and the higher mood of his thought. So far from degrading one's conception of great poetry, the comparison of rough communal verse should throw into strongest relief the dignity and the majesty of a poet's art. One has taken this poet from his parochial limits and set him strongly lighted at the front of a great stage with its dim background full of half-seen, strangely moving figures. His song is now detached from a vast chorus of human lamentation, and now sinks back into it as into its source. In certain great elegies, as also in the hymeneal, this chorus actually lingers as a refrain. True, the individuals of the chorus are seldom interesting in themselves, the black fellow of Australia should not soothe our grief with his powlings for his dead, nor even the Corsican widow with her vocero. But the chorus, as chorus, is impressive enough. It is a part of the piece. Heard or unheard, it belongs with the triumphs of individual art. Somewhere, in every great poem, lurks this legacy of communal song. It may better be called the silent partner without whose capital, at the least, no poet can now trade in Parnassian ware. And as for lyric verse, there the partner is not even silent. All amorous lyric, whether of German Walter or of Roman Catulus, holds an echo of festal throngs singing and dancing at the May. The troubadours come down to us with proud names, yet they are only spokesmen of an aristocratic guild, and this again was but a sifting and a refinement of the throngs which danced about their Regine Avrilus a thousand years ago. It was once lad and lass in the crowd. It comes to be lover and high-born dame at daybreak, with a warning from the watcher on the castle walls. Then that vogue passes, with all its songs that seem to sing themselves. The situation has grown deplorably unconventional, and the note is false. Amorous lyric waxes mere grave, taking on a new privacy of utterance, and a new individuality of tone. It is now the subtle turn of thought, and not the cadence of festal passion, which sets off Lovelace's one perfect song from all its kind. Yet, without that throb of passion, that rhythm as of harmonious steps, one of them a piece of human nature, and the other a legacy from the throng. Lovelace had never made his verse, and there would be no lyric in the world. Poetry is thus a genesis in the throng, then an exodus with the solitary poet, then, though this is too often forgotten, a return to the throng. At least it is so with the great poets. Not the poet, but the verse-smith, 
the poetaster, is anxious to deny his parentage and communal song and to set for his excellent differences. He will daze the editor and force his way into the magazine by tricks of expression, a new adjective, a shock of strange collocations. In a steamboat on the Baltic I once met a confidential soul who told me of his baffled designs upon the vogue of modern fiction. He had written, it seemed, a novel without a woman in it, and he had printed this novel in red ink. And I am not famous yet, he sighed. So with one kind of minor poet, he works through eccentricities in red ink. He is like Jean-Paul's army chaplain Schmelzel, who, when a boy in church, was so often tempted to rise and cry aloud, Here am I too, Mr. Parson. It is not so with the great poets, not so even with those poets whom one may not call great, but who know how to touch the popular heart. All the masters, Homer, Shakespeare, Goethe, even Dante, win their greatest triumphs by coming back to simplicity in form and diction as to the source of all poetic expression. Or, to put it more scientifically, in any masterpiece one will find the union of individual genius, that harmony of voices and sympathy of hearts achieved by long ages of poetic evolution working in the social mass. If such a range of poetic material is needed even in criticism, how strictly must it be demanded in any question about the art as a whole? One may turn from history to prophecy, but poetry must still be studied even more rigidly in its full range and with regard to all human elements in the case. Because the communal elements, once so plain and insistent, now elude all but the most searching gaze, that is no reason for leaving them out of the account. Hennequin saw that simply for critical purposes one must reckon not only with the maker of poetry, but with the consumer as well, and the student of poetry at large must go still farther. It is, after all, only a remnant who choose and enjoy great poetry, just as it is only a remnant who follow righteousness in private life and probity in civic standards. But what of cakes and ale? What of the uncritical folk? What stands now, since people have come indoors, for the old ring of dancers, the old songs of May and Harvest Home? Does the lapse of these mean a lapse in poetry at large? Or what has taken their place? How shall one dispose of the room over a village store, the hot stove, the folk in Sunday dress, and the young woman who draws tears down the very grocer's cheek as she renders curfew shall not ring to-night? What of the never-ending crop of songs in street and concert hall and on the football field, verses that still time the movements of labour and the steps of a marching crowd? What of homely, comfortable poetry too, commonplace perhaps, but dear to declaiming youth. Only a staff cut from Sophoclean timber will support your lonely dreamer as he makes his way over the moral. But the common citizen who does most of the world's work, and who has more to do with the future of poetry than a critic will concede, finds his account in certain smooth, didactic, and mainly cheerful verses which appear in the syndicate newspapers and will never attain a magazine or an anthology. If singing throngs keep rhythm alive, it is this sort of poets that must both make and mend the paths of genius. Commonplace is a poor word. Horace gives one nothing else, but a legion of critics shall not keep us from Horace, and even Matthew Arnold, critic as he was, fell back for his favourite poem on that seventh ode of the fourth book, as errant commonplace as Gray's elegy itself. Members of a Browning society have been known to descend earthward by reading Longfellow. If minor poets and obvious popular poems ever disappear, and if crowds ever go dumb, then better and best poetry itself will be dead as King Pandion. No absent-minded beggar, no recessional. Whoever, then, will tell the truth about poetry's part in the world of today and tomorrow must not only know the course of all poetry through all the yesterdays, but must keep all its present manifestations, all its elements, sources, and allies at his command. Not only the lords of verse are to advise him, 
he shall take counsel with scullions and potboys. It is that poet in every man, about whom St. Beuve discoursed, who can best tell of the future of poetry. The enormous heed paid to the great and solitary poets, as if there could be a poet without audience or reader, has distorted our vision until we think of poetry as a quite solitary performance, a refuge from the world. Is not poetry really a flight from self and solitude to at least a conventional imaginative society? Poetry by its very form is a convention, an echo of social consent. With its aid one may forget personal debit and credit in the great account of humanity. Now, as in the beginning, poetry is essentially social. Its future is largely a social problem. How far, then, has man ceased to sing in crowds and taken to thinking by himself? What is the shrinkage, quality as well as quantity, in the proportion of verse to prose since the invention of printing? Is the loss of so much communal song in daily toil, in daily merriment, like the cutting away of those forests which hold the rains and supply the great rivers? Waiting for complete and trustworthy studies of humanity, which shall answer some of those queries, one may venture an opinion on the general case. Just as one feels that forests may vanish, and yet in some way the mighty watercourses must be fed, so with poetry. Nothing has yet been found to take the place of rhythm as sign of social consent, the union of steps and voices in common action and whatever intellectual or spiritual consolation may reach the lonely thinker, emotion still drives him back upon the sympathy of man with man. Human sympathy is thus at the heart of every poetic utterance, whether humble or great. Rhythm is its outward and visible, once audible sign, and poetry, from this point of view, would therefore seem to be an enduring element in our life. Francis Barton Gamir End of The Old Case of Poetry in a New Court by Francis Barton Gamir This recording is in the public domain. Iphigenia and Agamemnon by Walter Savage Lander From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the narrator, and Sonia as Iphigenia. Iphigenia and Agamemnon Iphigenia, when she heard her doom at Aulis, and when all besides the king had gone away, took his right hand and said, O oh, father, I am young and very happy. I do not think the pious Calchas heard distinctly what the goddess spake old age obscures the senses if my nurse who knew my voice so well sometimes misunderstood while i was resting on her knee both arms and hitting it to make her mind my words and looking in her face and she in mine might not he also hear one word amiss spoken from so far off even from olympus the father placed his cheek upon her head and tears dropped down it but the king of men replied not then the maiden spake once more o oh, father sayest thou nothing hearest thou not me whom thou ever hast until this hour listened to fondly and awakened me to hear my voice amid the voice of birds when it was inarticulate as theirs and the down deadened it within the nest he moved her gently from him, silent still, and this, and this alone brought tears from her, although she saw fate nearer. Then, with sighs, I thought to have laid down my hair before benignant Artemis, and not dimmed her polished altar with my virgin blood. I thought to have selected the white flowers to please the nymphs, and to have asked of each by name, and with no sorrowful regret whether since both my parents willed the change i might at hymen's feet bend my clipped brow and after these who mind us girls the most adore our own athene that she would regard me mildly with her azure eyes but father 
to see you no more and see your love o oh, father go ere i am gone gently he moved her off and drew her back bending his lofty head far over hers and the dark depths of nature heaved and burst he turned away not far but silent still she now first shuddered for in him so nigh so long a silence seemed the approach of death and like it once again she raised her voice o oh, father if the ships are now detained and all your vows move not the gods above when the knife strikes me there will be one prayer the less to them and purer can there be any or more fervent than the daughter's prayer for her dear father's safety and success a groan that shook him shook not his resolve an aged man now entered and without one word stepped slowly on and took the wrist of the pale maiden she looked up and saw the fillet of the priest and calm cold eyes then turned she where her parent stood and cried o oh, father grieve no more the ships can sail end of poem this recording is in the public domain the sacrifice of polyxena from hecuba by euripides translated from the greek by john eddington simmons from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for librivox dot org by sonia as the narrator phone as polyxena craig franklin as talthibius thomas peter as achilles son and the anya as the argive host the sacrifice of polyxena from hecuba it had been determined by the victorious greeks to sacrifice polyxena the daughter of priam king of ilium and his wife hecuba on the tomb of the slain achilles odysseus sent by the greeks to fetch the maiden turned a deaf ear to the entreaties of the mother and polyxena herself addresses the greek i see thee how beneath thy robe o king thy hand is hidden thy face turned from mine lest i should touch thee by the beard and pray fear not thou hast escaped the god of prayers for my part i will rise and follow thee driven by strong need yea and not loath to die lo if i should not seek death i were found a cowardly life-loving selfish soul for why should i live was my sire not king of all broad phrygia thus my life began then i was nurtured on fair bloom of hope to be the bride of kings no small dissuit i ween of lovers seeking me thus i was once ah woe is me of idan dames mistress and queen mid maidens like a star conspicuous peer of gods except for death and now i am a slave this name alone makes me in love with death so strange it is later in the drama follows the account of the heroic death of polyxena described to the unhappy hecuba by the herald Talthibius. the whole vast concourse of the athean host stood round the tomb to see your daughter die achilles son taking her by the hand placed her upon the mound and i stayed near and youths the flower of greece a chosen few with hands to check thy heifer should she be bound attended from a cup of carven gold raised full of wine achilles son poured forth libation to his sire and bade me sound silence throughout the whole archaean host i standing there cried in the midst these words silence archaeans let the host be still hush hold your voices breathless stayed the crowd but he o son of peleus father mine take these libations pleasant to thy soul draughts that allure the dead come 
drink the black pure maiden's blood wherewith the host and i sue thee be kindly to us loose our prows and let our barks go free give safe return homeward from troy to all and happy voyage such words he spake and the crowd prayed assent then from the scabbard by its golden hilt he drew the sword and to the chosen youths signalled that they should bring the maid but she knowing her hour was come spake thus and said o men of argos who have sacked my town lo of free will i die let no man touch my body boldly will i stretch my throat nay but i pray you set me free then slay that free i thus may perish mong the dead being a queen i blush to be called slave the people shouted and King Agamemnon bade the youths loose the maid and set her free. She, when she heard the orders of the chiefs, seized her mantle from the shoulder down to the soft centre of her snowy waist, tore it, and showed her breasts and bosom fair as in a statue, bending then with knee on earth, she spake a speech most piteous. See you this breast, O youth, if breast you will strike it take heart or if beneath my neck lo here my throat is ready for your sword he willing not yet willing pity stirred in sorrow for the maiden with his blade severed the channels of her breath blood flowed and she though dying still had thought to fall in seemly wise hiding what eyes should not see but when she breathed her life out from the blow, then was the Argive host in divers' way, of service parted for some, bringing leaves, strewed them upon the corpse, some piled a pyre, dragging pine trunks and boughs, and he who bore none heard from the bearers many a bitter word. Standest thou, villain? Hast thou then no robe, no funeral honours for the maid to bring? wilt thou not go and get for her who died most nobly bravest sold some gift thus they spake of thy child in death o thou most blessed of women in thy daughter most undone end of poem this recording is in the public domain parasius by nathaniel parker willis from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter as the narrator, and Jason in Canada as Parhasius. Parhasius. There stood an unsold captive in the mart, a gray-haired and majestical old man, chained to a pillar. It was almost night, and the last seller from the place had gone, and not a sound was heard but of a dog crunching beneath the stall a refuse bone, or the dull echo from the pavement rung, as the faint captive changed his weary feet. He had stood there since morning, and had borne from every eye in Athens the cold gaze of curious scorn. The Jew had taunted him for an Olynthian slave. The buyer came and roughly struck his palm upon his breast, and touched his unhealed wounds, and with a sneer passed on. And when, with weariness or spent, he bowed his head in a forgetful sleep, the inhuman soldier smote him, and with the threats of torture to his children, summoned back the ebbing blood into his pallid face. It was evening, and the half-descended sun tipped with a golden fire the many domes of Athens, and a yellow atmosphere lay rich and dusky in the shaded street through which the captive gazed. He had borne up with a stout heart that long and weary day, haughtily patient of his many wrongs, but now he was alone, and from his nerves the needless strength departed, and he leaned prone on his massy chain, and let his thoughts throng on him as they would. 
Unmarked of him, Parasius at the nearest pillar stood, gazing upon his grief. The Athenian's cheek flushed as he measured with a painter's eye the moving picture. The abandoned limbs, stained with the oozing blood, were laced with veins swollen to purple fullness. The grey hair, thin and disordered, hung about his eyes. And as a thought of wilder bitterness rose in his memory, his lips grew white, and the fast workings of his bloodless face told what a tooth of fire was at his heart. The golden light into the painter's room streamed richly, and the hidden colors stole from the dark pictures radiantly forth, and in the soft and dewy atmosphere, like forms and landscapes magical, they lay. The walls were hung with armor, and about in the dim corners stood the sculptured forms of Cytheris and Dian and stern Jove, and from the casement soberly away fell the grotesque long shadows, full and true, and like a veil of filmy mellowness, the lint specks floated in the twilight air. Parasius stood, gazing forgetfully upon his canvas. There Prometheus lay, chained to the cold rocks of Mount Caucasus, the vulture at his vitals, and the lynx of the lame Lemnian festering in his flesh. And as the painter's mind felt through the dim, rapt mystery, and plucked the shadows forth with its far-reaching fancy, and with form and colour clad them, his fine, earnest eye flashed with a passionate fire, and the quick curl of his thin nostril and his quivering lip were like the winged god's breathing from his flight. Bring me the captive now. My hand feels skilful, and the shadows lift from my waked spirit airily and swift, and I could paint the bow upon the bended heavens. Around me play colors of such divinity today. Ha! Bind him on his back. Look as Prometheus in my picture here. Quick, or he faints, stand with the cordial near. Now bend him to the rack. Press down the poisoned links into his flesh, and tear agape that healing wound afresh. So let him writhe. How long will he live thus? Quick, my good pencil now, what a fine agony works upon his brow. Ha! gray-haired and so strong, how fearfully he stifles that short moan. Gods, if I could just paint a dying groan! Pity thee, so I do, I pity the dumb victim at the altar. But does the robed priest for his pity falter? I'd rack thee, though I knew a thousand lives were perishing in thine. What were ten thousand to a fame like mine? Hereafter, ay, hereafter, a whip to keep a coward to his track. What gave death ever from his kingdom back to check the skeptic's laughter? Come from the grave to-morrow with that story, and I may take some softer path to glory. No, no, old man, we die even as the flowers, and we shall breathe away our life upon the chance wind, even as they. Strain well thy fainting eye, for when that bloodshot quivering is o'er, the light of heaven will never reach thee more. Yet there's a deathless name, a spirit that the smothering vault shall spurn, and like a steadfast planet mount and burn, and though its crown of flame consumed my brain to ashes as it shone, by all the fiery stars I'd bind it on. Ay, though it bid me rifle my heart's last fount for its insatiate thirst, though every life-strung nerve be maddened first, Though it should bid me stifle the yearning in my throat for my sweet child, And taunt its mother till my brain went wild, All, I would do it all, sooner than die like a dull worm, To rot, thrust foully into earth to be forgot. O oh, heaven, but I appall your heart, old man, forgive, ha, On your lives let him not faint, rack him till he revives. Vain, vain, give o'er, his eye glazes apace, 
he does not feel you now stand back i'll paint the death dew on his brow gods if he do not die but for one moment one till i eclipse conception with the scorn of those calm lips shivering hark he mutters brokenly now that was a difficult breath another wilt thou never come o death look how his temple flutters is his heart still aha lift up his head he shudders gasps jove help him so he's dead how like a mounting devil in the heart rules the unreigned ambition let it once but play the monarch and its haughty brow glows with a beauty that bewilders thought and unthrones peace forever putting on the very pomp of lucifer it turns the heart to ashes and with not a spring left in the bosom for the spirit's lip we look upon our splendour and forget the thirst of which we perish yet hath life many a falser idol there are hopes promising well and love-touched dreams for some and passions many a wild one and fair schemes for gold and pleasure it will only this balk not the soul ambition only gives even of bitterness a beaker full friendship is but a slow awaking dream troubled at best love is a lamp unseen burning to waste or if its light is found nursed for an idle hour then idly broken gain is a grovelling care and folly tires and quiet is a hunger never fed and from love's very bosom and from gain or folly or a friend or from repose from all but keen ambition Will the soul snatch the first moment of forgetfulness to wander like a restless child away oh if there were not better hopes than these were there no palm beyond a feverish fame if the proud wealth flung back upon the heart must canker in its coffers if the lynx falsehood hath broken will unite no more if the deep yearning love that hath not found its like in the cold world must waste in tears if truth and fervour and devotedness finding no worthy altar must return and die of their own fullness if beyond the grave there is no heaven in whose wide air the spirit may find room and in the love of whose bright habitants the lavish heart may spend itself what thrice mocked fools are we end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lucius Junius Brutus, of the Body of Lucretia, from Brutus by John Howard Payne. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Nine, Tragedy and Humor, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Lucius Junius Brutus, over the Body of Lucretia. Would you know why I summoned you together? Ask ye what brings me here. Behold this dagger, clotted with gore. Behold that frozen corse. See where the lost Lucretia sleeps in death. She was the mark and model of the time, the mould in which each female face was formed, the very shrine and sacristy of virtue fairer than ever was a form created by youthful fancy when the blood strays wild and never resting thought is all on fire the worthiest of the worthy not the nymph who met old numa in his hallowed walks and whispered in his ear her strains divine can i conceive beyond her the young choir of vestal virgins bent to her tis wonderful amid the darnel hemlock and base weeds which now spring rife from the luxurious compost spread o'er the realm how this sweet lily rose how from the shade of those ill neighbouring plants her father sheltered her that not a leaf was blighted but arrayed in purest grace she bloomed unsullied beauty 
such perfections might have called back the torpid breast of age to long forgotten rapture such a mind might have abashed the boldest libertine and turned desire to reverential love and holiest affection o oh, my countrymen you all can witness when that she went forth it was a holiday in rome old age forgot its crutch labour its task all ran and mothers turning to their daughters cried there there's lucretia now look ye where she lies that beauteous flower that innocent sweet rose torn up by ruthless violence gone 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 say would ye seek instruction would ye ask what ye should do ask ye yon conscious walls which saw his poisoned brother ask yon deserted street where tullia drove o'er her dead father's course twill cry revenge ask yonder senate house whose stones are purple with human blood and it will cry revenge go to the tomb where lies his murdered wife and the poor queen who loved him has her son their unappeasing ghost will shriek revenge the temples of the gods the all-viewing heavens the gods themselves shall justify the cry and swell the general sound revenge revenge and we will be revenged my countrymen brutus shall lead you on brutus a name which will, when your revenged, be dearer to him than all the noblest titles earth can boast. Brutus, your king, no fellow citizens. If mad ambition in this guilty frame has strung one kingly fibre, yea, but one, by all the gods, this dagger which I hold should rip it out, though it entwined my heart. Now take the body up, bear it before us to tarquin's palace there we'll light our torches and in the blazing conflagration rear a pile for these chaste relics that shall send her soul among the stars on brutus leads you end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Roman Father From Virginia By Thomas Babington Lord Macaulay From The World's Best Poetry Volume 9 Tragedy and Humour Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Lian Yao As the narrator Craig Franklin As Virginius And Jason in Canada As Apius Claudius The Roman Father From Virginia Straightway Virginius led the maid a little space aside, to where the reeking shambles stood, piled up with horn and hide, close to yon low dark archway, where in a crimson flood leaps down to the great sewer the gurgling stream of blood. Hard by, a flesher on a block had laid his whittle down. Virginius caught the whittle up and hid it in his gown. And then his eyes grew very dim, and his throat began to swell, and in a hoarse, changed voice he spake. Farewell, sweet child, farewell. Oh, how I loved my darling, though stern I sometimes be. To thee thou knowest I was not so, who could be so to thee. And how my darling loved me, how glad she was to hear my footstep on the threshold, when I came back last year, and how she danced with pleasure to see my civic crown, and took my sword and hung it up and brought me forth my gown. Now all those things are over. Yes, all thy pretty ways, thy needlework, thy prattle, thy snatches of old lays, and none will grieve when I go forth, or smile when I return or watch beside the old man's bed, or weep upon his urn. The house 
that was the happiest within the roman walls the house that envied not the wealth of capua's marble halls now for the brightness of thy smile must have eternal gloom and for the music of thy voice the silence of the tomb the time is come see how he points his eager hand this way see how his eyes gloat on thy grief like a kite's upon the prey with all his wit he little deems that spurned betrayed bereft thy father hath in his despair one fearful refuge left he little deems that in this hand i clutch what still can save thy gentle youth from taunts and blows the portion of the slave yea and from nameless evil that passes taunt and blow foul outrage which thou knowest not which thou shalt never know then clasp me round the neck once more and give me one more kiss and now mine own dear little girl there is no way but this with that he lifted high the steel and smote her in the side and in her blood she sank to earth and with one sob she died then for a little moment all people held their breath and through the crowded forum was stillness as of death and in another moment break forth from one and all a cry as if the volscians were coming o'er the wall some with averted faces shrieking fled home amain some ran to call a leech and some ran to lift up the slain some felt her lips and little wrist if life might there be found and some tore up their garments fast and strove to stanch the wound in vain they ran and felt and stanched for never truer blow that good right arm had dealt in fight against a volscian foe when appius claudius saw that deed he shuddered and sank down and hid his face some little space with the corner of his gown till with white lips and bloodshot eyes virginius tottered nigh and stood before the judgment seat and held the knife on high o oh, dwellers in the nether gloom avengers of the slain by this dear blood i cry to you do right between us twain and even as appius claudius hath dealt by me and mine deal you by appius claudius and all the claudian line so spake the slayer of his child and turned and went his way but first he cast one haggard glance to where the body lay and writhed and groaned a fearful groan and then with steadfast feet strode right across the market-place unto the sacred street then up sprang appius claudius stop him alive or dead ten thousand pounds of copper to the man who brings his head he looked upon his clients but none would work his will he looked upon his lictors but they trembled and stood still and as virginius through the press his way in silence cleft ever the mighty multitude fell back to right and left and he hath passed in safety unto his woeful home and then they're taken horse to tell the camp what deeds are done in rome end of poem this recording is in the public domain mark antony over the body of caesar from julius caesar act three scene two by william shakespeare from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for LibriVox.org by phone as the narrator jason in canada as mark antony thomas peter as the first citizen lian yao as the second citizen sonia as the third citizen and craig franklin as the fourth citizen mark antony over the body of caesar from julius caesar act three scene two o oh, mighty caesar dost thou lie so low are all thy conquests glories triumphs spoils shrunk to this little measure fare thee well to the people 
friends romans countrymen lend me your ears i come to bury caesar not to praise him the evil that men do lives after them the good is often terred with their bones so let it be with caesar the noble brutus hath told you caesar was ambitious if it were so it was a grievous fault and grievously hath caesar answered it here under leave of brutus and the rest for brutus is an honourable man so are they all all honourable men come i to speak in caesar's funeral he was my friend faithful and just to me but brutus says he was ambitious and brutus is an honourable man he hath brought many captives home to rome whose ransom did the general coffers fill did this in caesar seem ambitious when that the poor have cried caesar hath wept ambition should be made of sterner stuff yet brutus says he was ambitious and brutus is an honourable man you all did see that on the lupercal i thrice presented him a kingly crown which he did thrice refuse was this ambition yet brutus says he was ambitious and sure he is an honourable man i speak not to disprove what brutus spoke but i am here to speak what i do know you all did love him once not without cause what cause withholds you then to mourn for him o oh, judgment thou art fled to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason bear with me my heart is in the coffin there with caesar and i must pause till it come back to me but yesterday the word of caesar might have stood against the world now lies he there and none so poor to do him reverence o oh, masters if i were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage i should do brutus wrong and cassius wrong who you all know are honourable men i will not do them wrong i rather choose to wrong the dead to wrong myself and you than i will wrong such honourable men but here's a parchment with the seal of caesar i found it in his closet tis his will but let the commons hear this testament which pardon me i do not mean to read and they would go and kiss dead caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood yea beg a hair of him for memory and dying mention it within their wills bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue we'll hear the will read it mark antony the, the will the, the will. will we, we will, will hear caesar's, caesar's will, will have patience gentle friends i must not read it it is not meet you know how caesar loved you you are not wood you are not stones but men and being men hearing the will of caesar it will inflame you it will make you mad tis good you know not that you are his heirs for if you should oh what would come of it read the will we'll hear it antony you shall read us the will caesar's will will you be patient will you stay a while i have o'ershot myself to tell you of it i fear i wrong the honourable men whose daggers have stabbed caesar i do fear it they were traitors honourable men the, the will, will the, the testament. testament they were villains murderers the will read the will you will compel me then to read the will then make a ring about the corpse of caesar and let me show you him that made the will shall i descend and will you give me leave come, come down. down nay press not so upon me stand far off stand back room bear back if you have tears prepare to shed them now you all do know this mantle i remember the first time ever caesar put it on twas on a summer's evening in his tent 
that day he overcame the nervii look in this place ran cassius dagger through see what a rent the envious casca made through this the well-beloved brutus stabbed and as he plucked his cursed steel away mark how the blood of caesar followed it as rushing out of doors to be resolved if brutus so unkindly not or no for brutus as you know was caesar's angel judge o oh, you gods how dearly caesar loved him for this was the most unkindest cut of all for when the noble caesar saw him stab ingratitude more strong than traitor's arms quite vanquished him then burst his mighty heart and in his mantle muffling up his face even at the base of pompey's statua which all the while ran blood great caesar fell oh what a fall was there my countrymen then i and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us oh now you weep and i perceive you feel the dint of pity these are gracious drops kind souls what weep you when you but behold our caesar's vesture wounded look you here here is himself marred as you see with traitors good friends good friends let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny they that have done this deed are honourable what private griefs they have alas i know not that made them do it they are wise and honourable and will no doubt with reasons answer you i come not friends to steal away your hearts i am no orator as brutus is but as you know me all a plain blunt man that love my friend and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him for i have neither wit nor words nor worth action nor utterance nor the power of speech to stir men's blood i only speak right on i tell you that which you yourselves do know show you sweet caesar's wounds poor poor dumb mouths and bid them speak for me but were i brutus and brutus antony there were an antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of caesar that should move the stones of rome to rise in mutiny we we mutiny. mutiny we'll burn the house of brutus away then come seek the conspirators yet hear me countrymen yet hear me speak peace, peace oh, oh hear antony, antony. most, most noble, noble antony. antony why friends you go to do you know not what wherein hath caesar thus deserved your loves alas you know not i must tell you then you have forgot the will i told you of most true, true. The, the will, will. let's stand here the will. The will. here is the will and under caesar's seal to every roman citizen he gives to every several man seventy-five drachmas most noble caesar we'll revenge his death o oh, royal caesar hear me with patience peace ho moreover he hath left you all his walks his private arbours and new planted orchards on this side tiber he hath left them to you and to your heirs for ever common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves here was a caesar when comes such another never never come away away we'll burn his body in the holy place and with the brands fire the traitors houses take up the body exeunt citizens with the body now let it work mischief thou art afoot take thou what course thou wilt End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Sack of the City by Victor Marie Hugo, anonymously translated from the French. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Sack of the City Thy will, O King, is done, lighting but to consume. The roar of the fierce flames drowned even the shouts and shrieks, reddening each roof like some day dawn of bloody doom, seemed they in joyous flight to dance above their wrecks. Slaughter his thousand giant arms hath tossed on high, fell fathers, husbands, wives beneath his streaming steel, prostrate the palace's huge tombs of fire lie while gathering overhead the vultures scream and wheel. Died the pale mothers, and the virgins from their arms, O Caliph, fiercely torn, bewailed their young years' blight. With stabs and kisses fouled, all their yet quivering charms at our fleet courser's heels were dragged in mocking flight. Lo! where the city lies mantled in pall of death. Lo, where thy mighty arm hath passed, all things must bend. As the priests prayed, the sword stopped their accursed breath. Vainly their sacred book for shield did they extend. Some infants yet survived, and the unsated steel still drinks the lifeblood of each whelp of Christian hound. To kiss thy sandal's foot, O King, thy people kneel, With golden circlet to thy glorious ankle bound. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Slaying of Sorab From Sorab and Rustum By Matthew Arnold From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 9 Tragedy and Humour Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator, Thomas Peter as Sorab, and Jason in Canada as Rustum. The Slaying of Sorab from Sorab and Rustum. He spake, and Rustum answered not, but hurled his spear down from the shoulder, down it came, as on some partridge in the corn, a hawk that long has towered in the airy clouds, drops like a plummet. Sorab saw it come, and sprang aside, quick as a flash. The spear hissed and went quivering down into the sand, which it sent flying wide. Then Sorab threw, in turn, and full struck Rustam's shield. Sharp rang the iron plates, rang sharp, but turned the spear, and Rustam, seized his club which none but he could wield an unlapping trunk it was and huge still rough like those which men in treeless plains to build them boats fish from the flooded rivers hyphasis or hydaspis when high up by their dark springs the wind in winter time has made in himalayan forests rack and strewn the channels with torn boughs so huge the club which Rustum lifted now and struck one stroke. But again Sorab sprang aside, lithe as the glancing snake, and the club came thundering to earth and leapt from Rustum's hand. And Rustum followed his own blow and fell to his knees, and with his fingers clutched the sand. And now might Sorab have unsheathed his sword and pierced the mighty Rustum while he lay dizzy, and on his knees, and choked with sand. But he looked up and smiled, nor bared his sword, but courteously drew back and spoke and said, Thou strikest too hard. That club of thine will float upon the summer floods, and not my bones. But rise, and be not wroth. Not wroth am I. No, when I see thee, wrath forsakes my soul. Thou sayest thou art not Rustum, be it so. Who art thou, then, that canst so touch my soul? Boy as I am, 
I have seen battles, too, have waded foremost in their bloody waves, and heard their hollow roar of dying men. But never was my heart thus touched before. Are they from heaven, these softenings of the heart? O oh, thou old warrior, let us yield to heaven. Come, plant we here in earth our angry spears, and make a truce, and sit upon this sand, and pledge each other in red wine like friends. And thou shalt talk to me of Rustum's deeds. There are enough foes in the Persian host whom I may meet, and strike, and feel no pang. Champions enough, Aphrasia pass, whom thou mayst fight. Fight them when they confront thy spear. But, oh, let there be peace twixt thee and me. He ceased. But while he spake, Rustum had risen, and stood erect, trembling with rage. His club he left to lie, but had regained his spear, whose fiery point now in his mailed right hand blazed bright and baleful, like the autumn star, the baleful sign of fevers. Dust had soiled his stately crest and dimmed his glittering arms. His breast heaved, his lips foamed, and twice his voice was choked with rage. At last these words broke way. Girl, nimble with thy feet, not with thy hands, curled minion, dancer, coiner of sweet words, fight, let me hear thy hateful voice no more. Thou art not in Afra Saib's gardens now, with Tartar girls, with whom thou art wont to dance, but on the Oxus sands, and in the dance of battle, and with me, who make no play of war, I fight it out, and hand to hand. Speak not to me of truce and pledge and wine. Remember all thy valor. Try thy feints and cunning. All the pity I had is gone, because thou hast shamed me before both the hosts with thy light skipping tricks and thy girl's wiles. He spoke, and Saurabh kindled at his taunts, and he too drew his sword. At once they rushed together as two eagles on one prey come rushing down together from the clouds, one from the east, one from the west. Their shields dashed with a clang together, and a din rose such as the sinewy woodcutters make often in the forest's heart at morn, of hewing axes, crashing trees, such blows Rustum and Saurabh on each other hailed, and you would say that sun and stars took part in that unnatural conflict, for a cloud grew suddenly in heaven, and darkened the sun over the fighters' heads, and a wind rose under their feet, and moaning swept the plain, and in a sandy whirlwind wrapped the pair. In gloom they twain were wrapped, and they alone, for both the onlooking hosts on either hand stood in broad daylight, and the sky was pure, and the sun sparkled on the oxa stream. But in the gloom they fought, with bloodshot eyes and labouring breath, First Rustum struck the shield, which Saurabh held stiff out. The steel-spiked spear rent the tough plates, but failed to reach the skin. And Rustum plucked it back with angry groan. Then Saurabh, with his sword, smote Rustum's helm, nor clove its steel quite through. But all the crest he shore away, and that proud horsehair plume, never till now defiled, sunk to the dust. And Rustum bowed his head. But then the gloom grew blacker, thunder rumbled in the air, and lightnings rent the cloud, and rushed the horse, who stood at hand, uttered a dreadful cry. No hoarse cry was that, more like the roar of some pained desert lion, who all day has trailed the hunter's javelin in his side, and comes at night to die upon the sand. The two hosts heard the cry and quaked for fear, and Oxus curdled as it crossed his stream. But Saurabh heard, and quailed not, but rushed on and struck again, and again Rustum bowed his head. But this time all the blade, like glass, sprang in a thousand shivers on the helm, and in his hand the hilt remained alone. Then Rustum raised his head, 
His dreadful eyes glared, and he shook on high his menacing spear, and shouted, Rustum! Sorab heard that shout, and shrank amazed. Back he recoiled one step, and scanned with blinking eyes the advancing form. And then he stood bewildered, and he dropped his covering shield, and the spear pierced his side. He reeled, and staggered back, sunk to the ground, and then the gloom dispersed, and the wind fell, and the bright sun broke forth and melted all, the cloud. And the two armies saw the pair, saw Rustam standing safe upon his feet, and saw Ab wounded on the bloody sand. Then, with a bitter smile, Rustam began. Sorab, thou thoughtest in thy mind to kill a Persian lord this day, and strip his corpse, and bear thy trophies to Afrasaib's tent, or else that the great Rustam would come down himself to fight, and that thy wiles would move his heart to take a gift, and let thee go. And then all the Tartar host would praise thy courage or thy craft, and spread thy fame, to glad thy father in his weak old age. Fool! Thou art slain, and by an unknown man. Dearer to the red jackals shalt thou be than to thy friends, and to thy father old. And with a fearless mien Sorab replied, Unknown thou art, yet thy fierce vaunt is vain. Thou dost not slay me, proud and boastful man. No, Rustum slays me, and this filial heart for were I matched with ten such men as thou, and I were he who till today I was, they should be lying here, I standing there. But that beloved name unnerved my arm, that name, and something I confess in thee, which troubles all my heart, and made my shield fall, and thy spear transfixed an unarmed foe. And now thou boastest and insultest my fate, but hear thou this, fierce man, tremble to hear. The mighty Rustum shall avenge my death. My father, whom I seek through all the world, he shall avenge my death and punish thee. So Rustum knew not his own loss, but stood over his dying son and knew him not. But with a cold, incredulous voice he said, what prate is this of fathers and revenge? The mighty Rustum never had a son. And with a failing voice, Sorab replied, Ah, yes, he had, and that lost son am I. Surely the news will one day reach his ear, reach Rustum where he sits and tarries long somewhere, I know not where, but far from here and pierce him like a stab, and make him leap to arms, and cry for vengeance upon thee. Fierce man, bethink thee for an only son. What will that grief, what will that vengeance be? Oh, could I live till I that grief had seen? Yet him I pity not so much, but her, my mother, who in Adar Bajan dwells with that old king, her father, who grows grey with age, and rules over the valiant Kurds. Her most I pity, who no more will see Sorab returning from the Tartar camp, with spoils and honour, when the war is done. But a dark rumour will be bruited up, from tribe to tribe, until it reach her ear. And then will that defenceless woman learn that Sorab will rejoice her sight no more. But that in battle with a nameless foe, by the far distant Oxus, he is slain. And Rustum gazed on him with grief and said, O oh, Sorab, thou indeed art such a son whom Rustum, wert thou his, might well have loved. Yet hear thou erest Sorab, or else men have told thee false. Thou art not Rustum's son, for Rustum had no son. One child he had, but one, a girl, who with her mother now plies some light female task, nor dreams of us. 
Of us she dreams not, nor of wounds, nor war. But Sorab answered him in wrath, for now the anguish of the deep-fixed spear grew fierce, and he desired to draw forth the steel, and let the blood flow free, and so to die. But first he would convince his stubborn foe, and rising sternly on one arm he said, Man, who art thou who dost deny my words? Truth sits upon the lips of dying men, and falsehood while I lived was far from mine. I tell thee, pricked upon this arm I bear that seal which Rustum to my mother gave, that she might prick it on the babe she bore. He spoke, and all the blood left Rustum's cheeks, and his knees tottered, and he smote his hand against his breast, his heavy mailed hand, that the hard iron corselet clanked aloud. And to his heart he pressed the other hand, and in a hollow voice he spake, and said, So, Rab, that were a proof which could not lie. If thou show this, then art thou Rustum's son. Then with weak hasty fingers Sorab loosed his belt and near the shoulder bared his arm, and showed a sign in faint vermilion points pricked, as a cunning workman in Pekin pricks with vermilion some clear porcelain vase, an emperor's gift. At early morn he paints, and all day long, and when night comes, the lamp lights up his studious forehead and thin hands. So delicately pricked the sign appeared on Sorab's arm, the sign of Rustum's seal. It was that griffin, which of old reared Zal, Rustum's great father, whom they left to die, a helpless babe among the mountain rocks. Him that kind creature found and reared and loved. Then Rustum took it for his glorious sign, and Sorab bared that figure on his arm and himself scanned it, long with mournful eyes, and then he touched it with his hand, and said, How sayest thou? Is that sign the proper sign of Rustum's son, or of some other man's? He spoke, but Rustum gazed and gazed, and stood speechless, and then he uttered one sharp cry. O oh boy, thy father! and his voice choked there, and then a dark cloud passed before his eyes, and his head swam, and he sank down to earth. But Sorab crawled to where he lay, and cast his arms about his neck, and kissed his lips, and with fond, faltering fingers stroked his cheeks, trying to call him back to life. And life came back to Rustum, and he opened his eyes, and they stood wide with horror, and he seized in both his hands the dust which lay around, and threw it on his head, and smirched his hair, his hair and face and beard and glittering arms, and strong convulsive groaning shook his breast, and his sobs choked him, and he clutched his sword to draw it, and for ever let life out. But Sorab saw his thought and held his hands, and with a soothing voice he spoke and said, Father, forbear, for I but meet today the doom that on my birth was written down in heaven, and thou art heaven's unconscious hand. Surely my heart cried out that it was thou when first I saw thee, and thy heart spoke too, I know it. But fate trod those promptings down under its iron heel. Fate, Fate engaged the strife, and hurled me on my father's spear. But let us speak no more of this. I find my father. Let me feel that I have found. Come, sit beside me on this sand, and take my head betwixt thy hands, and kiss my cheeks, and wash them with thy tears, and say, My son, quick, quick, for numbered are my sands of life, and swift, for like the lightning to this field I came, and like the wind I go away, sudden and swift, and like a passing wind. But it was written heaven that this should be. So said he, and his voice released the heart of Rustum, and his tears broke forth. 
he cast his arms round his son's neck and wept aloud and kissed him and awe fell on both the hosts when they saw rustum's grief and rucksh the horse with his head bowing to the ground and mane sweeping the dust came near and in mute woe first to the one then to the other moved his head as if inquiring what their grief might mean and from his dark compassionate eyes the big warm tears rolled down and caked the sand but rustum chid him with stern voice and said ruksh now thou grievest but o oh, ruksh thy feet should then have rotted on thy nimble joints when first they bore thy master to this field but sorab looked upon the horse and said is this then ruksh how often in past days my mother told me of thee thou brave steed my terrible father's terrible horse and said that i should one day find thy lord in thee come let me lay my hand upon thy mane o ruksh thou art more fortunate than i for thou hast gone where i shall never go and snuffed the breezes of my father's home thou hast trod the sands of seistan and seen the river of helmund and the lake of zerah the aged zal himself has often stroked thy neck and given thee food corn and a golden platter soaked with wine and said o ruksh bear rustum well but i have never known my grandsire's furrowed face nor seen his lofty house in seistan nor slaked my thirst at the clear Helmun stream, but lodged among my father's foes, and seen after Sayab's cities only, Samarkand, Bokhara, and Lone Kiva in the waste, and the black Torkmun tents, and only drunk the desert rivers, Morgab and Tejan, Koik, where the Kalmuks feed their sheep, the northern Sir, and this great Oxus stream the yellow oxus by whose brink i die and with a heavy groan rustum replied oh that its waves were flowing over me oh that i saw its grains of yellow silt roll tumbling in the current o'er my head and with a grave mild voice sorab replied desire not that my father thou must live for some are born to do great deeds and live as some are born to be obscured and die do thou the deeds i die too young to do and reap a second glory in thine age thou art my father and thy gain is mine but come thou seest this great host of men which follow me I pray thee slay not these let me entreat for them what have they done they followed me, my hope, my fame, my star. Let them all cross the oxes back in peace. But me thou must bear hence, not sent with them, but carry me with thee to Seistan, and place me on a bed, and mourn for me. Thou, and the snow-haired Zal, and all thy friends, and thou must lay me in that lovely earth, and heap a stately mound above my bones, and plant a far-seen pillar over all, that so the passing horseman on the waste may see my tomb a great way off, and say, Sorab, the mighty Rostam's son lies there, whom his great father did in ignorance kill, and I be not forgotten in my grave. And, with a mournful voice, Rustam replied, Fear not, as thou hast said sorab my son so shall it be for i will burn my tents and quit the host and bear thee hence with me and carry thee away to seistan and place thee on a bed and mourn for thee with the snow-headed zal and all my friends and i will lay thee in that lovely earth and heap a stately mound above thy bones a plant a far-seen pillar over all and men shall not forget thee in thy grave and i will spare thy host yea let them go 
let them all cross the oxus back in peace what should i do with slaying any more for would that all whom i have ever slain might once more be alive my bitterest foes and they who were called champions in their time and through whose death i won that fame i have and i were nothing but a common man a poor mean soldier and without renown so thou mightest live too my son my son or rather would that i even i myself might now be lying on this bloody sand near death and by an ignorant stroke of thine not thou of mine and i might die not thou and i not thou be born to Seistan, and zal might weep above my grave not thine and say o son i weep thee not too sore for willingly i know thou met'st thine end but now in blood and battles was my youth and full of blood and battles is my age and i shall never end this life of blood then at the point of death sorab replied a life of blood indeed thou dreadful man but thou shalt yet have peace only not now not yet but thou shalt have it on that day when thou shalt sail in a high-masted ship thou and the other peers of kai Khosru, returning home over the salt blue sea from laying thy dear master in his grave and rustum gazed on sorab's face and said soon be that day my son and deep that sea till then if fate so wills let me endure he spoke and sorab smiled on him and took the spear and drew it from his side and eased his wounds imperious anguish but the blood came welling from the open gash and life flowed with the stream all down his cold white side the crimson torrent ran dim now and soiled like the soiled tissue of white violets left freshly gathered on their native bank by romping children whom their nurses call from the hot fields at noon his head drooped low his limbs grew slack motionless white he lay white with eyes closed only when heavy gasps deep heavy gasps quivering through all his frame convulsed him back to life he opened them and fixed them feebly on his father's face till now all strength was ebbed and from his limbs unwillingly the spirit fled away regretting the warm mansion which it left and youth and bloom and this delightful world so on the bloody sand sorab lay dead and the great rustum drew his horseman's cloak down o'er his face and sate by his dead son as those black granite pillars once high reared by jemshid in peresopolis to bear his house now mid their broken flight of steps lie prone enormous down the mountain side so in the sand lay rustum by his son and night came down over the solemn waste and the two gazing hosts and that sole pair and darkened all and a cold fog with night crept from the oxus end of poem this recording is in the public domain Kamsin by clinton scollard from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for LibriVox.org by sonia Kamsin. oh the wind from the desert blew in Kamsin, the wind from the desert blew in it blew from the heart of the fiery south from the fervid sand and the hills of drouth and it kissed the land with its scorching mouth the wind from the desert blew in it blasted the buds on the almond bough and shrivelled the fruit on the orange tree the wizened dervish breathed no vow so weary and parched was he the lean muezzin could not cry the dogs ran mad and bade the sky the hot sun shone like a copper disc and prone in the shade of an obelisk 
the water carrier sank with a sigh for limp and dry was his water skin and the wind from the desert blew in the camel crouched by the crumbling wall and oh the pitiful moan it made the minarets taper and slim and tall reeled and swam in the brazen light and prayers went up by day and night but thin and drawn were the lips that prayed the river writhed in its slimy bed shrunk to a tortuous turbid thread the burnt earth cracked like a cloven rind and still the wind the ruthless wind kamsen the wind from the desert blew in into the cool of the mosque it crept where the poor sought rest at the prophet's shrine its breath was fire to the jasmine vine it fevered the brow of the maid who slept and men grew haggard with revel of wine the tiny fledglings died in the nest the sick babe gasped at the mother's breast then a rumour rose and swelled and spread from a tremulous whisper faint and vague till it burst in a terrible cry of dread the plague the plague the plague oh the wind comes in the scourge from the desert blew in end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Diver by Johann C. F. Schiller Translated anonymously from the German From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator Craig Franklin as the king Thomas Peter as the crowd Thon as the diver And Lian Yao as the king's daughter The Diver Oh, where is the knight or the squire so bold as to dive to the howling Charybdis below? I cast into the whirlpool a goblet of gold, and o'er it already the dark waters flow. Whoever to me may the goblet bring shall have for his guerdon that gift of his king. He spoke, and the cup from the terrible steep that rugged and hoary hung over the verge of the endless and measureless world of the deep swirled into the maelstrom that maddened the surge and where is the diver so stout to go i ask ye again to the deep below and the knights and the squires that gathered around stood silent and fixed on the ocean their eyes they looked on the dismal and savage profound and the peril chilled back every thought of the prize and thrice spoke the monarch the cup to win is there never a white who will venture in and all as before heard in silence the king till a youth with an aspect unfearing but gentle mid the tremulous squires stepped out from the ring unbuckling his girdle and doffing his mantle and the murmuring crowd as they parted asunder on the stately boy cast their looks of wonder as he strode to the marge of the summit and gave one glance on the gulf of that merciless main lo the wave that forever devours the wave cast roaringly up the charybdis again and as with the swell of the far thunder boom rushes foamingly forth from the heart of the gloom and it bubbles and seethes and it hisses and roars as when fire is with water co-mixed and contending and the spray of its wrath to the welkin upsoars and flood upon flood hurries on never ending and it never will rest nor from travail be free like a sea that is labouring the birth of a sea and at last there lay open the desolate realm through the breakers that whitened the waste of the swell dark dark yawned a cleft in the midst of the whelm the path to the heart of that fathomless hell round and round whirled the waves deep and deeper still driven like a gorge through the mountainous main thunder riven the youth gave his trust to his maker 
before that path through the riven abyss closed again hark a shriek from the crowd rang aloft from the shore and behold he is whirled in the grasp of the main and over him the breakers mysteriously rolled and the giant mouth closed on the swimmer so bold over the surface grim silence lay dark and profound but the deep from below murmured hollow and fell and the crowd as it shuddered lamented aloud gallant youth noble heart fare thee well fare thee well and still ever deepening that wail as of woe more hollow the gulf sent its howl from below if thou shouldst in those waters thy diadem fling and cry who may find it shall win it and wear gods what though the prize were the crown of a king a crown at such hazard were valued too dear for never did lips of the living reveal what the deeps that howl yonder in terror conceal o oh, many a ship to that breast grappled fast has gone down to the fearful and fathomless grave again crashed together the keel and the mast to be seen tossed aloft in the glee of the wave like the growth of a storm ever louder and clearer grows the roar of the gulf rising nearer and nearer and it bubbles and seethes and it hisses and roars as when fire is with water co-mixed and contending and the spray of its wrath to the welkin upsoars and flood upon flood hurries on never ending and as with the swell of the far thunder boom rushes roaringly forth from the heart of the gloom and lo from the heart of that far floating gloom what gleams on the darkness so swan-like and white lo an arm and a neck glancing up from the tomb they battle the man with the elements might it is he it is he in his left hand behold as a sign as a joy shines the goblet of gold and he breathed it deep and he breathed it long and he greeted the heavenly delight of the day they gaze on each other they shout as they throng he lives lo the ocean has rendered its prey and out of the grave where the hell began his valour has rescued the living man and he comes with the crowd in their clamour and glee and the goblet his daring has won from the water he lifts to the king as he sinks on his knee and the king from her maidens has beckoned his daughter and he bade her the wine to his cup-bearer bring and thus spake the diver long life to the king happy day whom the rose hues of daylight rejoice the air and the sky that to mortals are given may the horror below never more find a voice nor man stretch too far the wide mercy of heaven never more never more may he lift from the mirror the veil which is woven with night and with terror quick brightening like lightning it tore me along down down till the gush of a torrent at play in the rocks of its wilderness caught me and strong as the winds of an eagle it whirled me away vain vain were my struggles the circle had won me round and round in its dance the wild elements spun me and i called on my god and my god heard my prayer in the strength of my need in the gasp of my breath and showed me a crag that rose up from the lair and i clung to it trembling and baffled to death and safe in the perils around me behold on the spikes of the coral the goblet of gold below at the foot of that precipice drear spread the gloomy and purple and pathless obscure a silence of horror that slept on the ear that the eye more appalled might the horror endure salamander snake dragon vast reptiles that dwell in the deep coiled about the grim jaws of their hell dark crawled glided dark to unspeakable swarms like masses unshapen made life hideously here clung and here bristled the fashionless forms 
Here the hammerfish darkened the dark of the sea, and with teeth grinning white and a menacing motion went the terrible shark, the hyena of ocean. There I hung, and the awe gathered icily o'er me, so far from the earth where man's help there was none, the one human thing with the goblins before me, alone, in a loneless so ghastly, alone, fathom deep from man's eye in the speechless profound, with the death of the main and the monsters around. Methought, as I gazed through the darkness, that now a hundred-limbed creature caught sight of its prey, and darted, O oh God, from the far-flaming bow of the coral I swept on the horrible way, and it seized me, the wave with its wrath and its roar, it seized me to save, King, the danger is o'er. On the youth gazed the monarch, and marvelled, quoth he, Bold diver, the goblet I promised is thine, and this ring will I give a fresh guerdon to thee, Never jewels more precious shone up from the mine. If thou bring me fresh tidings and venture again to say what lies hid in the innermost main. Then out spake the daughter in tender emotion. Oh, father, my father, what more can there rest? Enough of this sport with the pitiless ocean. He has served thee as none would, thyself hast confessed. If nothing can slake thy wild thirst of desire, be your knights not, at least, put to shame by the squire. The king seized the goblet, he swung it on high, and whirling it fell in the roar of the tide. But bring back that goblet again to my eye, and I'll hold thee the dearest that rides by my side, and thine arms shall embrace as thy bride, I decree, the maid whose pity now pleadeth for thee. In his heart, as he listened, there leapt the wild joy, and the hope and the love through his eyes spoke in fire. On that bloom, on that blush, gazed delighted the boy, the maiden she faints at the feet of her sire. Here the guerdon divine, there the danger beneath, he resolves to the strife with the life and the death. They hear the loud surges sweep back in their swell, there coming the thunder sound heralds along. Fond eyes yet are tracking the spot where he fell. They come, the wild waters, in tumult and throng, rearing up to the cliff, roaring back as before. But no wave ever brought the lost youth to the shore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. God's Judgment on a Wicked Bishop by Robert Southey From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator Jason in Canada as Bishop Hatto Lian Yao as the First Farmer And Thomas Peter as the Second Farmer God's Judgment on a Wicked Bishop Hatto, Archbishop of Menz in the year 914, barbarously murdered a number of poor people to prevent their consuming a portion of the food during that year of famine. He was afterwards devoured by rats in his tower on an island in the Rhine. Old Legend The summer and autumn had been so wet that in winter the corn was growing yet. T'was a piteous sight to see all around the grain lie rotting on the ground. Every day the starving poor crowded around Bishop Hatto's door, for he had a plentiful last year's store, and all the neighborhood could tell his granaries were furnished well. At last Bishop Hatto appointed a day to quiet the poor without delay. He bade them to his great barn repair, and they should have food for the winter there. Rejoiced the tidings good to hear, the poor folks flocked from far and near. The great barn was full as it could hold of women and children and young and old. Then, when he saw it could hold no more, Bishop Hatto he made fast the door. And whilst for mercy on Christ they call, 
he set fire to the barn and burnt them all. In faith, tis an excellent bonfire, quoth he, and the country is greatly obliged to me for ridding it in these times forlorn of rats that only consume the corn. So then to his palace returned he, and he sate down to supper merrily, and he slept that night like an innocent man, but Bishop Hatto never slept again. In the morning, as he entered the hall, where his picture hung against the wall, a sweat like death all over him came, for the rats had eaten it out of the frame. As he looked, there came a man from his farm. He had a countenance white with alarm. My lord, I opened your granaries this morn, and the rats had eaten all your corn. Another came running presently, and he was pale as pale could be. Fly, my lord bishop, fly, quoth he. Ten thousand rats are coming this way. The lord forgive you for yesterday. I'll go to my tower in the Rhine, replied he. Tis the safest place in Germany. The walls are high, and the shores are steep, and the tide is strong and the water deep. Bishop Hatto fearfully hastened away, and he crossed the Rhine without delay, and reached his tower, and barred with care all the windows, doors, and loopholes there. He laid him down and closed his eyes, but soon a scream made him arise. He started and saw two eyes of flame on his pillow from whence the screaming came. He listened and looked. It was only the cat, but the bishop he grew more fearful for that, for she sat screaming, mad with fear, at the army of rats that were drawing near. For they have swum over the river so deep, and they have climbed the shore so steep, and now by thousands up they crawl to the holes and the windows in the wall. Down on his knees the bishop fell, and faster and faster his beats did he tell, as louder and louder, drawing near, the saw of their teeth without he could hear. And in at the windows, and in at the door, and through the walls by thousands they pour, and down from the ceiling, and up through the floor, from the right and the left, from behind and before, from within and without, from above and below, and all at once to the bishop they go. They have wetted their teeth against the stones, and now they pick the bishop's bones. They gnawed the flesh from every limb, for they were sent to do judgment on him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Countess Laura by George Henry Boker From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humour, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao as the narrator Jason in Canada as the bishop Thone as the courtiers Craig Franklin as Count Fernando Thomas Peter as Carlo And Sonia as Death Countess Laura it was a dreary day in Padua. The Countess Laura, for a single year, Fernando's wife, upon her bridal bed, like an uprooted lily on the snow, the withered outcast of a festival, lay dead. She died of some uncertain ill that struck her almost on her wedding day, and clung to her and dragged her slowly down, thinning her cheeks and pinching her full lips, till in her chance it seemed that with a year full half a century was overpassed. In vain had Paracelsus taxed his art, and feigned a knowledge of her malady. In vain had all the doctors, far and near, gathered around the mystery of her bed, draining her veins, her husband's treasury, and physics jargon, in a fruitless quest for causes equal to the dread result. The countess only smiled when they were gone, hugged her fair body with her little hands, and turned upon her pillows warily as though she fain would sleep no common sleep, but the long, breathless slumber of the grave. She hinted nothing. Feeble as she was, 
the rack could not have wrung her secret out. The bishop, when he shrived her coming forth, cried, in a voice of heavenly ecstasy, O oh, blessed soul, with nothing to confess save virtues and good deeds, which she mistakes, so humble is she, for our human sins. Praying for death, she tossed upon her bed, day after day, as might a shipwrecked bark that rocks upon one billow, and can make no onward motion towards her port of hope. At length, one morn, when those around her sat, Surely the countess mends, so fresh a light beams from her eyes and beautifies her face. One morn in spring, when every flower of earth was opening to the sun, and breathing up its votive incense, her impatient soul opened itself, and so exhaled to heaven. When the count heard it, he reeled back a pace, then turned with anger on the messenger, then craved his pardon, and wept out his heart before the menial. Tears, ah me, such tears as love sheds only, and love only once. Then he bethought him. Shall this wonder die, and leave behind no shadow, not a trace, of all the glory that environed her, that mellow nimbus circling round my star? So, with a sorrow gleaming in his face, he paced along his gallery of art, and strode among the painters where they stood with Carlo the Venetian at their head, studying the masters by the dawning light of his transcendent genius. Through the groups of gaily vestured artists moved the Count, as some lone cloud of thick and leaden hue, packed with the secret of a coming storm, moves through the gold and crimson evening mists, deadening their splendour. In a moment still was Carlo's voice, and still the prattling crowd, and a great shadow overwhelmed them all as their white faces and their anxious eyes pursued Fernando in his moody walk. He paused, as one who balances a doubt, weighing two courses, then burst out with this. Yet all have seen the tidings in my face, or has the dial ceased to register the workings of my heart? Then hear the bell that almost cracks its frame in utterance. The Countess, she is dead. Dead, Collar groaned and if a bolt from middle heaven had struck his splendid features full upon the brow, he could not have appeared more scathed and blanched. Dead. Dead. He staggered to his easel frame, and clung around it, buffeting the air with one wild arm, as though a drowning man hung to a spar and fought against the waves. The Count resumed. I came not here to grieve, nor see my sorrow in another's eyes. Who'll paint the countess as she lies to-night, in state within the chapel? Shall it be that earth must lose her holy, that no hint of her gold tresses, beaming eyes and lips that talked in silence, and the eager soul that ever seemed outbreaking through her clay and scattering glory round it, shall all these be dull corruption's heritage, and we, poor beggars, have no legacy to show? that love she bore us, that was shame to love and shame to you, my masters. Carlos stalked forth from his easel stiffly, as a thing moved by mechanic impulse. His thin lips and sharpened nostrils and wan, sunken cheeks, and the cold glimmer in his dusky eyes, made him a ghastly sight. The throng drew back, as though they let a spectre through. Then he, fronting the count, and speaking in a voice sounding remote and hollow, made reply. Count, I shall paint the countess. Tis my fate, not pleasure, no, nor duty. But the count, a stray and woe, but understood assent, not the strange words that bore it. And he flung his arm around Carlo, drew him into his breast, and kissed his forehead. At which Carlo shrank, perhaps twas at the honour. Then the count, a little reddening at his public state, unseemly to his near and recent loss, withdrew in haste between the downcast eyes that did him reverence as he rustled by. Night fell on Padua. In the chapel lay the Countess Laura at the altar's foot. Her coronet glittered on her pallid brows, a crimson pall, weighed down with golden work, sewn thick with pearls and heaped with early flowers, draped her still body almost to the chin, 
and over all a thousand candles flamed against the winking jewels or streamed down the marble oil and flashed along the guard of men-at-arms that slowly wove their turns backward and forward through the distant gloom when carlo entered his unsteady feet scarce bore him to the altar and his head drooped down so low that all his shining curls poured on his breast and veiled his countenance upon his easel a half-finished work the secret labour of a studio said from the canvas so that none might err i am the countess laura carlo kneeled and gazed upon the picture as if thus through those clear eyes he saw the way to heaven then he arose and as a swimmer comes forth from the waves he shook his locks aside emerging from his dream and standing firm upon a purpose with his sovereign will he took his palette murmuring not yet confidingly and softly to the corpse and as the various drudge who plies his art against his fancy he addressed himself with stolid resolution to his task turning his vision on his memory and shutting out the present till the dead the gilded pool the lights the pacing guard and all the meaning of that solemn scene became as nothing and creative art resolved the whole to chaos and reformed the elements according to her law so carlo wrought as though his eye and hand were heaven's unconscious instruments and worked the settled purpose of omnipotence and it was wondrous how the red the white the ochre and the umber and the blue from mottled blotches hazy and opaque grew into rounded forms and sensuous lines how just beneath the lucid skin the blood glimmered with warmth the scarlet lips apart bloomed with the moisture of the dews of life how the light glittered through and underneath the golden tresses and the deep soft eyes became intelligent with conscious thought and somewhat troubled underneath the arch of eyebrows but a little too intense for perfect beauty how the pose and poise of the lithe figure on its tiny foot suggested life just ceased from motion so that any one might cry in marvelling joy that creature lives has senses mind a soul to win god's love or dare hell's subtleties the artist paused the ratifying good trembled upon his lips he saw no touch to give or soften it is done he cried my task my duty nothing now on earth can taunt me with a work left unfulfilled the lofty flame which bore him up so long died in the ashes of humanity and the mere man rocked to and fro again upon the centre of his wavering heart he put aside his palette as if thus he stepped from sacred vestments and assumed a mortal function in the common world now for my rights he muttered and approached the noble body o oh, lily of the world so withered yet so lovely what wast thou to those who came thus near thee for i stood without the pale of thy half royal rank and thou wast budding and the streams of life made eager struggles to maintain thy bloom and gladdened heaven dropped down in gracious dews on its transplanted darling hear me now i say this but in justice not in pride not to insult thy high nobility but that the poise of things in god's own sight may be adjusted and hereafter i may urge a claim that all the powers of heaven shall sanction and with clarions blow abroad laura you loved me look not so severe with your cold brows and deadly close-drawn lips you proved it countess when you died for it let it consume you in the wearing strife it fought with duty in your ravaged heart i knew it ever since that summer day i painted lila the pale beggar's child at rest beside the fountain when i felt oh heaven the warmth and moisture of your breath blow through my hair as with your eager soul forgetting soul and body go as one you leaned across my easel till our cheeks ah oh, 
me twas not your purpose touched and clung well grant was genius and his genius not i ween it wears as proud a diadem here in this very world as that you wear a king has held my palate a grand duke has picked my brush up and a pope has begged the favour of my presence in his room i did not go i put my fortune by i need not ask you why you knew too well it was but natural it was no way strange that i should love you everything that saw or had its other senses loved you sweet and i among them martyr holy saint i see the halo curving round your head i loved you once but now i worship you for the great deed that held my love aloof and killed you in the action i absolve your soul from any taint for from the day of that encounter by the fountain side until this moment never turned on me those tender eyes unless they did a wrong to nature by the cold defiant glare with which they chilled me never heard i a word of softness spoken by those gentle lips never received a bounty from that hand which gave to all the world i know the cause you did your duty not for honour's sake nor to save sin or suffering or remorse or all the ghosts that haunt a woman's shame but for the sake of that pure loyal love your husband bore you queen by grace of god i bow before the lustre of your throne i kiss the aegis of your garment hem and hold myself ennobled answer me if i had wronged you you would answer me out of the dusty porches of the tomb is this a dream a falsehood or have i spoken the very truth the very truth a voice replied and at his side he saw a form half shadow and half substance stand or rather rest for on the solid earth it had no footing more than some dense mist that waves o'er the surface of the ground it scarcely touches with a reverent look the shadow's waste and wretched face was bent above the picture as their greater awe subdued its awful being and appalled with memories of terrible delight and fearful wonder its devouring gaze you make what god makes beauty said the shape and might not this this second eve console the emptiest heart will not this thing outlast the fairest creature fashioned in the flesh before that figure time and death himself stand baffled and disarmed what would you ask more than god's power from nothing to create the artist gazed upon the boding form and answered goblin if you had a heart that were an idle question what to me is my creative power bereft of love or what to god would be that selfsame power if so bereaved and yet the love thus mourned you calmly forfeited for had you said to living laura in her burning ears one half that you profess to laura dead she would have been your own these contraries sort not with my intelligence but speak were laura living would the same stale play of raging passion tearing out its heart upon the rock of duty be performed the same o oh phantom for the heart i bear trembled but turned not its magnetic faith from god's fixed centre if i wake for you this laura give her all the bloom and glow of that midsummer day you hold so dear the smile the motion the impulsive soul the love of genius yea the very love the mortal hungry passionate hot love she bore you flesh to flesh would you receive that gift in all its glory 
at my hands. A smile of malice curled the tempter's lips, and glittered in the caverns of his eyes, mocking the answer. Carlo paled and shook. A woeful spasm went shuddering through his frame, curdling his blood and twisting his fair face with nameless torture. But he cried aloud, out of the clouds of anguish, from the smoke of very martyrdom, O oh God, she is thine! Do with her at thy pleasure! Something grand, and radiant as a sunbeam, touched the head. He bent in awful sorrow. Mortal, see! Dare not! As Christ was sinless, I abjure these vile abominations. Shall she bear life's burden twice, and life's temptations twice, while God is justice? Who has made you judge of what you call God's good, and what you think God's evil? One to him, the source of both, the God of good and of permitted ill. Have you no dream of days that might have been? Had you and Laura filled another fate? Some cottage on the sloping Apennines, roses and lilies, and the rest all love? I tell you that this tranquil dream may be filled to repletion. Speak, and in the shade of my dark pinions I shall bear you hence, and land you where the mountain goat himself struggles for footing. He outspread his wings, and all the chapel darkened, as though hell had swallowed up the tapers, and the air grew thick, and, like a current sensible, flowed round the person with a wash and dash as of the waters of another sea slowly and calmly through the dense obscure dove-like and gentle rose the artist's voice i dare not bring her spirit to that shame nor my full meaning i who neither fear your mystic person nor your dreadful power nor shall I now invoke God's potent name for my deliverance from your toils. I stand upon the founded structure of his law, established from the first, and thence defy your arts, reposing all my trust in that. The darkness eddied off, and Carlo saw the figure gathering, as from outer space, brightness on brightness, and his former shape fell from him, like the ashes that fall off and show a core of mellow fire within. Adown his wings there poured a lambent flood, that seemed as molten gold, which plashing fell upon the floor, and ringing him with flame, and o'er the tresses of his beaming head arose a stream of many-coloured light, like that which crowned the morning. Carlo stood steadfast for all the splendour, reaching up the outstretched palms of his untainted soul towards heaven for strength. A moment thus, then asked, with a reverential wonder quivering through his sinking voice, Who, spirit, and what art thou? I am that blessing which men fly from, death. Then take my hand, if so God orders it, for Laura waits me. But bethink thee, man, what the world loses in the loss of thee, what wondrous art will suffer with eclipse, what unwon glories are in store for thee, what fame, outreaching time and temporal shocks, would shine upon the letters of thy name, graven in marble, or the brazen height of columns, wise with memories of thee. Take me. If I outlive the patriarchs, I could but paint those features o'er and o'er. Lo, that is done. A smile of pity lit the seraph's features, as he looked to heaven, with deep inquiry in his tender eyes. The mandate came. He touched the, with downy wing the sufferer lightly on his aching heart, and gently, as the skylark settles down upon the clustered treasures of her nest, so Carlo softly slid along the prop of his tall easel, nestling at the foot as though he slumbered, and the morning broke in silver whiteness, over Padua. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Othello's Remorse from Othello 
Act Five, Scene Two by William Shakespeare. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Nine, Tragedy and Humor, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by phone. Othello's Remorse from Othello, Act Five, Scene Two. Behold, I have a weapon. A better never did itself sustain upon a soldier's thigh. I have seen the day that, with this little arm and this good sword, I have made my way through more impediments than twenty times your stop. But, oh, vain boast! Who can control his fate? Tis not so now. Be not afraid, though you do see me weaponed. Here is my journey's end, here is my butt, and very sea-mark of my utmost sail. Do you go back dismayed? Tis a lost fear. Man but a rush against Othello's breast, and he retires. Where should Othello go? Now how dost thou look now? O oh, ill-starred wench, pale as thy smock, when we shall meet at Comte, this look of thine will hurl my soul from heaven, and fiends will snatch at it. Cold, cold, my girl, even like thy chastity, O oh, cursed slave, whip me, ye devils, from the possession of this heavenly sight. Blow me about in winds, roast me in sulphur, wash me in steep-down gulfs of liquid fire. O oh, Desdemona, Desdemona, then, oh, oh. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Trial of Beatrice From the Cenci, Act 5 By Percy Bysshe Shelley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9 Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Sonia as the narrator Thomas Peter as the judges Jason in Canada as Marzio Phone as Beatrice Craig Franklin as Cardinal Camillo and Lian Yao as the officer. The Trial of Beatrice from the Cenci, Act Five. Scene Two: A Hall of Justice. Camillo, judges, etc., are discovered seated. Marzio is led in. Accused, do you persist in your denial? I ask you, are you innocent or guilty? I demand who were the participators in your offence. Speak truth and the whole truth. My God, I did not kill him. I know nothing. Olympio sold the robe to me from which you would infer my guilt. Away with him! Dare you, with lips yet white from the rack's kiss, speak false? Is it so soft a questioner? That she would bandy lovers talk with it till it wind out your life and soul away spare me oh spare i will confess then speak i strangled him in his sleep who urged you to it his own son giacomo and the young prelate orsino sent me to petrella there the ladies beatrice and lucretia tempted me with a thousand crowns and i and my companion forthwith murdered him now let me die this sounds as bad as truth guards there lead forth the prisoner enter lucretia beatrice giacomo guarded look upon this man when did you see him last we never saw him you know me too well lady beatrice i know thee how where when you know twas i whom you did urge with menaces and bribes to kill your father when the thing was done you clothed me in a robe of woven gold and bade me thrive how i have thriven you see you and lord giacomo lady lucretia you know that what i speak is true beatrice advances towards him he covers his face and shrinks back. 
O oh, dart, the terrible resentment of those eyes on the dead earth, turn them away from me. They wound. Twas torture forced the truth. My lords, having said this, let me be led to death. Poor wretch, I pity thee, yet stay a while. Guards, lead him not away. Cardinal Camillo, you have a good repute for gentleness and wisdom. Can it be that you sit here to countenance a wicked farce like this, when some obscure and trembling slave is dragged from sufferings which might shake the sternest heart and bade to answer not as he believes, but as those may suspect or do desire, whose questions thence suggest their own reply, and that in peril of such hideous torments as merciful God spares even the damned. Speak now, the thing you surely know, which is that you, if your fine frame were stretched upon that wheel, and you were told, Confess that you did poison your little nephew, that fair blue-eyed child who was the lodestar of your life, and though all see, since his most swift and piteous death, that day and night, and heaven and earth, and time, and all the things hoped for or done therein, are changed to you, through your exceeding grief, yet you would say, I confess anything, and beg from your tormentors, like that slave, the refuge of dishonourable death. I pray thee, Cardinal, that thou assert my innocence. Camillo, much moved. What shall we think, my lords? Shame on these tears. I thought the heart was frozen, which is their fountain. I would pledge my soul that she is guiltless. Yet she must be tortured. I would as soon have tortured mine own nephew. If he now lived, he would be just her age. His hair, too, was her colour, and his eyes like hers in shape but blue, and not so deep. As that most perfect image of God's love that ever came sorrowing upon the earth, she is as pure as speechless infancy. Well, be her purity on your head, my lord, if you forbid the rack. His holiness enjoined us to pursue this monstrous crime by the severest forms of law, nay, even to stretch a point against the criminals. The prisoners stand accused of parricide upon such evidence as justifies torture. What evidence? This man's? Even so. Beatrice to Marzio. Come near, and who art thou thus chosen forth out of the multitude of living men to kill the innocent? I am Marzio, thy father's vassal. Fix thine eyes on mine. Answer to what I ask. Turning to the judges, I prithee mark his countenance, unlike bold calumny which sometimes dares not speak the thing it looks he dares not look the thing he speaks but bends his gaze on the blind earth to marzio what wilt thou say that i did murder my own father oh spare me my brain swims round i cannot speak it was that horrid torture forced the truth take me away let her not look on me I am a guilty, miserable wretch. I have said all I know. Now let me die. My lords, if by my nature I had been so stern as to have planned the crime alleged, which your suspicions dictate to this slave, and the rack makes him utter, do you think I should have left this two-edged instrument of my misdeed, this man, this bloody knife, with my own name engraven on the heft, lying unsheathed amid a world of foes for my own death that with such horrible need for deepest silence i should have neglected so trivial a precaution as the making his tomb the keeper of a secret written on a thief's memory what is his poor life what are a thousand lives a parasite had tramped them like dust and see he lives turning to marzio and thou oh spare me 
speak to me no more that stern yet piteous look those solemn tones wound worse than torture to the judges i have told it all for pity's sake lead me away to death guards lead him nearer the lady beatrice he shrinks from her regard like autumn's leaf from the keen breath of the serenest north o oh, thou who tremblest on the giddy verge of life and death pause ere thou answerest me so mayst thou answer god with less dismay what evil have we done thee i alas have lived but on this earth a few sad years and so my lot was ordered that a father first turned the moments of awakening life to drops each poisoning youth's sweet hope and then stabbed with one blow my everlasting soul and my untainted fame and even that peace which sleeps within the core of the heart's heart but the wound was not mortal so my hate became the only worship i could lift to our great father who in pity and love armed thee as thou dost say to cut him off and thus his wrong becomes my accusation and art thou the accuser if thou hopest mercy in heaven show justice upon earth worse than a bloody hand is a hard heart if thou hast done murders may thy life's path over the trampled laws of god and man rush not before thy judge and say my maker i have done this and more for there was one who was most pure and innocent on earth and because she endured what never any guilty or innocent endured before because her wrongs could not be told not thought because thy hand at length did rescue her i with my words killed her and all her kin think i adjure you what it is to slay the reverence living in the minds of men towards our ancient house and stainless fame think what it is to strangle infant pity cradled in the belief of guileless looks till it become a crime to suffer think what it is to blot with infamy and blood all that which shows like innocence and is hear me great god i swear most innocent so that the world lose all discrimination between the sly fierce wild regard of guilt and that which now compels thee to reply to what i ask am i or am i not a parricide thou art not what is this i here declare those whom i did accuse are innocent tis i alone am guilty drag him away to torments let them be subtle and long drawn out to tear the folds of the heart's inmost cell and bind him not till he confess torture me as ye will a keener pain has wrung a higher truth from my last breath she is most innocent bloodhounds not men glut yourselves well with me i will not give you that fine piece of nature to rend and ruin exit marzio guarded what say ye now my lords let torture strain the truth till it be white as snow thrice sifted by the frozen wind yet stained with blood judge to beatrice know you this paper lady entrap me not with questions who stands here as my accuser ha wilt thou be he who art my judge accuser witness judge what all in one here is orsino's name where is orsino let his eye meet mine what means this scrawl alas ye know not what and therefore on the chance that it may be some evil will ye kill us enter an officer marzio's dead what did he say nothing as soon as we had bound him on the wheel he smiled on us as one who baffles a deep adversary and holding his breath died there remains nothing but to apply the question to those prisoners who yet remain stubborn i overrule further proceedings and in the behalf of these most innocent and noble persons 
will use my interest with the Holy Father. Let the Pope's pleasure then be done. Meanwhile, conduct these culprits each to separate cells, and be the engines ready for this night, if the Pope's resolution be as grave, pious, and just as once. I'll wring the truth out of those nerves and sinews, groan by groan. Exeunt. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fra Giacomo by Robert Buchanan From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Fra Giacomo Alas, Fra Giacomo, too late, but follow me, hush, draw the curtain, so. She is dead, quite dead, you see. Poor little lady! She lies with the light gone out of her eyes, but her features still wear that soft, grey, meditative expression, which you must have noticed oft, and admired, too, at confession. How saintly she looks, and how meek! Though this be the chamber of death, I fancy I feel her breath as I kiss her on the cheek. With that pensive religious face, she has gone to a holier place, and I hardly appreciated her her praying, fasting, confessing, poorly, I own, I mated her. I thought her too cold, and rated her for her endless image caressing. Too saintly for me by far, as pure and as cold as a star. Not fashioned for kissing and pressing, but made for a heavenly crown. Ay, father, let us go down, but first, if you please, your blessing. Wine? No, come, come, you must. You'll bless it with your prayers, and quaff a cup, I trust, to the help of the saint upstairs. My heart is aching so, and I feel so weary and sad through the blow that I have had. You'll sit, Fra Giacomo? My friend, and a friend I rank you for the sake of that saint. Nay, nay, here's the wine. As you love me, stay. Tis Monte Pulciano. Thank you. Hey ho! Tis now six summers since I won that angel and married her. I was rich, not old, and carried her off in the face of all comers. So fresh, yet so brimming with soul. A tenderer morsel, I swear, never made the dull black coal of a monk's eye glitter and glare. Your pardon? Nay, keep your chair. I wander a little, but mean no offence to the grey gabardine. Of the church, Fra Giacomo, I'm a faithful upholder, you know. But, humour me, she was as sweet as the saints in your convent windows. So gentle, so meek, so discreet, she knew not what lust does or sin does. I'll confess, though, before we were one I deemed her less saintly and thought the blood in her veins had caught some natural warmth from the sun. I was wrong. I was blind as a bat. Brute that I was, how I blundered. Though such a mistake as that might have occurred as pat to ninety-nine men in a hundred. Yourself, for example? You've seen her? Spite her modest and pious demeanour, and the manners so nice and precise, seemed there not colour and light? bright motion and appetite that were scarcely consistent with ice? Externals implying, you see, internals less saintly than human? Pray speak, for between you and me, you're not a bad judge of a woman. A jest, but a jest, very true. Tis hardly becoming to jest, and that saint upstairs at rest, her soul may be listening too. I was always a brute of a fellow. Well may your visage turn yellow to think how I doubted and doubted, suspected, grumbled at, flouted that golden-haired angel, and solely because she was zealous and holy. Noon and night and morn she devoted herself to piety, not that she seemed to scorn or dislike her husband's society, 
but the claims of her soul superseded all that i asked for or needed and her thoughts were far away from the level of sinful clay and she trembled if earthly matters interfered with her aves and paters poor dove she so fluttered in flying above the dim vapours of hell bent on self-sanctifying that she never thought of trying to save her husband as well and while she was duly elected for a place in the heavenly roll i brute that i was suspected her manner of saving her soul so half for the fun of the thing what did i blasphemer but fling on my shoulders the gown of a monk whom i managed for that very day to get safely out of the way and seat me half sober half drunk with the cowl thrown over my face in the father confessor's place a hue benedict in her orthodox sweet simplicity with that pensive gray expression she sighfully knelt at confession while i bit my lips till they bled and dug my nails in my hand and heard with averted head what i guessed and could understand each word was a serpent's sting but wrapped in my gloomy gown i sat like a marble thing as she told me all sit down more wine fra giacomo one cup if you love me no what have these dry lips drank so deep of the sweets of pleasure sub rosa but quite without measure that monte pulciano tastes rank come drink twill bring the streaks of crimson back to your cheeks come drink again to the saint whose virtues you loved to paint who stretched on her wifely bed with the tender grave expression you used to admire at confession lies poisoned overhead sit still or by heaven you die face to face soul to soul you and i have settled accounts in a fine pleasant fashion over our wine stir not and seek not to fly nay whether or not you are mine thank monte pulciano for giving you death in such delicate sips tis not every monk ceases living with so pleasant a taste on his lips but lest monte pulciano unsurely should kiss take this and this and this cover him over pietro and bury him in the court below you can be secret lad i know and hark you then to the convent go bid every bell of the convent toll and the monks say mass for your mistress's soul end of poem this recording is in the public domain ginevra by samuel rogers from the world's best poetry volume nine Tragedy and Humour, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator. Phone as Ginevra. Jason in Canada as Ginevra's father. And Sonia as a young girl. Ginevra. If thou shouldst ever come by choice or chance to Medina, where still religiously among her ancient trophies is preserved, Bologna's bucket, in its chain it hangs within that reverend tower the guirlandina stop at a palace near the reggio gate dwelt in of old by one of the assini its noble gardens terrace above terrace and rich in fountains statues cypresses will long detain thee through their arched walks dim at noonday discovering many a glimpse of knights and dames such as in old romance and lovers such as in heroic song perhaps the two for groves were their delight that in the springtime as alone they sat venturing together on a tale of love read only part that day a summer sun sets ere one half is seen but ere thou go enter the house prithee forget it not and look a while upon a picture there tis of a lady in her earliest youth the last of that illustrious race done by zampieri but i care not whom he who observes it ere he passes on 
gazes his fill, and comes and comes again, that he may call it up when far away. She sits inclining forward as to speak, her lips half open, and her finger up, as though she said, Beware! Her vest of gold, broidered with flowers, and clasped from head to foot, an emerald stone in every golden clasp, and on her brow, fairer than alabaster, a coronet of pearls. But then her face, so lovely yet so arch, so full of mirth, the overflowings of an innocent heart, it haunts me still, though many a year has fled like some wild melody. Alone it hangs over a mouldering heirloom, its companion, an oaken chest half eaten by the worm, but richly carved by Antony of Trent, with scripture stories from the life of Christ, a chest that came from Venice and had held the duckles' robes of some old ancestor, that, by the way, it may be true or false, but don't forget the picture, and thou wilt not when thou hast heard the tale they told me there. She was an only child, from infancy the joy, the pride of an indulgent sire. Her mother dying of the gift she gave, that precious gift, which else remained to him. The young Ginevra was his all in life, still as she grew, forever in his sight, and in her fifteenth year became a bride, marrying an only son, Francesco Doria, her playmate from her birth and her first love. Just as she looks there in her bridal dress, she was all gentleness, all gaiety, her pranks the favourite theme of every tongue. But now the day was come, the day, the hour, now frowning, smiling for the hundredth time, the nurse, that ancient lady, preached decorum, and in the lustre of her youth she gave her hand, with her heart in it, to Francesco. Great was the joy. But at the bridal feast, when all sat down, the bride was wanting there, nor was she to be found. Her father cried, "'Tis but to make a trial of our love,' and filled his glass to all, but his hand shook and soon from guest to guest the panic spread. T'was but that instant she had left Francesco, laughing and looking back and flying still, her ivory tooth imprinted on his finger. But now, alas, she was not to be found. Nor from that hour could anything be guessed, but that she was not. Weary of his life, Francesco flew to Venice and forthwith flung it away in battle with the Turk, or seen he lived. And long mightst thou have seen an old man wandering as in quest of something, something he could not find, he knew not what. When he was gone, the house remained a while, silent and tenantless, then went to strangers. Full fifty years were passed and all forgot, when on an idle day, a day of search, mid the old lumber in the gallery, that mouldering chest was noticed, and was said by one as young, as thoughtless as Ginevra. Why not remove it from its lurking place? T'was done as soon as said, but on the way it burst, it fell, and lo, a skeleton, with here and there a pearl, an emerald stone, a golden clasp, clasping a shred of gold. All else had perished, save a nuptial ring, and a small seal, her mother's legacy, engraven with a name, the name of both, Ginevra. There then had she found a grave. Within that chest had she concealed herself, fluttering with joy, the happiest of the happy. When a spring lock, that lay in ambush there, Fastened her down for ever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bernardo del Carpio by Felicia Hemans from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Nine, Tragedy and Humor, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by phone as the narrator. 
Thomas Peter as Bernardo, and Jason in Canada as the King. Bernardo del Carpio The warrior bowed his crested head and tamed his heart of fire, and sued the haughty king to free his long-imprisoned sire. I bring thee here my fortress keys, I bring my captive train, I pledge thee faith, my liege, my lord, O oh, break my father's chain. Rise, rise, even now thy father comes, A ransomed man this day. Mount thy good horse, and thou and I will meet him on his way. Then lightly rose that loyal son, and bounded on his steed, And urged, as if with lance in rest, the charger's foamy speed. And lo, from far as on they pressed, there came a glittering band, with one that midst them stately rode as a leader in the land. Now haste, Bernardo, haste, for there in very truth is he, the father whom thy faithful heart hath yearned so long to see. His dark eye flashed, his proud breast heaved, his cheek's blood came and went. He reached that grey-haired chieftain's side, and there, dismounting, bent, a lowly knee to earth he bent, his father's hand he took. What was there in its touch that all his fiery spirit shook? That hand was cold, a frozen thing, it dropped from his like lead. He looked up to the face above, the face was of the dead. A plume waved o'er the noble brow, the brow was fixed and white. He met at last his father's eyes, but in them was no sight. Up from the ground he sprung, and gazed, but who could paint that gaze? They hushed their very hearts, that saw its horror and amaze. They might have chained him, as before that stony form he stood, for the power was stricken from his arm, and from his lip the blood. Father! At length he murmured low, and wept like childhood then. Talk not of grief till thou hast seen the tears of warlike men. He thought on all his glorious hopes and all his young renown. He flung the falchion from his side and in the dust sat down. Then, covering with his steel-gloved hands his darkly mournful brow, No more, there is no more, he said, to lift the sword for now. My king is false, my hope betrayed. My father, oh, the worth, the glory, the loveliness are passed away from earth. I thought to stand where banners waved, my sire. Beside thee yet, I would that there our kindred blood on Spain's free soil had met. Thou wouldst have known my spirit then, for thee my fields were won, and thou hast perished in thy chains as though thou hadst no son. Then, starting from the ground once more, he seized the monarch's reign, amidst the pale and wildered looks of all the courtier train, and with a fierce o'ermastering grasp the raging war-horse led, and sternly set them face to face, the king before the dead. Came I not forth upon thy pledge, my father's hand to kiss? Be still, and gaze thou on, false king, and tell me what is this? The voice, the glance, the heart I sought. Give answer, where are they? If thou wouldst clear thy perjured soul, send life through this cold clay. And to these glassy eyes put light. Be still, keep down thine ire. Bid these white lips a blessing speak. This earth is not my sire. Give me back him for whom I strove, for whom my blood was shed. Thou canst not, and a king, his dust be mountains on thy head. He loosed the steed, his slack hand fell, upon the silent face he cast one long deep troubled look, then turned from that sad place. His hope was crushed, his after fate untold in martial strain, his banner led the spears no more amidst the hills of Spain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Prisoner of Chillon by Lord Byron from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Nine, Tragedy and Humor, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by phone. The Prisoner of Chillon. Eternal spirit of the chainless mind, brightest in dungeons, liberty thou art, for there thy habitation is the heart, the heart which love of thee alone can bind. And when thy sons to fetters are consigned, To fetters and the damp folds dayless gloom, Their country conquers with their martyrdom, And freedom's fame finds wings on every wind. Chillen, thy prison is a holy place, And thy sad floor an altar, For t'was trod, until his very steps have left a trace, Worn as if thy cold pavement were a sod by Bonavard, May none those marks efface, for they appeal from tyranny to God. My hair is grey, but not with years, nor grew it white in a single night, as men's have grown from sudden fears. My limbs are bowed, though not with toil, but rusted with a vile repose, for they have been a dungeon spoil, and mine has been the fate of those to whom the goodly earth and air are banned and barred, forbidden fair. But this was for my father's faith, I suffered chains and courted death. That father perished at the stake, for tenets he would not forsake, and for the same his lineal race in darkness found a dwelling place. We were seven, who now are one, Six in youth and one in age, finished as they had begun, proud of persecution's rage. One in fire and two in field, their belief with blood have sealed. Dying as their father died, for the God their foes denied. Three were in a dungeon cast, of whom this wreck is left at last. There are seven pillars of Gothic mould in Chillon's dungeons deep and old. There are seven columns, massy and grey, dim with a dull imprisoned ray, a sunbeam which hath lost its way, and through the crevice and the cleft of the thick wall is fallen and left, creeping o'er the floor so damp like a marcious meteor lamp. And in each pillar there is a ring, and in each ring there is a chain. That iron is a cankering thing, for in these limbs its teeth remain, with marks that will not wear away till I have done with this new day, which is now painful to these eyes, which have not seen the sun to rise for years. I cannot count them o'er. I lost their long and heavy score when my last brother drooped and died, and I lay living by his side. They chained us each to a column stone, and we were three, yet each alone. We could not move a single pace, we could not see each other's face, but with that pale and livid light that made us strangers in our sight, and thus together, yet apart, feathered in hand, but pined in heart. T'was still some solace in the dearth of the pure elements of earth, to hearken each other's speech, and each turned comforter to each, with some new hope, or legend old, or song heroically bold. But even these at length grew cold. Our voices took a dreary tone, an echo of the dungeon stone, a grating sound not full and free, as they of yore were wont to be. It might be fancy, but to me they never sounded like our own. I was the eldest of the three, and to uphold and cheer the rest I ought to do, and did, my best, and each did well in his degree. The youngest, whom my father loved, because our mother's brow was given, to him with eyes as blue as heaven, for him my soul was sorely moved, and truly might it be distressed to see such bird in such a nest, for he was beautiful as day, when day was beautiful to me, as to young eagles being free, a polar day which will not see a sunset till its summer's gone, its sleepless summer of long light, the snow-clad offspring of the sun, 
and thus he was as pure and bright and in his natural spirit gay with tears for naught but others ills and then they flowed like mountain rills unless he could assuage the woe which he abhorred to view below the other was as pure of mind but formed to combat with his kind strong in his frame and of a mood which gainst the world in war had stood and perished in the foremost rank with joy but not in chains to pine his spirit withered with their clank i saw it silently decline and so perchance in sooth did mine but yet i forced it on to cheer those relics of a home so dear he was a hunter of the hills had followed there the deer and wolf to him this dungeon was a gulf and fettered feet the worst of ills lake leman lies by chillen's walls a thousand feet in depth below its massy waters meet and flow thus much the fathom line was sent from chillen's snow-white battlement which round about the wave enthralls and double dungeon wall and wave have made and like a living grave below the surface of the lake the dark fold lies wherein we lay we heard it ripple night and day sounding o'er our heads it knocked and i have felt the winter spray wash through the bars when winds were high and wanton in the happy sky and then the very rock hath rocked and i have felt it shake unshocked because i could have smiled to see the death that would have set me free i said my nearer brother pined i said his mighty heart declined he loathed and put away his food it was not that twas coarse and rude for we were used to hunters fare and for the like had little care the milk drawn from the mountain goat was changed for water from the moat our bread was such as captives tears have moistened many a thousand years since man first pent his fellow men like brutes within an iron den but what were these to us or him these wasted not his heart or limb my brother's soul was that of mould which in a palace had grown cold had his free breathing been denied the range of the steep mountain side but why delay the truth he died i saw and could not hold his head nor reach his dying hand nor dead though hard i strove but strove in vain to rend and gnash my bonds in twain he died and they unlocked his chain and scooped for him a shallow grave even from the cold earth of our cave i begged him as a boon to lay his course in dust whereon the day might shine it was a foolish thought but then within my brain it wrought that even in death his free-born breast in such a dungeon could not rest i might have spared my idle prayer they coldly laughed and laid him there the flat and turfless earth above the being we so much did love his empty chain above it lent such murder's fitting monument but he the favourite and the flower most cherished since his natal hour his mother's image in fair face the infant love of all his race his martyred father's dearest thought my latest care for whom i sought to hoard my life that this might be less wretched now and one day free he too who yet had held untired a spirit natural or inspired he too was struck and day by day was withered on the stalk away o oh god it is a fearful thing to see the human soul take wing in any shape in any mood i've seen it rushing forth in blood i've seen it on the breaking ocean strive with a swan convulsive motion i've seen the sick and ghastly bed of sin delirious with its dread but these were horrors this was woe unmixed with such but sure and slow he faded and so calm and meek so softly worn so sweetly weak so tearless yet so tender kind and grieved for those he left behind with all the while a cheek whose bloom was a mockery of the tomb whose tints as gently sunk away as a departing rainbow's ray 
an eye of most transparent light that almost made the dungeon bright and not a word of murmur not a groan or his untimely lot a little talk of better days a little hope my own to raise for i was sunk in silence lost in this last gloss of all the most and then the sighs he would suppress of fainting nature's feebleness more slowly drawn grew less and less i listened but i could not hear i called for i was wild with fear i knew twas hopeless but my dread would not be thus admonished i called and thought i heard a sound i burst my chain with one strong bound and rushed to him i found him not i only stirred in this black spot i only lived i only drew the accursed breath of dungeon dew the last the soul the dearest link between me and the eternal brink which bound me to my failing race was broken in this fatal place one on the earth and one beneath my brothers both had ceased to breathe i took that hand which lay so still alas my own was full as chill i had not strength to stir or strive but felt that i was still alive a frantic feeling when we know that what we love shall ne'er be so i know not why i could not die i had no earthly hope but faith and that forbade a selfish death what next befell me then and there i know not well i never knew first came the loss of light and air and then of darkness too i had no thought no feeling none among the stones i stood a stone and was scarce conscious what i wist as shrubless crags within the mist for all was blank and bleak and grey it was not night it was not day it was not even the dungeon light so hateful to my heavy sight but vacancy absorbing space and fixedness without a place there were no stars no earth no time no check no change no good no crime but silence and a stirless breath which neither was of life nor death a sea of stagnant idleness blind boundless mute and motionless a light broke in upon my brain it was the carol of a bird it ceased and then it came again the sweetest song ear ever heard and mine was thankful till my eyes ran over with the glad surprise and they that moment could not see i was the mate of misery but then by dull degrees came back my senses to their wonted track i saw the dungeon walls and floor close slowly round me as before i saw the glimmer of the sun creeping as it before had done but through the crevice where it came that bird was perched as fond and tame and tamer than upon the tree a lovely bird with azure wings and song that said a thousand things and seemed to say them all for me i never saw its like before i ne'er shall see its likeness more it seemed like me to want a mate but was not half so desolate and it was come to love me when none lived to love me so again and cheering from my dungeon's brink had brought me back to feel and think i know not if it late were free or broke its cage to perch on mine but knowing well captivity sweet bird i could not wish for thine or if it were in winged guise a visitant from paradise for heaven forgive that thought the while which made me both to weep and smile i sometimes deemed that it might be my brother's soul come down to me but then at last away it flew and then twas mortal well i knew for he would never thus have flown and left me twice so doubly lone lone as the course within a shroud lone as a solitary cloud a single cloud on a sunny day while all the rest of heaven is clear a frown upon the atmosphere that hath no business to appear when skies are blue and earth is gay a kind of change came in my fate 
my keepers grew compassionate i knew not what had made them so they were inert to sights of woe but so it was my broken chain with links unfastened did remain and it was liberty to stride along my cell from side to side and up and down and then athwart and treated over every part and round the pillars one by one returning where my walk begun avoiding only as i trod my brother's graves without a sod for if i thought with headless tread my step profaned their lowly bed my breath came gaspingly and thick and my crushed heart fell blind and sick i made a footing in the wall it was not therefrom to escape for i had buried one and all who loved me in a human shape and the whole earth would henceforth be a wider prison unto me no child no sire no kin had i no partner in my misery i thought of this and i was glad for thought of them had made me mad but i was curious to ascend to my barred windows and to bend once more upon the mountains high the quiet of a loving eye i saw them and they were the same they were not changed like me in frame i saw their thousand years of snow on high their wide long lake below and the blue rawn in fullest flow i heard the torrents leap and gush o'er channelled rock and broken bush i saw the white-walled distant town and whiter sails go skimming down and then there was a little isle which in my very face did smile the only one in view a small green isle it seemed no more scarce broader than my dungeon floor but in it were three tall trees and o'er it blew the mountain breeze and by it there were waters flowing and on it there were young flowers growing of gentle breath and hue the fish swam by the castle wall and they seemed joyous each and all the eagle rode the rising blast methought he never flew so fast as then to me he seemed to fly and then new tears came in my eye and i felt troubled and would fain i had not left my recent chain and when i did descend again the darkness of my dim abode fell on me as a heavy load it was as in a new dug grave closing o'er one we sought to save and yet my glance too much oppressed had almost need of such a rest it might be months or years or days i kept no count i took no note i had no hope my eyes to raise and clear them of their dreary moat at last men came to set me free i asked not why and reck not where it was at length the same to me fettered or fetterless to be i learned to love despair and thus when they appeared at last and all my bonds aside were cast these heavy walls to me had grown a hermitage and all my own and half i felt as they were come to tear me from a second home with spiders i had friendship made and watched them in their sullen trade had seen the mice by moonlight play and why should i feel less than they we were all inmates of one place and i the monarch of each race had power to kill yet strange to tell in quiet we had learned to dwell my very chains and i grew friends so much a long communion tends to make us what we are even i regained my freedom with a sigh end of poem this recording is in the public domain before sedan by austin dobson from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humour part one read for librivox .org by phone before sedan the dead hand clasped a letter special correspondent here in this leafy place quiet he lies cold with his sightless face turned to the skies tis but another dead all you can say is said carry his body hence kings must have slaves kings climb to eminence over men's graves 
so this man's eye is dim throw the earth over him what was the white you touched there at his side paper his hand had clutched tight ere he died message or wish may be smooth out the folds and see hardly the worst of us here could have smiled only the tremulous words of a child prattle that had for stops just a few ruddy drops look she is sad to miss morning and night his her dead father's kiss tries to be bright good to mamma and sweet that is all marguerite ah if beside the dead slumbered the pain ah if the hearts that bled slept with the slain if the grief died but no death will not have it so end of poem this recording is in the public domain Ivan Ivanovich by Robert Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator Jason in Canada as the villagers and Vasily Thomas Peter as Ivan and Dmitri Phone as Lucaria Lian Yao as the Pumashik And Craig Franklin as the Old Pope Ivan Ivanovich early one winter morn in such a village as this snow whitened everywhere except the middle road ice roughed by track of sledge there worked by his abode ivan ivanovich the carpenter employed on a huge shipmast trunk his axe now trimmed and toyed with branch and twig and now some chop athwart the bowl changed bowl to billets bared at once the sap and soul about him watched the work his neighbor's sheepskin clad each bearded mouth puffed steam each gray eye twinkled glad to see the sturdy arm which never stopping play proved strong man's blood still boils freeze winter as he may sudden a burst of bells out of the road on edge of the hamlet horses hoofs galloping how a sledge what's here cried all as in up to the open space workyard and market ground folks common meeting place stumbled on till he fell in one last bound for life a horse and at his heels a sledge held dmitri's wife back without dmitri too and children where are they only a frozen corpse they drew it forth then nay not dead though like to die gone hence a month ago home again this rough jaunt alone through night and snow what can the cause be hark drug old horse how he groans his day's done chafe away keep chafing for she moans she's coming too give here see motherkin your friends cheer up all safe at home warm inside makes amends for outside cold sup quick don't look as we were bears what is it startles you what strange adventure stares up at us in your face you know friends which is which i'm vasily he's sergey ivan ivanovich at the word the woman's eyes slow wandering till they neared the blue eyes over the bush of honey-coloured beard took in full light and sense and torn to rags some dream which hid the naked truth o oh, loud and long the scream she gave as if all power of voice within her throat poured itself wild away to waste in one dread note then followed gasps and sobs and then the steady flow of kindly tears the brain was saved a man might know down fell her face upon the good friend's propping knee his broad hands smoothed her head as fain to brush it free from fancies swarms that stung like bees unhived he soothed lucaria lucia still he fondling smoothed and smoothed at last her lips formed speech ivan dear 
You indeed. You, just the same, dear you? Well, I... Oh, intercede, sweet mother, with thy son almighty. Let his might bring yesterday once more, and do all done last night. But this time yesterday, Ivan, I sat like you, a child on either knee, and dearer than the two, a babe inside my arms, close to my heart, that's lost in morsels o'er the snow. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, cannot you bring again my blessed yesterday? When no more tears would flow, she told her tale, this way. Maybe a month ago, was it not? News came here. They wanted, deeper down, good workmen fit to rear a church and roof in it. He'll go. My husband said, None understands like me to melt and mould their lead. So friends here helped us off. Ivan, dear, you the first. How gay we jingled forth, all five. My heart will burst. While Dmitri shook the reins, urged drug upon his track. Well, soon the month ran out. We just were coming back. When yesterday, behold, the village was on fire. Fire ran from house to house. What help, as nigh and nigher, the flames came furious. Haste! cried Dmitri. Men must do the little good man may. To sledge and in with you, you and our three. We check the fire by laying flat each building in its path. I needs must stay for that. But you, no time for talk. Wrap round you every rug, cover the couple close. You'll have the babe to hug. No care to guide old Druk. He knows his way by guess, won't start him on the road. But cheer up, none the less. The snow lies glib as glass and hard as steel, and soon you'll have rise, fine and full, a marvel of a moon. Hold straight up, all the same, this lighted twist of pitch. Once home and with our friend Ivan Ivanovitch, all safe. I have my pay and pouch, all's right with me. So I but find a safe you and our precious three. Off, Droog! Because the flames had reached us, and the men shouted. But lend a hand, Dmitri, as good as ten. So in we bundled, I and those God gave me once. Old drug, that's stiff at first, seemed youthful for the nonce. He understood the case, galloping straight ahead. Out came the moon, my twist soon dwindled, feebly red in that unnatural day. Yes, daylight bred between moonlight and snowlight, lamped those grotto depths which screen such devils from God's eye. Ah, pines, how straight you grow, nor bend one pitying branch, true breed of brutal snow. Some undergrowth had served to keep the devils blind, while we escaped outside their border. Was that wind? Anyhow, drug starts, stops, back go his ears, he snuffs, snorts, never such a snort, then plunges, knows the sows, only the wind. Yet no, our breath goes up too straight, still the low sound, less low, louder, at a rate, there's no mistaking more. Shall I lean out? Look, learn, the truth, whatever it be. Pad, pad, at last I turn. Tis the regular pad of the wolves in pursuit of the life in the sledge. An army they are, close packed, they press like the thrust of a wedge. They increase as they hunt, for I see, through the pine trunks ranged each side, slip forth new fiend and fiend, make wider and still more wide the four-footed steady advance. The foremost, none may pass, they are the elders and lead the line, eye and eye, green glowing brass. But a long way distant still, drug save us, he does his best, yet they gain on us, gain till they reach, one reaches. How utter the rest, oh, that Satan-faced first of the band! How he lolls out the length of his tongue, how he laughs and lets gleam his white teeth. 
he is on me his paws pry among the wraps and the rugs oh my pair my twin pigeons lie still and seem dead stepan he shall never have you for a meal here's your mother instead no he will not be counselled must cry poor stiopka so foolish though first of my boy brood he was not the best nay neighbours called him the worst he was puny an undersized slip a darling to me all the same but little there was to be praised in the boy and a plenty to blame i loved him with heart and soul yes but deal him a blow for a fault he would sulk for whole days foolish boy lie still or the villain will vault will snatch you from over my head no use he cries he screams who can hold fast a boy in frenzy of fear it follows as i foretold the satan face snatched and snapped i tugged i tore and then his brother too needs must shriek if one must go tis men the tsar needs so we hear not ailing boys perhaps my hands relaxed their grasp got tangled in the wraps god he was gone i looked there tumbled the cursed crew each fighting for a share too busy to pursue that so far gain at least drug gallop another verst or two or three god sends we beat them arrive the first a mother who boasts two boys was ever accounted rich some have not a boy some have but lose him god knows which is worse how pitiful to see your weakling pine and pale and pass away strong breaths despair of mine oh misery for while i settle to what near seems content i'm ware again of the tramp and again there gleams point and point the line eyes levelled green brassy fire so soon is resumed your chase will nothing appease not tire the furies and yet i think i am certain the race is slack and the numbers are nothing like not a quarter of the pack feasters and those full fed are staying behind ah why will sorrow for that too soon now gallop reach home and die nor ever again leave house to trust our life in the trap for life we call a sledge terioska in my lap yes i'll lie down upon you tied tie you with the strings here of my heart no fear this time your mother flings flings i flung never but think a woman after all contending with a wolf save you i must and shall Tarenti. how now what you still head the race your eyes and tongue and teeth crave fresh food satan face flash again there and there plain i struck green fire out all a poor fist can do to damage eyes proves vain my fist why not crunch that he is wandering for o oh god why give this wolf his taste common wolves scrape and prod the earth till out they scratch some corpse mere putrid flesh why must this glutton leave the faded choose the fresh Turenti, god feel his neck keeps fast thy bag of holy things saints bones this satan face will drag forth and devour along with him our pope declared the relics were to save from danger spurned not spared it was through my arms crossed arms he nuzzling now with snout now ripping tooth and claw plucked pulled Turenti out a prize indeed i saw how could i else but see my precious one i bit to hold back pulled from me up came the others fell to dancing did the imps skipped as they scampered round there's one is grey and limps who knows but old bad martha she always owed me spite and envied me my births 
skulks out of doors at night and turns into a wolf and joins the sisterhood and laps the youthful life then slinks from out the wood squats down at the door by dawn spins there demure as erst no strength old crone not she to crawl forth half averst well i escaped with one twixt one and none there lies the space twixt heaven and hell and see a rose light dies the endmost snow tis dawn tis day tis safe at home we have outwitted you i monsters snarl and foam fight each the other fiend disputing for a share forgetful in your greed our finest off we bear tough drug and i my babe my boy that shall be man my man that shall be more do all a hunter can to trace and follow and find and catch and crucify wolves wolfkins all your crew a thousand deaths shall die the whimperingest cub that ever squeezed the teat take that we'll stab you with the tenderness we met when wretches you danced round not this thank god not this hellhounds we balk you but ah oh god above bliss bliss not the band no and yet yes for drug knows him one this only one of them all has said she saves a son his fellows disbelieve such luck but he believes he lets them pick the bones laugh at him in their sleeves he's off and after us one speck one spot one ball grows bigger bound on bound one wolf as good as all oh but i know the trick have at the snaky tongue that's the right way with wolves go tell your mates i wrung the panting morsel out left you to howl your worst now for it now ah oh, me i know him thrice accursed satan face him to the end my foe all fights in vain this time the green brass points pierce to my very brain i fall fall as i ought quite on the bay by guard i overspread with flesh the whole of him too hard to die this way torn piecemeal move hence not i one inch gnaw through me through and through flat does i lie nor flinch o oh god the feel of the fang furrowing my shoulder see it grinds it grates the bone o oh, kirill under me could i do more besides he knew the wolf's way to win i clung closed round like wax yet in he wedged and in past my neck past my breasts my heart until how feels the onion bulb your knife parts pushing through its peels till out you scoop its clove wherein lies stalk and leaf and bloom and seed unborn that slew me yes in brief i died then dead i lay doubtlessly till drugs stopped here i suppose i come to life i find me prop thus how or when or why i know not tell me friends all was a dream laugh quick and say the nightmare ends soon i shall find my house tis over there in proof save for that chimney heaped with snow you'd see the roof which holds my three my two my one not one life's mixed with misery yet we live must live the satan fixed his face on mine so fast i took its print as pitch takes what it calls beneath ivan ivanovitch tis you unharden me you thaw disperse the thing only keep looking kind the horror will not cling your face smooths fast away each print of satan cheers what good they do life's sweet and all its after years ivan ivanovitch i owe you yours am i may god reward you dear down she sank solemnly ivan rose raised his axe for fitly as she knelt her head lay well apart each side her arms hung 
dealt lightning swift thunder strong one blow no need of more headless she knelt on still that pine was sound of core neighbors used to say cast iron kerneled which taxed for a second stroke ivan ivanovich the man was scant of words as strokes it had to be i could no other god it was bad act for me then stooping peering round what is it now he lacks a proper strip of bark wherewith to wipe his axe which done he turns goes in closes the door behind the others mute remain watching the blood snake wind into a hiding place among the splinter heaps at length still mute all move one lifts from where it steeps redder each ruddy rag of pine the head two more take up the dripping body then mute still as before move in a sort of march march on till marching ends opposite to the church where halting who suspends by its long hair the thing deposits in its place the piteous head once more the body shows no trace of harm done there lies whole the lucia maid and wife and mother loved until this latest of her life then all sit on the bank of snow which bounds a space kept free before the porch of judgment just the place presently all the souls man woman child which make the village up are found assembling for the sake of what is to be done the very jews are there a gypsy troop though bound with horses for the fair squats with the rest each heart with its conception seethes and simmers but no tongue speaks one may say none breathes anon from out the church totters the pope the priest hardly alive so old a hundred years at least with him the commune's head a hoary senior too starosta that's his style like equity judge with you natural jurisconsult then fenced about with furs pomschik lord of the land who wields and none demurs a power of life and death they stoop survey the corpse then straightened on his staff the starosta the thorpe's sagaciousest old man hears what you just have heard from drog's first inrush all up to ivan's last word god bade me act for him i dared not disobey silence the pomschick broke with a wild wrong way of writing wrong if wrong there were such wrath to rouse why was not law observed ivan ivanovitch has done a deed that's named murder by law and me who doubts may speak unblamed all turned to the old pope ay children i am old how old myself have got to know no longer rolled quite round my orb of life from infancy to age seems passing back again to youth a certain stage at least i reach or dream i reach where i discern truer truths laws behold more law-like than we learn when first we set our foot to tread the course i trod with man to guide my steps who leads me now is god your young men shall see visions and in my youth i saw and paid obedience to man's visionary law your old men shall dream dreams and in my age a hand conducts me through the cloud round law to where i stand firm on its base no cause who before new effect i hold he saw the unexampled sin ordained the novel law whereof first instrument was first intelligence found loyal here i hold that failing human sense the very earth had oped sky fallen to efface humanity's new wrong motherhood's first disgrace earth oped not neither fell the sky for prompt was found a man and man enough head sober and heart sound ready to hear god's voice resolute to obey 
Ivan Ivanovitch, I hold, has done this day. No otherwise than did in ages long ago, Moses, when he made known the purport of that flow of fire athwart the law's twain tables, I proclaim Ivan Ivanovitch, God's servant. When the amen grew dull and died away and left acquittal plain adjudged, Amen. Last sighed the Lord. There's none shall say I grudged escape from punishment in such a novel case. Deferring to old age and a holy life, be grace granted, say I. No less, scruples might shake a sense firmer than I boast mine. Law's law, and evidence of breach therein lies plain. Blood red bright, all may see. Yet all absolve the deed, absolved the deed must be. So while the youngers raised the corpse, the elders trooped silently to the house, where halting, someone stooped, listened beside the door. All there was silent too. Then they held counsel, then pushed door, and, passing through, stood in the murderer's presence. Ivan Ivanovitch knelt, building on the floor that Kremlin rare and rich he deftly cut and carved on lazy winter nights. Some five young faces watched, breathlessly, as, to rights, piece upon piece he reared the fabric nigh complete. Stasha, Ivan's old mother, sat spinning by the heat of the oven, where his wife Katya stood baking bread. Ivan's self, as he turned his honey-coloured head, was just in the act to drop, twixt fir cones, each a dome, the scooped-out yellow gourd, presumably the home of Colocal, the big, the bell therein to hitch, an acorn cup was ready. Ivan Ivanovitch turned with it in his mouth. They told him he was free as heir to walk abroad. How of her ways? asked he. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Dagger of the Mind from Macbeth, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Nine, Tragedy and Humor, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Phone as the narrator, and Thomas Peter as Macbeth. A Dagger of the Mind from Macbeth, Act Two, Scene One. Macbeth, before the murder of Duncan, meditating alone sees the image of a dagger in the air, and thus soliloquizes. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not, fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation, proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain. I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshalst me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still, and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. Now o'er that one half-world nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hackett's offerings, and withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel on the wolf, whose howls his watch, Thus, with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides, Towards his design moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm set earth, Hear not my steps, which way they walk, For fear the very stones prate of my whereabout, And take the present horror from the time Which now suits with it. Whilst I threat, he lives, Words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. A bell rings. I go. 
and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Murder from Macbeth, Act Two, Scene Two, by William Shakespeare. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Nine, Tragedy and Humor, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator, Lian Yao as Lady Macbeth, and Craig Franklin as Macbeth. The Murder, from Macbeth, Act Two, Scene Two. Scene in the castle. Enter Lady Macbeth. That which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. What hath quenched them hath given me fire. Hark! Peace! It was the owl that shrieked, the fatal bellman, which gives the sterns to good night. He is about it. The doors are open, and the surfeited grooms do mark their charge with snores. I have drugged their possets, that death and nature do contend about them, whether they live or die. Macbeth, within. Who's there? What ho? Alack, I am afraid they have awaked, and tis not done. The attempt and not the deed confounds us. Hark, I lay their daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father... As he slept, I had done it. My husband! Enter Macbeth. I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owl scream, and the crickets cry. Did you not speak? When? Now. As I descended? I. Hark! Who lies in the second chamber? Donald Bane. Macbeth, looking on his hands. This is a sorry sight. A foolish thought, to say a sorry sight. There's one did laugh in sleep, and one cried murder. That they did wake each other, I stood and heard them. But they did say their prayers and address them again to sleep. There are two, lodged together. One cried, God bless us, and amen the other. As they had seen me with these hangman's hands. Listening their fear, I could not say amen when they did say God bless us. Consider it not so deeply. But wherefore could not I pronounce amen? I had most need of blessing and amen stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be thought after these ways. So it will make us mad. Methought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the ravel sleeve of care, the death of each day's life sore labour's bath, bam of hurt minds, great nature's second curse, chief nourisher in life's feast. What do you mean? Still it cried, sleep no more to all the house. Glamis hath murdered sleep, and therefore Corda shall sleep no more. Macbeth shall sleep no more. Who was it that thus cried? Why, worthy Thane, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain-sickly of things. Go, get some water, and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go carry them, and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think what I have done. Look on to gain I dare not. Infirm of purpose. Give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms withal, for it must seem their guilt. Exit. Knocking within. Whence is that knocking? How is't with me, with every noise appalls me? What hands are here? Ha! They pluck out mine eyes. Will all great Neptune's oceans wash this blood clean from my hand? No, this my hand will rather 
the multitudinous seas in Cardine, making the green one red. Re-enter Lady Macbeth. My hands are of your colour, but I shame to wear a heart so white. Knocking. I hear a knocking at the south entry. Retire we to our chamber. A little water clears us of this deed. How easy it is then. Your constancy hath left you unattended. Knocking. Hark, more knocking. Get on your nightgown, lest occasion call us, and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. To know my deed, to best not know myself. Knocking. Wake, Duncan, with thy knocking. I would thou couldst. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Twa Corbys by Anonymous From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 9 Tragedy and Humour, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao as the narrator Thomas Peter as the first crow And Sonia as the second crow The Twa Corbys as I was walking all alone, I heard two corpies making a moan. The time unto the dover say, Where shall we gang and dine today? In behind yon old fail dyke, I would there lies a new sly knight, and nay body kens that he lies there, but his hawk, his hound, and lady fair. His hound is to the hunting gan, his hawk to fetch the wild fowl ham, his lady's tagging another maid, so we may make our dinner sweet. Ye'll sit on his white house bean, and I'll pick out his bonny blue een. With a lock of his golden hair, we'll seek our nest when it grows bare. Money a one for him makes mine, but none shall ken where he is gain. O'er his white banes, when they are bare, the wind shall blow forever mare. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sack of Baltimore by Thomas Osborne Davis From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Sack of Baltimore Baltimore is a small seaport in the barony of Carberry in South Munster. It grew up around the castle of O'Driscolls and was, after his ruin, colonized by the English. On the 20th of June, 1631, the crews of two Algerine galleys landed in the dead of the night, sacked the town, and bore off into slavery all who were not too old or too young or too fierce for their purpose. The pirates were steered up the intricate channel by one Hackett, a Dungarvan fisherman, whom they had taken at sea for the purpose. Two years later he was convicted of the crime and executed. Baltimore never recovered from this. The summer sun is falling soft on Carberry's hundred isles, the summer sun is gleaming still through Gabriel's rough defiles. Old Inishirkin's crumbled fane looks like a molting bird, and in a calm and sleepy swell the ocean tide is heard. The hookers lie upon the beach, the children cease their play, the gossips leave the little inn, the households kneel to pray, and full of love and peace and rest, its daily labor o'er, Upon that cosy creek there lay the town of Baltimore. A deeper rest, a starry trance, has come with midnight there. No sound except that throbbing wave in earth or sea or air. The massive capes and ruined towers seem conscious of the calm. The fibrous sod and stunted trees are breathing heavy balm. So still the night these two long barks round Dunnershed that glide must trust their oars, methinks not few, 
against the ebbing tide oh some sweet mission of true love must urge them to the shore they bring some lover to his bride who sighs in baltimore all all asleep within each roof along that rocky street and these must be the lover's friends with gently gliding feet a stifled gasp a dreamy noise the roof is in a flame from out their beds and to their doors rush maid and sire and dame and meet upon the threshold stone the gleaming sabres fall and over each black and bearded face the white or crimson shawl the yell of allah breaks above the prayer and shriek and roar o blessed god the algerine is lord of baltimore then flung the youth his naked hand against the shearing sword then sprung the mother on the brand with which her son was gored then sunk the grandsire on the floor his grandbabes clutching wild then fled the maiden moaning faint and nestled with the child but see yon pirate strangling lies and crushed with splashing heel while over him in an irish hand there sweeps his syrian steel though virtue sink and courage fail and misers yield their store there's one hearth well avenged in the sack of baltimore midsummer morn in woodland nigh the birds begin to sing they see not now the milking maids deserted is the spring midsummer day this gallant rides from the distant bandon's town these hookers crossed from stormy skull that skiff from effer down they only found the smoking walls with neighbors blood besprent and on the strewed and trampled beach a while they wildly went then dashed to sea and passed cape clear and saw five leagues before the pirate galleys vanishing that ravaged baltimore oh some must tug the galley's oar and some must tend the steed this boy will bear a shake's shibuk and that a base jareed oh some are for the arsenals by beauteous dardanelles and some are in the caravan to mecca's sandy dells the maid that bandon gallant sought is chosen for the day she's safe she's dead she stabbed him in the midst of his serai and when to die a death of fire that noble maid they bore she only smiled o oh, driscoll's child she thought of baltimore tis two long years since sunk the town beneath that bloody band and all around its trampled hearth a larger concourse stand where high upon a gallows tree a yelling wretch is seen tis hecket of dungarvan he who steered the algerine he fell amid a sullen shout with scarce a passing prayer for he had slain the kith and kin of many a hundred there some muttered of mac morrow who had brought the norman o'er some cursed him with iscariot that day in baltimore end of poem this recording is in the public domain the rose and the gauntlet by john sterling from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for librivox dot org by sonia as the narrator craig franklin as the knight and phone as the maiden the rose and the gauntlet low spake the knight to the peasant girl i tell thee sooth i am belted earl fly with me from this garden small and thou shalt sit in my castle's hall thou shalt have pomp and wealth and pleasure joys beyond thy fancy's measure here with my sword and horse i stand to bear thee away to my distant land take thou fairest this full-blown rose a token of love that as ripely blows with his glove of steel he plucked the token but it fell from his gauntlet crushed and broken the maiden exclaimed thou seest sir knight thy fingers of iron can only smite 
and like the rose thou hast torn and scattered, I in thy grasp should be wrecked and shattered. She trembled and blushed, and her glances fell, but she turned from the night and said, Farewell. Not so, he cried. Will I lose my prize? I heed not thy words, but I read thine eyes. He lifted her up in his grasp of steel, and he mounted and spurred with furious heel. But her cry drew forth her hoary sire, who snatched his bow from above the fire. Swift from the valley the warrior fled, swifter the bolt of the crossbow sped, and the weight that pressed on the fleet-foot horse was the living man and the woman's course. That morning the rose was bright of you, that morning the maiden was fair to view, but the evening sun its beauty shed on the withered leaves and the maiden dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Young Grey Head by Caroline Bowles Southey from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator. Craig Franklin as Ambrose. Lian Yao as Lizzie. Thon as the mother. And Jason in Canada as neighbor Mark. The young gray head. Grief hath been known to turn the young head gray, to silver over in a single day, the bright locks of the beautiful, their prime scarcely overpassed, as in the fearful time of Gallia's madness, that this crowned head, serene, that on the accursed altar bled, miscalled of liberty. O martyred queen, what must the sufferings of that night have been, that one that sprinkled thy fair tresses over with time's untimely snow? But now no more, lovely, august, unhappy one, of thee. I have to tell a humbler history, a village tale, whose only charm in sooth, if any, will be sad and simple truth. Mother! Quoth Ambrose to his swifty dame, so oft our peasants use his wife to name, father and master to himself applied, as life's grave duties matronize the bride. Mother! Quoth Ambrose as he faced the north, with hard set teeth, before he issued forth to his day labor from the cottage door. I'm thinking that, tonight if not before, there'll be wild work. Dost hear old Chewton roar? It's brewing up down westward, and look there, one of those seagulls. Aye, there goes a pair, and such a sudden thaw. If rain comes on, as threats, the waters will be out and on. That path, by the ford's a nasty bit of way, best let the young ones bide from school today. Do, mother, do! The quick-eared urchins cried, two little lasses to the father's side, close clinging, as they looked from him to spy the answering language of the mother's eye. There was denial, and she shook her head. Nay, nay, no harm will come to them. The mistress lets them off these short dark days an hour the earlier, and our Liz, she says, may quite be trusted, and I know tis true, to take care of herself and Jenny too. And so she ought, she's seven come first of May, two years the oldest, and they give away the Christmas bounty at the school today. The mother's will was law, alas for her, that hapless day, poor soul. She could not err, thought Ambrose, and his little fair-haired Jane, her namesake, to his heart he hugged again. When each had had her turn, she clinging so, as if that day she could not let him go. But labor's sons must snatch a hasty bliss in nature's tenderest mood, one last fond kiss. God bless my little maids, the father said and cheerily went his way to win their bread then might be seen the playmate parent gone what looks demure the sister pair put on not of the mother as afraid or shy 
or questioning the love that could deny but simply as their simple training taught in quiet plain straightforwardness of thought submissively resigned the hope of play towards the serious business of the day to me there's something touching i confess in the grave look of early thoughtfulness seen often in some little childish face among the poor not that wherein we trace shame to our land our rulers and our race the unnatural sufferings of the factory child but a stead quietness reflective mild betokening in the depth of those young eyes sense of life's cares without its miseries so to the mother's charge with thoughtful brow the docile lizzie stood attentive now proud of her years and of the imputed sense and prudence justifying confidence and little jenny more demurely still beside her waited the maternal will so standing hand in hand a lovelier twain gainsborough never painted no nor he of spain glorious murillo and by contrast shone more beautiful the younger little one with large blue eyes and silken ringlets fair by a nut-brown lizzie with smooth parted hair sable and glossy as the raven's wing and lustrous eyes as dark now mind and bring jenny safe home the mother said don't stay to pull a bough or berry by the way and when you come to cross the ford hold fast your little sister's hand till you're quite past that plank's so crazy and so slippery if not o'erflowed the stepping stones will be but you're good children steady as old folk i trust ye anywhere then lizzie's cloak a good grey duffel lovingly she tied and ample little jenny's slack supplied with her own warmest shawl be sure said she to wrap it round and knot it carefully like this when you come home just leaving free one hand to hold by now make haste away good will to school and then good right to play was there no sinking at the mother's heart when all equipped they turned them to depart when down the lane she watched them as they went till out of sight was no forefeeling scent of coming ill in truth i cannot tell such warnings have been sent we know full well and must believe believing that they are in mercy then to rouse restrain prepare and now i mind me something of the kind did surely haunt that day the mother's mind making it irksome to bide all alone by her own quiet hearth though never known for idle gossipry was jenny gray yet so it was that morn she could not stay at home with her own thoughts but took her way to her next neighbours half a loaf to borrow yet might her store have lasted out the morrow and with the loan obtained she lingered still said she my master if he'd had his will would have kept back our little ones from school this dreadful morning and i'm such a fool since they've been gone i've wished them back but then it won't do in such things to humour men our ambrose specially if let alone he'd spoil those wenches but it's coming on that storm he said was brewing sure enough well what of that to think what idle stuff will come into one's head and here with you i stop as if i'd nothing else to do and they'll come home drowned rats i must be gone to get dry things and set the kettle on his day's work done three mortal miles and more lay between ambrose and his cottage door a weary way god wot for weary white but yet far off the curling smoke in sight from his own chimney and his heart felt light how pleasantly the humble homestead stood down the green lane by sheltering shirley wood how sweet the wafting of the evening breeze in springtime from his two old cherry trees sheeted with blossom and in hot july from the brown moor track shadowless and dry how grateful the cool covert to regain of his own avenue that shady lane 
with the white cottage in the slanting glow of sunset glory gleaming bright below and jasmine porch his rustic portico with what a thankful gladness in his face silent heart homage plant of special grace at the lane's entrance slackening oft his pace would ambrose send a loving look before conceited the caged blackbird at the door the very blackbird strained its little throat in welcome with a more rejoicing note and honest tinker dog of doubtful breed all bristle back and tail but good and neat pleasant his greeting to the accustomed ear but of all welcomes pleasantest most dear the ringing voices like sweet silver bells of his two little ones how fondly swells the father's heart as dancing up the lane each clasps a hand in her small hand again and each must tell her tale and say her say impeding as she leads with sweet delay childhood's blessed thoughtlessness his onward way and when the winter day closed in so fast scarce for his task would dreary daylight last and in all weathers driving sleet and snow home by that bare bleak moor-track must he go darkling and lonely o oh, the blessed sight his pole-star of that little twinkling light from one small window through the leafless trees glimmering so fitfully no eye but his had spied it so far off and sure was he entering the lane a steadier beam to see ruddy and broad as peat-fed hearth could pour streaming to meet him from the open door then though the blackbird's welcome was unheard silenced by winter note of summer bird still hailed him from no mortal fowl alive but from the cuckoo clock just striking five and tinker's ear and tinker's nose were keen off started he and then a form was seen darkening the doorway and a smaller sprite and then another peered into the night ready to follow free on tinker's track but for the mother's hand that held her back and yet a moment a few steps and there pulled over the threshold by that eager pair he sits by his own hearth in his own chair tinker takes post beside with eyes that say master we've done our business for the day the kettle sings the cat in chorus purrs the busy housewife with her tea things stirs the doors made fast the old stuff curtain drawn how the hail clatters let it clatter on how the wind raves and rattles what cares he safe housed and warm beneath his own roof tree with a wee lassie prattling on each knee such was the hour hour sacred and apart warmed in expectancy the poor man's heart summer and winter as his toil he plied to him and his the literal doom applied pronounced on adam but the bread was sweet so earned for such dear mouths the weary feet hope shod stepped lightly on the homeward way so specially it fared with ambrose gray that time i tell of he had worked all day at the great clearing vigorous stroke on stroke striking till when he stopped his back seemed broke and the strong arms dropped nerveless what of that there was a treasure hidden in his hat a plaything for the young ones he had found a dormouse nest the living ball coiled round for its long winter sleep and all his thought as he trudged stoutly homeward was of naught but the glad wonderment in jenny's eyes and graver lizzie's quieter surprise when he should yield by guess and kiss and prayer heart won the frozen captive to their care twas a wild evening wild and rough i knew thought ambrose those unlucky gulls spoke true and gaffer Tutin never growls for naught i should be mortal mazed now if i thought my little maids were not safe housed before that blinding hailstorm ay this hour and more unless by that old crazy bit of board they've not passed dry foot over shallow ford that i'll be bound for swollen as it must be well if my mistress had been ruled by me but checking the half-thought as heresy he looked out for the home-star 
there it shone and with a gladdened heart he hastened on he's in the lane again and there below streams from the open doorway that red glow which warms him but to look at for his prize cautious he feels all safe and snug it lies down tinker down old boy not quite so free the thing thou sniffest is no game for thee but what's the meaning no look out to-night no living soul astir pray god all's right who's flitting round the peat stack in such weather mother you might have felt him with a feather when the short answer to his loud hello and hurried question are they come was no to throw his tools down hastily unhook the old cracked lantern from its dusty nook and while he lit it speak a cheering word that almost choked him and was scarcely heard was but a moment's act and he was gone to where a fearful foresight led him on passing a neighbour's cottage in his way mark fenton's him he took with short delay to bear him company for who could say what need might be they struck into the track the children should have taken coming back from school that day and many a call and shout into the pitchy darkness they sent out and by the lantern light peered all about in every roadside thicket hole nook till suddenly as nearing now the brook something brushed past them that was tinker's bark unheeded he had followed in the dark close at his master's heels but swift as light darted before them now be sure he's right he's on the track cried ambrose hold the light low down he's making for the water hark i know that wine the old dog's found the mark so speaking breathlessly he hurried on toward the old crazy footbridge it was gone and all his dull contracted light could show was the black void and dark swollen stream below yet there's life somewhere more than tinker's wine that's sure said mark so let the lantern shine down yonder there's the dog and hark oh dear and a low sob came faintly on the ear mocked by the sobbing gust down quick as thought into the stream leapt ambrose where he caught fast hold of something a dark huddled heap half in the water where it was scarce knee deep for a tall man and half above it propped by some old ragged side piles that had stopped and waste a broken plank when it gave way with the two little ones that luckless day my babes my lambkins was the father's cry one little voice made answer here am i twas lizzie's there she crouched with face as white more ghastly by the flickering lantern light than sheeted corpse the pale blue lips drawn tight white parted showing all the pearly teeth and eyes on some dark object underneath washed by the turbid water fixed as stone one arm and hand stretched out and rigid grown grasping as in the death gripe jenny's frock there she lay drowned could he sustain that shock the doting father where's the unriven rock can bite such blasting in its flintiest part as that soft sentient thing the human heart they lifted her from out her watery bed its covering gone the lovely little head hung like a broken snowdrop all aside and one small hand the mother's shawl was tied leaving that free about the child's small form as was her last injunction fast and warm too well obeyed too fast a fatal hold affording to the scrag by a thick fold that caught and pinned her in the river's bed while through the reckless water overhead her life breath bubbled up she might have lived struggling like lizzie was the thought that rived the wretched mother's heart when she knew all but for my foolishness about that shawl and master would have kept them back the day but i was wilful driving them away in such wild weather 
thus the tortured heart unnaturally against itself takes part driving the sharp edge deeper of a woe too deep already they had raised her now and parting the wet ringlets from her brow to that and the cold cheek and lips as cold the father glued his warm ones ere they rolled once more the fatal shawl her winding sheet about the precious clay one heart still beat warmed by his heart's blood to his only child he turned him but her piteous moaning mild pierced him afresh and now she knew him not mother she murmured who says i forgot mother indeed indeed i kept fast hold and tied the shawl quite close she can't be cold but she won't move we slipped i don't know how but i held on and i'm so weary now and it's so dark and cold oh dear oh dear and she won't move if daddy was but here poor lamb she wondered in her mind twas clear but soon the piteous murmur died away and quiet in her father's arms she lay they their dead burden had resigned to take the living so near lost for her dear sake and one at home he armed himself to bear his misery like a man with tender care doffing his coat her shivering form to fold his neighbour bearing that which felt no cold he clasped her close and so with little said homeward they bore the living and the dead from ambrose gray's poor cottage all that night shone fitfully a little shifting light above below for all were watchers there save one sound sleeper her parental care parental watchfulness availed not now but in the young survivor's throbbing brow and wandering eyes delirious fever burned and all night long from side to side she turned piteously plaining like a wounded dove with now and then a murmur she won't move and lo when morning as in mockery bright shone on that pillow passing strange the sight that young head's raven hair was streaked with white no idle fiction this such things have been we know and now i tell what i have seen life struggled long with death in that small frame but it was strong and conquered all became as it had been with the poor family all saving that which never more might be there was an empty place they were but three end of poem this recording is in the public domain high tide on the coast of lincolnshire time fifteen seventy one by jean ingelow from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humour part one read for librivox dot org by phone as the mother craig franklin as the old mayor lian yao as elizabeth jason in canada as the villagers and thomas peter as the son high tide on the coast of lincolnshire time fifteen seventy one the old mayor climbed the belfry tower the ringers rang by two by three pull if ye never pulled before good ringers pull ye best quoth he play up play up o boston bells ply all ye changes all ye swells play up the brides of enderby men say it was a stolen tide the lord that sent it he knows all but in mine ears doth still abide the message that the bells let fall and there was naught of strange beside the flight of mews and peewits pied by millions crouched on the old sea wall i sat and spun within the door my thread break off i raised mine eyes the level sun like ruddy ore lay sinking in the barren skies and dark against day's golden death she moved where lindis wandereth my son's fair wife elizabeth kisha 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 calling ere the early dews were falling far away i heard her song 
Kusha, Kusha, all along, where the reedy lindis floweth, 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 from the meads where melick groweth, faintly came her milking song. Kusha, 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 calling, for the dews will soon be falling. Leave your meadow grasses mellow, mellow, mellow. Quit your cowslips, cowslips yellow. Come up, white foot, come up, light foot. Quit the stalks of parsley hollow, hollow, hollow. Come up, jetty, rise and follow. From the clovers, lift your head. Come up, white foot, come up, light foot. Come up, jetty, rise and follow, jetty, to the milking shed. If it be long, I long ago, when I begin to think how long, again I hear the lindis flow, swift as an arrow, sharp and strong, and all the air, it seemeth me, been full of floating bells, says she, that ring the tune of Enderby. All fresh the level pasture lay, and not a shadow mote be seen, save where, full five good miles away, the steeple towered from out the green. And, lo, the great bell far and wide was heard in all the countryside that Saturday at eventide. The swanners, where their sedges are, moved on in sunset's golden breath, the shepherd lads I heard afar, and my son's wife, Elizabeth, till, floating o'er the grassy sea, came down that kindly message free, the brides of Mavis Enderby. Then some looked up into the sky, and all along where Lindus flows, to where the goodly vessels lie, and where the lordly steeple shows. They said, And why should this thing be? What danger lowers by land or sea? They ring the tune of Enderby. For evil news from Maplethorpe, of pirate galleys warping down, for ships ashore beyond the scorp, they have not spared to wake the town. But while the west been red to sea, and storms be none, and pirates flee, why ring the brides of Enderby? I looked without, and lo, my son, came riding down with might and main. He raised a shout as he drew on, till all the welkin rang again. Elizabeth! Elizabeth! A sweeter woman ne'er drew breath than my son's wife, Elizabeth. The old sea wall, he cried, is down. The rising tide comes on apace, and boats adrift in yonder town go sailing up the market place. He shook as one that looks on death. God save you, mother, straight he saith. Where is my wife, Elizabeth? Good son, where Lindis winds away, with her two bairns I marked her long, and ere yon tells began to play, afar I heard her milking song. He looked across the grassy sea, to right, to left, ho, Enderby, they rang the brides of Enderby. With that he cried and beat his breast, for lo, along the river's bed, a mighty eiger reared his crest, and up the lindis raging sped. It swept with thunderous noises loud, shaped like a curling snow-white cloud, or like a demon in a shroud. And rearing lindis, backward pressed, shook all her trembling banks amain. Then, madly at the eiger's breast, flung up her weltering walls again. Then banks came down with ruin and drought. Then beaten foam flew round about, then all the mighty floods were out. So far, so fast, the eiger drave, the heart had hardly time to beat before a shallow, seething wave sobbed in the grasses at our feet. The feet had hardly time to flee before it break against the knee, and all the world was in the sea. Upon the roof we sate that night, the noise of bells went sweeping by. I marked the lofty beacon light stream from the church tower, red and high, a lurid mark and dread to see, and awesome bells they were to me, that in the dark rang Enderby. They rang the sailors' lads to guide, from roof to roof who fearless rode, and I, my son, was at my side, 
and yet the ruddy beacon glowed and yet he moaned beneath his breath oh come in life or come in death how lost my love elizabeth and didst thou visit him no more thou didst thou didst my daughter dear the waters laid thee at his door ere yet the early dawn was clear thy pretty bairns in fast embrace the lifted sun shone on thy face down drifted to thy dwelling-place that flow strewed wrecks about the grass that ebb swept out the flocks to see fatal ebb and flow alas to many more than mine and me but each will mourn his own she said and sweeter woman ne'er drew breath than my son's wife elizabeth i shall never hear her more by the reedy linda's shore kisha 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 calling ere the early dews be falling i shall never hear her song kisha kisha all along where the sunny lindis floweth goeth floweth from the meads where melick groweth where the water winding down onward floweth to the town i shall never see her more where the reeds and rushes quiver shiver quiver stand beside the sobbing river sobbing throbbing in its falling to the sandy lonesome shore i shall never hear her calling leave your meadow grasses mellow 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 quit your cowslips cowslips yellow come up whitefoot come up lightfoot quit your pipes of parsley hollow 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 come up lightfoot rise and follow lightfoot whitefoot from your clovers lift the head come up jetty follow follow jetty to the milking shed end of poem this recording is in the public domain Rispa, seventeen by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humour part one read for librivox dot org by lian yao as the mother and thomas peter as willie Rispa, seventeen one wailing 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 the wind over land and sea and willie's voice in the wind oh mother come out to me why should he call me to-night when he knows that i cannot go for the downs are as bright as day and the full moon stares at the snow two we should be seen my dear they would spy us out of the town the loud black nights for us and a storm rushing over the down when i cannot see my own hand but am led by the creak of the chain and grovel and grip for my son till i find myself drenched with the rain three anything fallen again nay what was there left to fall i have taken them home i have numbered the bones i have hidden them all what am i saying and what are you do you come as a spy falls what falls who knows as the tree falls so must it lie four who let her in how long has she been you what have you heard why did you sit so quiet you have never spoken a word oh to pray with me yes a lady none of their spies but the night has crept into my heart and begun to darken my eyes five ah you that have lived so soft what should you know of the night the blast and the burning shame and the bitter frost and the fright i've done it while you were asleep you were only made for the day i have gathered my baby together and now you may go your way six nay for it's kind of you madam to sit by an old dying wife but say nothing hard of my boy i have only an hour of life i kissed my boy in the prison before he went out to die they dared me to do it he said and he never has told me a lie i whipped him for robbing an orchard once when he was but a child 
The farmer dared me to do it, he said. He was always so wild. And idle, and couldn't be idle, my Willie. He never could rest. The king should have made him a soldier. He would have been one of his best. 7. But he lived with a lot of wild mates, and they never would let him be good. They swore that he dare not rob the male, and he swore that he would. And he took no life, but he took one purse, and when all was done, he flung it among his fellows. I'll none of it, said my son. 8. I came into court to the judge and the lawyers. I told them my tale. God's own truth. But they killed him. They killed him for robbing the mail. They hanged him in chains for a show. We had always borne a good name. To be hanged for a thief, and then put away. Isn't that enough shame? Dust to dust, low down, let us hide. But they set him so high that all the ships of the world could stare at him passing by. God will pardon the hell-black raven and horrible fowls of the air, but not the black heart of the lawyer who killed him and hanged him there. 9. And the jailer forced me away. I had bid him my last goodbye. They had fastened the door of his cell. Oh, mother! I heard him cry. I couldn't get back, though I tried. He had something further to say, and now I never shall know it. The jailer forced me away. 10. Then, since I couldn't but hear that cry of my boy that was dead, they seized me and shot me up. They fastened me down on my bed. Mother! Oh, mother! He called in the dark to me year after year. They beat me for that. They beat me. You know that I couldn't but hear. And then at the last, they found I'd grown so stupid and still. They let me abroad again, but the creatures had worked their will. 11. Flesh of my flesh was gone, but bone of my bone was left. I stole them all from the lawyers. And you, will you call it a theft? My baby, the bones that had sucked me, the bones that had laughed and had cried. Theirs? Oh no, they are mine, not theirs. They had moved in my side. 12. Do you think I was scared by the bones? I kissed them. I buried them all. I can't dig deep, I am old, in the night by the churchyard wall. My willie will rise up whole when the trumpet of judgment will sound. But I charge you never to say that I laid him in holy ground. 13. They would scratch him up. They would hang him again on the cursed tree. Sin? Oh yes, we are sinners. I know. Let all that be, and read me a Bible verse of the Lord's good will toward men. Full of compassion and mercy, the Lord, let me hear it again. Full of compassion and mercy, long-suffering, yes, oh yes, for the lawyer is born but to murder, the Saviour lives but to bless, he'll never put on the black cap, except for the worst of the worst, and the first may be last, I've heard it in church, and the last maybe first. Suffering. Oh, long suffering. Yes, as a lord must know. Year after year, in the mist and the wind and the shower and the snow. 14. Heard, have you? What? They have told you he never repented his sin. How do they know it? Are they his mother? Are you of his kin? Heard. Have you ever heard when a storm on the downs began, the will that'll wail like a child, and the sea that'll moan like a man? 15. Election, election, and reprobation. It's all very well. But I go tonight to my boy, and I shall not find him in hell. For I cared so much for my boy that the Lord has looked into my care, and he means me, I'm sure, to be happy with Willie. I know not where. 16. And if he be lost, but to save my soul, that is all your desire. Do you think that I care for my soul, if my boy be gone to the fire? I have been with God in the dark. Go, go, you may leave me alone. You never have borne a child. You are just as hard as a stone. 17. Madam, I beg your pardon. I think that you mean to be kind. But I cannot hear what you say, 
for my willie's voice in the wind the snow and the sky so bright he used but to call in the dark and he calls to me now from the church and not from the gibbet for hark nay you can hear it yourself it is coming shaking the walls willie the moon's in the cloud good night i am going he calls end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Dream of Eugene Aram by Thomas Hood From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humour, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao as the narrator Thomas Peter as Eugene Aram Sonia as the boy And Phone as the sprite The Dream of Eugene Aram T'was in the prime of summer time, an evening calm and cool and four and twenty happy boys came bounding out of school there were some that ran and some that leapt like troutlets in a pool away they sped with games and minds and souls untouched by sin to a level mead they came and there they drave the wickets in pleasantly shone the setting sun over the town of lynn like sportive deer they coursed about and shouted as they ran turning to mirth all things of earth as only boyhood can but the usher sat remote from all a melancholy man his hat was oft his vest apart to catch heaven's blessed breeze for a burning thought was in his brow and his bosom ill at ease so he leaned his head in his hands and read the book between his knees leaf after leaf he turned at her nor ever glanced aside for the peace of his soul he read that book, in the golden even tide. Much study had made him very lean, and pale and leaden-eyed. At last he shut the ponderous tome, with a fast and fervent grasp, he strained the dusky covers close, and fixed the brazen hasp. O oh God, could I so close my mind, and clasp it with a clasp? Then, leaping on his feet upright, some moody turns he took now up the mead then down the mead and past a shady nook and lo he saw a little boy that pored over a book my gentle lad what is't you read romance or fairy fable or is it some historic page of kings and crowns unstable the young boy gave him an upward glance it is the death of abel the usher took six hasty strides, as smit with sudden pain, six hasty strides beyond the place, then slowly back again. And down he sat beside the lad, and talked with him of Cain. And long since then of bloody men, whose deeds tradition saves, and lonely folk cut off unseen, and hid in sudden graves, and horrid stabs in groves forlorn, and murders done in caves. And how the sprites of injured men shriek upward from the sod, ay, how the ghostly hand will point to show the burial clod, and unknown facts of guilty acts are seen in dreams from God. He told how murderers walk the earth beneath the curse of Cain, with crimson clouds before their eyes and flames about their brain, for blood has left upon their souls its everlasting stain. And well, quoth he, I know for truth their pangs must be extreme. Woe, woe, unutterable woe, who spill life's sacred stream. For why, methought last night I wrought a murder in a dream, one that had never done me wrong, a feeble man and old. I led him to a lonely field, the moon shone clear and cold. Now here, said I, this man shall die, and I will have his gold. Two sudden blows with a ragged stick, and one with a heavy stone, one hurried gash with a hasty knife, and then the deed was done. There was nothing lying at my feet but lifeless flesh and bone. Nothing but lifeless flesh and bone that could not do me ill. And yet I feared him all the more for lying there so still. There was a manhood in his look that murder could not kill. And lo, 
the universal air seemed lit with ghastly flame ten thousand thousand dreadful eyes were looking down in blame i took the dead man by his hand and called upon his name oh god it made me quake to see such sense within the slain but when i touched the lifeless clay the blood gushed out amain for every clot a burning spot was scorching in my brain my head was like an ardent coal my heart a solid ice my wretched wretched soul i knew was at the devil's price a dozen times i groaned the dead had never groaned but twice and now from forth the frowning sky from heaven's topmost height i heard a voice the awful voice of the blood avenging sprite thou guilty man take up thy dead and hide it from my sight and i took the dreary body up and cast it in a stream the sluggish water black as ink the depth was so extreme my gentle boy remember this is nothing but a dream down went the course with a hollow plunge and vanished in the pool and on i cleansed my bloody hands and washed my forehead cool and sat among the urchins young that evening in the school oh heaven to think of their white souls and mine so black and grim i could not share in childish prayer nor join in evening hymn like a devil of the pit i seemed mid holy cherubim and peace went with them one and all and each calm pillow spread but guilt was my grim chamberlain that lighted me to bed and drew my midnight curtains round with fingers bloody red all night i lay in agony in anguish dark and deep my fevered eyes i dared not close but stared aghast at sleep for sin had rendered unto her the keys of hell to keep all night i lay in agony from weary chime to chime with one besetting horrid hint that racked me all the time a mighty yearning like the first fierce impulse unto crime one stern tyrannic thought that made all other thoughts its slave stronger and stronger every pulse did that temptation crave still urging me to go and see the dead man in his grave heavily i rose up as soon as light was in the sky and sought the black accursed pool with a wild misgiving eye and i saw the dead in the river bed for the faithless stream was dry merrily rose the lark and shook the dewdrop from its wing but i never marked its morning flight i never heard it sing for i was stooping once again under the horrid thing with breath of speed like a soul in chase i took him up and ran there was no time to dig a grave before the day began in a lonesome wood with heaps of leaves i hid the murdered man and all that day i read in school but my thought was otherwhere as soon as the midday task was done in secret i was there and a mighty wind had swept the leaves and still the course was bare then down i cast me on my face and first began to weep for i knew my secret then was one that earth refused to keep or land or sea though he should be ten thousand fathoms deep so wills the fierce avenging sprite till blood for blood atones ay though he's buried in a cave and trodden down with stones and years have rotted off his flesh the world shall see his bones o oh god that horrid horrid dream besets me now awake again again with dizzy brain the human life i take and my red right hand grows raging hot like cranmer's at the stake and still no peace for the restless clay 
will wave or mould allow. The horrid thing pursues my soul. It stands before me now. The fearful boy looked up and saw huge drops upon his brow. That very night, while gentle sleep the urchin's eyelids kissed, two stern-faced men set out from Lynn through the cold and heavy mist, and Eugenia Ram walked between with gyves upon his wrist. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Engine Shed by William Wilkins from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by phone as the narrator. And Craig Franklin as Old Chris. In the Engine Shed. Through air made heavy with vapor's murk, O'er slack and cinders and heaps and holes, The engine driver came to his work, Burly and bluff as a bag of coals, With a thick gold chain where he bulged the most, And a beard like a brush and a face like a toast, And a hat half eaten by fire and frost, And a diamond pin in the folded dirt Of the shawl that served him for collar and shirt. Whenever he harnessed his steed of metal, the shovel-fed monster that could not tire, with limbs of steel and entrails of fire, above us it sang like a tea-time kettle. He came to his salamander toils in what seemed a devil's cast-off suit, all charred and discoloured with rain and oils, and smeared and suited from muffler to boot. Some wiping, it struck him, his paws might suffer, with a wisp of thread he found on the buffer. The improvement effected was not very great. Then he spat and passed his pipe to his mate. And his whole face laughed with an honest mirth, as any extant on this grimy earth welcoming me to his murky region. And had you known him, I tell you this, though your bright hair shiver and sink at its roots, O oh piano-fingering fellow collegian, you would have returned no cold salutes to the cheery greeting of old Chris, but locked your hand in the vice of his. For at night, when the sleet storm shatters and scatters, and clangs on the pane like a pile of fetters, he flies through it all with the world's love letters, the master of mighty leviathan motions that make for him storm when the nights are fair, and cook him with fire and carve him with air, while we sleep soft on the carriage cushions, and he looks sharp for the signals, blear-eyed. Often had Chris over England rolled me, you shall hear a story he told me, a dream of his rugged watch unwearied. The Story We were driving the Down Express, Will at the steam and I at the coal, Over the valleys and villages, Over the marshes and coppices, over the river deep and broad, through the mountain, under the road, flying along, tearing along. Thunderbolt engine, swift and strong, fifty tons she was, whole and soul. I'd been promoted to the express, I warrant I was proud and gay, it was the evening that ended May, and the sky was a glory of tenderness, we were thundering down to a midland town, it doesn't matter about the name, for we didn't stop there or anywhere for a dozen miles on either side. Well, as I say, just there you slide. With your steam shut off and your brakes in hand, down the steepest and longest grade in the land, at a pace that, I promise you, is grand. We were just there with the express when I caught sight of a girl's white dress on the bank ahead, and as we passed, you have no notion how fast. She sank back, scared from our baleful blast. We were going, a mile and a quarter a minute, with vans and carriages down the incline. But I saw her face and the sunshine in it. I looked in her eyes and she looked in mine, as the train went by, like a shot from a mortar, a roaring hell breath of dust and smoke, and it was a minute before I woke, when she lay behind us a mile and a quarter. And the years went on and the express Leaped in her black resistlessness, Evening by evening England through, Will, God rest him, was found 
a mash of bleeding rags in a fearful smash he made a christmas train at crew it chanced i was ill the night of the mess or i shouldn't now be here alive but thereafter the five o'clock out express evening by evening i used to drive and often i saw her that lady i mean that i spoke of before she often stood atop of the bank it was pretty high say twenty feet and back by a wood she would pick daisies out of the green to fling down at us as we went by we had grown to be friends to she and i though i was a stalwart grimy chap and she a lady i'd wave my cap evening by evening when i'd spy that she was there in the summer air watching the sun sink out of the sky oh i didn't see her every night bless you no just now and then and not at all for a twelvemonth quite then one evening i saw her again alone as ever but wild and pale climbing down on the line on the very rail while a light as of hell from our wild wheels broke tearing down the slope with their devilish clamours and deafening din as of giant hammers that smote in a whirlwind of dust and smoke all the instant or so that we sped to meet her never oh never had she seemed sweeter i let yell the whistle reversing the stroke down that awful incline and signal the guard to put on his brakes at once and hard though we couldn't have stopped we tattered the rail into splinters and sparks but without avail we couldn't stop and she wouldn't stir saving to turn us her eyes and stretch her arms to us and the desperate wretch i pitied comprehending her so the brakes let off and the steam full again sprang down on the lady the terrible train she never flinched we beat her down and ran on through the lighted length of the town before we could stop to see what was done yes i've run over more than one for a dozen i should say but none that i pitied as i pitied her if i could have stopped with all the spur of the train's weight on and cannily but it never would do with a lad like me and she a lady or had been sir we won't say any more of her the world is hard but i am her friend right through down to the world's end it is a curl of her sunny hair set in this locket that i wear i picked it off the big wheel there time's up jack stand clear sir yes we're going out with the express end of poem this recording is in the public domain revelry of the dying by bartholomew dowling from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin revelry of the dying supposed to be written in india while the plague was raging and playing havoc among the british residents and troops stationed there we meet neath the sounding rafter and the walls around are bare as they shout to our peals of laughter it seems that the dead are there but stand to your glasses steady we drink to our comrades eyes quaff a cup to the dead already and hurrah for the next that dies not here are the goblets glowing not here is the vintage sweet tis cold as our hearts are growing and dark as the doom we meet but stand to your glasses steady and soon shall our pulses rise a cup to the dead already hurrah for the next that dies not a sigh for the lot that darkles not a tear for the friends that sink we'll fall midst the wine cup sparkles as mute as the wine we drink so stand to your glasses steady tis this that the respite buys one cup to the dead already hurrah for the next that dies time was when we frowned at others we thought we were wiser then ha ha let those think of their mothers who hope to see them again no stand to your glasses steady the thoughtless are here the wise a cup to the dead already hurrah for the next that dies there's many a hand that's shaking there's many a cheek that's sunk but soon though our hearts are breaking they'll burn with the wine we've drunk so stand to your glasses steady tis here the revival lies a cup to the dead already hurrah for the next that dies there's a mist on the glass congealing 
tis the hurricane's fiery breath and thus does the warmth of feeling turn ice in the grasp of death ho stand your glasses steady for a moment the vapour flies a cup to the dead already hurrah for the next that dies who dreads to the dust returning who shrinks from the sable shore where the high and the haughty yearning of the soul shall sting no more ho stand your glasses steady the world is a world of lies a cup to the dead already hurrah for the next that dies cut off from the land that bore us betrayed by the land we find where the brightest have gone before us and the dullest remain behind stand stand to your glasses steady tis all we have left to prize a cup to the dead already and hurrah for the next that dies end of poem this recording is in the public domain the drummer boy's burial by anonymous from the world's best poetry volume 9 tragedy and humor part 1 read for librivox.org by lian yao the drummer boy's burial all day long the storm of battle through the startled valley swept all night long the stars in heaven o'er the slain sad vigils kept oh the ghastly upturned faces gleaming whitely through the night oh the heaps of mangled corpses in that dim sepulchral light one by one the pale stars faded and at length the morning broke but not one of all the sleepers on that field of death awoke slowly passed the golden hours of that long bright summer day and upon that field of carnage still the dead unburied lay lay there stark and cold but pleading with a dumb unceasing prayer for a little dust to hide them from the staring sun and air but the foemen held possession of that hard-won battle plain in unholy wrath denying even burial to our slain once again the night dropped round them night so holy and so calm that the moonbeams hushed the spirit like the sound of prayer or psalm on a couch of trampled grasses just apart from all the rest lay a fair young boy with small hands meekly folded on his breast death had touched him very gently and he lay as if in sleep even his mother scarce had shuddered at that slumber calm and deep for a smile of wondrous sweetness lent a radiance to the face and the hand of cunning sculptor could have added naught of grace to the marble limbs so perfect in their passionless repose robbed of all save matchless purity by hard unpitying foes and the broken drum beside him all his life's short story told how he did his duty bravely till the death tide o'er him rolled midnight came with ebon garments and a diadem of stars while right upward in the zenith hung the fiery planet mars hark a sound of stealthy footsteps and voices whispering low was it nothing but the young leaves or the brooklet's murmuring flow clinging closely to each other striving never to look round as they passed with silent shudder the pale courses on the ground came two little maidens sisters with a light and hasty tread and a look upon their faces half of sorrow half of dread and they did not pause nor falter till with throbbing hearts they stood where the drummer boy was lying in that partial solitude they had brought some simple garments from their wardrobe's scanty store and two heavy iron shovels in their slender hands they bore then they quickly knelt beside him crushing back the pitying tears for they had no time for weeping nor for any girlish fears and they rode the icy body while no glow of maiden shame changed the pallor of their foreheads to a flush of lambent flame for their saintly hearts yearned o'er it in that hour of sorest need and they felt that death was holy and it sanctified the deed 
but they smiled and kissed each other when their new strange task was o'er, and the form that lay before them its unwanted garments wore. Then with slow and weary labour a small grave they hollowed out, and they lined it with the withered grass and leaves that lay about. But the day was slowly breaking ere their holy work was done, and in crimson pomp the morning heralded again the sun. Gently then, those little maidens, they were children of our foes, laid the body of our drummer boy to undisturbed repose. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ramon, Refugio Mine, Northern Mexico, by Brad Hart. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator. Craig Franklin as Harry Lee. Lian Yao as the miner. And Thomas Peter as Ramon. Ramon, Refugio Mine, Northern Mexico. Drunk and senseless in his place, prone and sprawling on his face, more like brute than any man, alive or dead, by his great pump out of gear lay the peon engineer, waking only just to hear, overhead, angry tones that called his name, oaths and cries of bitter blame, woke to hear all this, and waking, turned and fled. To the man who bring to me, cried intendant Harry Lee, Harry Lee, the English foreman of the mine, bring the sot alive or dead, I will give to him, he said, fifteen hundred paces down, just to see the rascal's crown underneath this heel of mine, since but death deserves the man whose deed, be it vice or want of heed, stops the pumps that give us breath, stops the pumps that suck the death from the poisoned lower level of the mine. No one answered, for a cry from the shaft rose up on high, and shuffling, scrambling, tumbling from below, came the miners each, the boulder mounting on the weaker's shoulder, grappling, clinging to their hold, or letting go, as the weaker gasped and fell, from the ladder to the well, to the poisoned pit of hell, down below. To the man who sets them free, cried the foreman Harry Lee, Harry Lee, the English foreman of the mine. Brings them out and sets them free, I will give that man, said he. Twice the sum who with a rope face to face with death shall cope. Let him come who dares to hope. Hold your peaks, someone replied, standing by the foreman's side. There has one already gone, whoe'er he be. Then they held their breath with awe, pulling on the rope, and saw fainting figures reappear on the black rope swinging clear, fastened by some skilful hand from below till a score the level gained, and but one alone remained, he the hero and the last, he whose skilful hand made fast the long line that brought them back to hope and cheer. Haggard, gasping, down dropped he at the feet of Harry Lee, Harry Lee, the English foreman of the mine. I have come, he gasped, to claim both rewards, signor. My name is Ramon. I am the drunken engineer. I am the coward, signor. Here he fell over by that sign, dead as stone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At the Cedars by Duncan Campbell Scott from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for LibriVox.org by phone as the narrator and sonia as the foreman at the cedars you had two girls baptiste one is virginie hold hard baptiste listen to me the whole drive was jammed in that bend at the cedars the rapids were dammed, with the logs tight rammed and crammed, you might know the devil had clinched them below. We worked three days, not a budge. 
she's as tight as a wedge on the ledge says her foreman mon dieu boys look here we must get this thing clear he cursed at the men and we went for it then with our cant dogs a row we just gave he yo ho when she gave a big shove from above the gang yelled and tore for the shore the logs gave a grind like a wolf's jaws behind and as quick as a flash with a shove and a crash they were down in a mash but i and ten more all but isaac dufour were ashore he leaped on a log in the front of the rush and shot out from the bind while the jam roared behind as he floated along he balanced his pole and tossed us a song but just as we cheered up darted a log from the bottom leaped thirty feet fair and square and came down on his own he went up like a block with the shock and when he was there in the air kissed his hand to the land when he dropped my heart stopped for the first log had caught him and crushed him when he rose in his place there was blood on his face there were some girls baptiste picking berries on the hillside where the river curls baptiste you know on the still side one was down by the water she saw isaac fall back she did not scream baptiste she launched her canoe it did seem baptiste that she wanted to die too for before you could think the birch cracked like a shell in the rush of hell and i saw them both sink baptiste he had two girls one is virginie what god calls the other is not known to me end of poem this recording is in the public domain the sands of d by charles kingsley from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for librivox dot org by sonia as the narrator and lian yao as mary's parent the sands of d oh mary go and call the cattle home and call the cattle home and call the cattle home across the sands of d the western wind was wild and dank with foam and all alone went she the creeping tide came up along the sand and over and over the sand and round and round the sand as far as i could see the blinding mist came down and hid the land and never home came she oh is it weed or fish or floating hair a tress of golden hair a drowned maiden's hair above the nets at sea was never salmon yet that shone so fair among the stakes on d they rowed her in across the rolling foam the cruel crawling foam the cruel hungry foam to her grave beside the sea but still the boatmen hear her call the cattle home across the sands of d end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the loss of the royal george written when the news arrived seventeen eighty two by william cowper from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for librivox dot org by jason in canada on the loss of the royal george written when the news arrived seventeen eighty two toll for the brave the brave that are no more all sunk beneath the wave fast by their native shore eight hundred of the brave whose courage well was tried had made the vessel heel and laid her on her side a land breeze shook the shrouds and she was overset down went the royal george with all her crew complete toll for the brave brave kempenfelt is gone his last sea fight is fought his work of glory done it was not in the battle no tempest gave the shock she sprang no fatal leak she ran upon no rock 
His sword was in its sheath, His fingers held the pen, When Kempenfelt went down With twice four hundred men. Weigh the vessel up, Once dreaded by our foes, And mingle with our cup The tear that England owes. Her timbers yet are sound, And she may float again, Full charged with England's thunder, And plough the distant main. But Kempenfelt is gone, His victories are o'er, And he and his eight hundred Shall plough the wave no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Three Fishes by Charles Kingsley From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humour, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The Three Fishes Three fishes went sailing out into the west, out into the west as the sun went down. Each thought of the women who loved him the best, and the children stood watching them out of the town. For men must work, and women must weep, and there's little to earn and many to keep, though the harbour bar be moaning. Three wives sat up in the lighthouse tower, and trimmed the lamps as the sun went down, and they looked at the squall, and they looked at the shower, and the racket came rolling up, ragged and brown. But men must work, and women must weep, though storms be sudden, and waters deep, and the harbour bar be moaning. Three corpses lay out on the shining sands, in the morning gleam as the tide went down, and the women are watching and wringing their hands, for those who will never come back to the town. For men must work, and women must weep, and the sooner it's over, the sooner to sleep, and goodbye to the bar and its moaning. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Casa Bianca by Felicia Hemans From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9 Tragedy and Humour, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter as the narrator And Lian Yao as the Admiral's boy Casa Bianca Young Casa Bianca, a boy about thirteen years old, son of the Admiral of the Orient, remained at his post in the Battle of the Nile after the ship had taken fire and all the guns had been abandoned and perished in the explosion of the vessel when the flames had reached the powder the boy stood on the burning deck whence all but him had fled the flame that lit the battle's wreck shone round him o'er the dead yet beautiful and bright he stood as born to rule the storm a creature of heroic blood a proud though childlike form the flames rolled on he would not go without his father's word that father faint in death below his voice no longer heard he called aloud say father say if yet my task be done he knew not that the chieftain lay unconscious of his son speak father once again he cried if I may yet be gone. And but the booming shots replied, And fast the flames rolled on. Upon his brow he felt their breath, And in his waving hair, And looked from that lone post of death In still yet brave despair, And shouted but once more aloud, My father, must I stay? While o'er him fast, through sail and shroud, the wreathing fires made way. They wrapped the ship in splendor wild, they caught the flag on high, and streamed above the gallant child like banners in the sky. There came a burst of thunder sound. The boy, oh, where was he? Ask of the winds that far around with fragments strewed the sea. With shroud and mast and pennon fair, That well had borne their part, 
but the noblest thing that perished there was that young, faithful heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wreck of the Hesperus by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9 Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter as the narrator Craig Franklin as the old sailor Jason in Canada as the skipper And Sonia as the skipper's daughter The Wreck of the Hesperus It was the schooner Hesperus that sailed the wintry sea and the skipper had taken his little daughter to bear him company. Blue were her eyes as the fairy flax, her cheeks like the dawn of day, and her bosom white as the hawthorn buds that ope in the month of May. The skipper he stood beside the helm, his pipe was in his mouth, and he watched how the veering flaw did blow the smoke, now west, now south. Then up and spake an old sailor, had sailed the Spanish main. I pray thee, put into yonder port, for I fear a hurricane. Last night the moon had a golden ring, and tonight no moon we see. The skipper he blew a whiff from his pipe, and a scornful laugh laughed he. Colder and louder blew the wind, a gale from the northeast. The snow fell hissing in the brine and the billows frothed like yeast. Down came the storm, and smote amain the vessel in its strength. She shuddered and paused like a frighted steed, then leaped her cable's length. Come hither, come hither, my little daughter, and do not tremble so, for I can weather the roughest gale that ever wind did blow. He wrapped her warm in his seaman's coat against the stinging blast, he cut a rope from a broken spar, and bound her to the mast. Oh, father, I hear the church bells ring. Oh, say, what may it be? Tis a fog bell on a rock-bound coast. And he steered for the open sea. Oh, father, I hear the sound of guns. Oh, say, what may it be? Some ship in distress that cannot live in such an angry sea. Oh, father, I see a gleaming light. Oh, say, what may it be? But the father answered never a word. A frozen corpse was he. Lashed to the helm, all stiff and stark, with his face turned to the skies, the lantern gleamed through the gleaming snow on his fixed and glassy eyes. Then the maiden clasped her hands and prayed that saved she might be. And she thought of Christ, who stilled the wave on the lake of Galilee. And fast through the midnight dark and drear, through the whistling sleet and snow, like a sheeted ghost the vessel swept towards the reef of Norman's woe. And ever the fitful gusts between, a sound came from the land. It was the sound of the trampling surf on the rocks and the hard sea sand. The breakers were right beneath her bows. She drifted a dreary wreck, and a whooping billow swept the crew like icicles from her deck. She struck where the white and fleecy waves looked soft as carded wool, but the cruel rocks had gored her side like the horns of an angry bull. Her rattling shrouds, all sheathed in ice, where the mast went by the board, like a vessel of glass, she stove and sank. Ho, ho, the breakers roared. At daybreak, on the bleak sea beach, a fisherman stood aghast to see the form of a maiden fair lashed close to a drifting mast. The salt sea was frozen on her breast, the salt tears in her eyes, and he saw her hair, like the brown seaweed, on the billows fall and rise. Such was the wreck of the Hesperus in the midnight and the snow. Christ save us all from a death like this on the reef of Norman's woe. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. The Second Mate by Fitz James O'Brien From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator And Craig Franklin as the Second Mate The Second Mate Ho oh, there, fisherman, hold your hand Tell me, what is that far away? There, where over the Isle of Sand Hangs the mist-cloud sullen and grey see it rocks with a ghastly life rising and rolling through clouds of spray right in the midst of the breakers strife tell me what is it fisherman pray that good sir was a steamer stout as ever paddled round cape race and many's the wild and stormy bout she had with the winds in that self-same place but her time was come and at ten o'clock last night she struck on that lonesome shore and her sides were gnawed by the hidden rock, and at dawn this morning she was no more. Come, as you seem to know, good man, the terrible fate of this gallant ship. Tell me about her all that you can, and here's my flask to moisten your lip. Tell me how many she had aboard, wives and husbands and lovers true. How did it fare with her human hoard? Lost she many, or lost she few? Master, I may not drink of your flask. Already too moist I feel my lip. But I'm ready to do what else you ask and spin you my yarn about the ship. Twas ten o'clock, as I said last night, when she struck the breakers and went ashore, and scarce had broken the morning's light when she sank in twelve feet of water or more. But long ere this they knew her doom, and the captain called all hands to prayer, and solemnly over the ocean's boom their orisons wailed on the troublous air, and round about the vessel there rose tall plumes of spray as white as snow, like angels in their ascension close, waiting for those who prayed below. So these three hundred people clung, as well as they could to spar and rope, with a word of prayer upon every tongue, nor on any face a glimmer of hope. But there was no blubbering weak and wild, of tearful faces I saw but one, a rough old salt who cried like a child, and not for himself, but the captain's son. The captain stood on the quarter-deck, firm but pale with a trumpet in hand. Sometimes he looked at the breaking wreck, sometimes he sadly looked to land. And often he smiled to cheer the crew, but, Lord, the smile was terrible grim, till over the quarter a huge sea flew, and that was the last they saw of him. I saw one young fellow with his bride, standing amidships upon the wreck. His face was white as the boiling tide, and she was clinging about his neck. And I saw them try to say goodbye, but neither could hear the other speak. So they floated away through the sea to die, shoulder to shoulder and cheek to cheek. And there was a child, but eight at best, who went his way in a sea she shipped, all the while holding upon his breast a little pet parrot whose wings were clipped. And as the boy and the bird went by, swinging away on a tall wave's crest, they were gripped by a man with a drowning cry, and together the three went down to rest. And so the crew went one by one, some with gladness and few with fear, cold and hardship such work had done, that few seemed frightened when death was near. Thus every soul on board went down, sailor and passenger, little and great. The last that sank was a man of my town, a capital swimmer, the second mate. Now, lonely fisherman, who are you that say you saw this terrible wreck? How do I know what you say is true? when every mortal was swept from the deck. Where were you in that hour of death? How did you learn what you relate? His answer came in an underbreath. Master, I was the second mate. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Sea Story by Emily Henrietta Hickey 
from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for LibriVox.org by sonia as the narrator jason in canada as jem and lian yao as bill a sea story silence a while ago shrieks went up piercingly but now is the ship gone down good ship well manned was she there's a raft that's a chance of life for one this day upon the sea a chance for one of two young strong are he and he just in the manhood prime the comelier verily for the wrestle with wind and weather and wave in the life upon the sea one of them has a wife and little children three two that can toddle and lisp and a suckling on the knee naked they'll go and hunger sore if he be lost at sea one has a dream of home a dream that well may be he never has breathed it yet she never has known it she but some one will be sick at heart if he be lost at sea wife and kids at home wife kids nor home has he give us a chance bill then all right jem quietly a man gives up his life for a man this day upon the sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain woman by anonymous from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for librivox dot org by sonia woman when eve brought woe to all mankind old adam called her woe man but when she wooed with love so kind he then pronounced her woman but now with folly and with pride their husbands pockets trimming the women are so full of whims that men pronounce them women end of poem this recording is in the public domain the women folk by james hogg from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. The Women Folk. Oh, silly may I rue the day I fancied first the women kind. For I, since then, I ne'er can hear a quiet thought or peace of mind. They have plagued my heart and pleased my eye, and teased and flattered me at will. But I, for her, their witchery, the pucky things, I love them still. Oh, the women folk, oh, the women folk, but they have been the wreck of me. Oh, weary for the women folk, for they winna let a body be. I had thought and thought, but dare not tell. I studied them with all my skill. I loved them better than myself. I've tried again to like them ill. Where serious strives will serious drew to comprehend what nay man can when he has done what man can do. He'll end at last where he began. Oh, the women folk, oh, the women folk, but they have been the wreck of me, or oh, weary for the women folk, for they winna let the body be. That they had gentle forms and meat, a man with half a look may see, and graceful airs and faces sweet, and waving curls aboon the bree, and smiles as soft as the young rose bud and e'en sae pocky bright and rare would lure the love rock frae the clod but lady seek to ken they may oh the women folk oh the women folk but they have been the wreck o me o oh, weary for the women folk for they winna let a body be even but this night nae fair the gain the date is neither lost nor lang I take your witness, Ilka Ain, how fell they fought and fairly dang. They point they've carried right or wrong, without the reason, rhyme or law, and forced a man to sing a song that ne'er could sing a verse of her. Oh, the women folk, oh, the women folk, but they have been the wreck of me, or oh, weary for the women folk, 
for they winna let the body be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Of a Certain a Man by Sir John Harrington From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9 Tragedy and Humour, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Of a Certain a Man There was, not certain when, a certain preacher That never learned, and yet became a teacher Who having read in Latin thus a text Of Irat Quidum Homo much perplexed he seemed the same with study great to scan in english thus there was a certain man but now quoth he good people note you this he saith there was he doth not say there is for in these days of ours it is most plain of promise oath word deed no man certain Yet by my text you see it comes to pass That surely once a certain man there was. But yet, I think, in all your Bible No man can find this text. There was a certain woman. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Women's Chorus by Aristophanes, translated from Greek by William Collins. From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humour, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Women's Chorus They're always abusing the women as a terrible plague to men. They say we're the root of all evil, and repeat it again and again of war and quarrels and bloodshed or mischief be what it may and pray then why do you marry us if we're all the plagues you say and why do you take such care of us and keep us so safe at home and are never easy a moment if ever we chance to roam when you ought to be thanking heaven that your plague is out of the way you all keep fussing and fretting where is my plague to-day if a plague peeps out of the window, up go the eyes of men. If she hides, then they all keep staring until she looks out again. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wives of Weinsberg by Gottfried August Birger Translated from the German by Charles Timothy Brooks from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humour, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org, by phone as the narrator. Jason in Canada as King Conrad. Sonia as the first townsman. Craig Franklin as the second townsman. And Thomas Peter as the pastor. The Wives of Weinsberg. Which way to Weinsberg, neighbour, say? Tis sure a famous city. It must have cradled in its day full many a maid of noble clay and matrons wise and witty, and if ever marriage should happen to me, a Weinsberg dame my wife shall be. King Conrad once, historians say, fell out with this good city, so down he came one luckless day, horse, foot, dragoons in stern array, and cannon, more's the pity around the walls the artillery roared and bursting bombs their fury poured but naught the little town could scare then red with indignation he bade the herald straight repair up to the gates and thunder there the following proclamation rascals when i your town do take no living thing shall save its neck now when the herald's trumpet sent these tidings through the city to every house a death knell went such murder cries the hot air rent might move the stones to pity then bread grew dear but good advice could not be had for any price then woe is me oh misery what shrieks of lamentation and kyrie eleison 
cried the pastors and the flock replied lord save us from starvation oh woe is me poor corridon my neck my neck i'm gone i'm gone yet oft when counsel deed and prayer had all proved unavailing when hope hung trembling on a hair how oft has woman's wit been there a refuge never failing for woman's wit and papal fraud of olden time were famed abroad a youthful dame praised be her name last night had seen her plighted whether in waking hour or dream conceived a rare and novel scheme which all the town delighted which you if you think otherwise have leave to laugh at and despise at midnight hour when culverine and gun and bomb were sleeping before the camp with mournful mien the loveliest embassy were seen all kneeling low and weeping so sweetly plaintively they prayed but no reply save this was made the women have free leave to go each with her choicest treasure but let the knaves their husbands know that unto them the king will show the weight of his displeasure with these sad terms the lovely train stole weeping from the camp again but when the morning gilt the sky what happened give attention the city gates wide open fly and all the wives come trudging by each bearing need i mention her own dear husband on her back all snugly seated in a sack full many a sprig of court the joke not relishing protested and urged the king but conrad spoke a monarch's word must not be broke and here the matter rested bravo he cried ha ha bravo our lady guessed it would be so he pardoned all and gave a ball that night at royal quarters the fiddles squeaked the trumpets blew and up and down the dancers flew court sprigs with city daughters the mayor's wife o oh, rarest sight danced with the shoemaker that night ah where is winesburg sir i pray tis sure a famous city it must have cradled in its day full many a maid of noble clay and matrons wise and witty and if ever marriage should happen to me a winesburg dame my wife shall be end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sorrows of Werther by William Makepeace Thackeray From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Sorrows of Werther Werther had a love for Charlotte such as words could never utter. Would you know how first he met her? She was cutting bread and butter charlotte was a married lady and a moral man was werther and for all the wealth of indies would do nothing for to hurt her so he sighed and pined and ogled and his passion boiled and bubbled till he blew his silly brains out and no more was by it troubled charlotte having seen his body borne before her on a shutter like a well-conducted person went on cutting bread and butter End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Well of St. Keen by Robert Southey. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator, Craig Franklin as the villager, and Jason in Canada as the traveler. The Well of St. Cain. In the parish of St. Neots, Cornwall, is a well arched over with the ropes of four kinds of trees, withy, oak, elm, and ash, and dedicated to St. Cain. The reported virtue of the water is this, that, whether husband or wife first drink thereof, they get the mastery thereby. Fuller. A well there is in the West Country, and a clearer one never was seen 
there is not a wife in the west country but has heard of the well of st cain an oak and an elm tree stand beside and behind does an ash tree grow and the willow from the bank above droops to the water below a traveller came to the well of st cain pleasant it was to his eye for from cockcrow he had been travelling and there was not a cloud in the sky he drank of the water so cool and clear for thirsty and hot was he and he sat down upon the bank under the willow tree there came a man from the neighbouring town at the well to fill his pail on the well side he rested it and bade the stranger hail now art thou a bachelor stranger quoth he for an if thou hast a wife the happiest draught thou hast drunk this day that ever thou didst in thy life or has your good woman if one you have in cornwall ever been for an if she have i'll venture my life she has drunk of the well of st keen i have left a good woman who never was here the stranger he made reply but that my draught should be better for that i pray you answer me why st keen quoth the countryman many a time drank of this crystal well and before the angel summoned her she laid on the water a spell if the husband of this gifted well shall drink before his wife a happy man thenceforth is he for he shall be master for life but if the wife should drink of it first heaven help the husband then the stranger stooped to the well of st cain and drank of the waters again you drank of the well i warrant me times he to the countryman said but the countryman smiled as the stranger spake and sheepishly shook his head i hastened as soon as the wedding was done and left my wife in the porch but if face she had been wiser than me for she took a bottle to church end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Bell of the Ball by Winthrop Mackworth Prade From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9 Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Bell of the Ball Years, years ago, ere yet my dreams had been of being wise or witty, ere I had done with riding themes, or yawned over this infernal chitty, Years, years ago, while all my joys were in my fowling peace and filly, in short, while I was yet a boy, I fell in love with Laura Lilly. I saw her at the county ball. There, when the sounds of flute and fiddle gave signal sweet in that old hall of hands across and down the middle, hers was the subtlest spell by far of all that sets young hearts romancing she was our queen our rose our star and then she danced oh heaven her dancing dark was her hair her hand was white her voice was exquisitely tender her eyes were full of liquid light i never saw a waist so slender her every look her every smile shot right and left a score of errors i thought twas venus from her isle and wondered where she'd left her sparrows she talked of politics or prayers of southey's prose or wordsworth's sonnets of danglers or of dancing bears of battles or the last new bonnets by candlelight at twelve o'clock to me it mattered not a tittle if those bright lips had quoted locke I might have thought they murmured little. Through sunny May, through sultry June, I loved her with a love eternal. I spoke her praises to the moon. I wrote them to the Sunday journal. My mother laughed. I soon found out that ancient ladies have no feeling. My father frowned. But how should gout see any happiness in kneeling? She was the daughter of a dean rich fat and rather apoplectic she had one brother just thirteen 
whose colour was extremely hectic. Her grandmother for many a year had fed the parish with her bounty. Her second cousin was a peer and lord lieutenant of the county. The titles and the three percents and mortgages and great relations and India bonds and tilts and rents, oh, what are they to love sensations? Black eyes, fair forehead, clustering locks, such wealth, such honours Cupid chooses. He cares as little for the stocks as Baron Rothschild for the muses. She sketched. The veil, the wood, the beach grew lovelier from a pencil shading. She botanized. I envied each young blossom in a boudoir fading. She wobbled handle. It was grand. She made the Catalina jealous. She touched the organ. I could stand for hours and hours to blow the bellows. She kept an album, too, at home, well filled with all an album's glories. Paintings of butterflies and Rome, patterns for trimmings, Persian stories, soft songs to Julius, cockatoo, fierce odes to famine and to slaughter, and autographs of Prince Libu, and recipes for elder water. And she was flattered, worshipped, bored. Her steps were watched, her dress was noted, her poodle dog was quite adored, her sayings were extremely quoted. She laughed, and every heart was glad, as if the taxes were abolished. She frowned, and every look was sad, as if the opera were demolished. She smiled on many just for fun. I knew that there was nothing in it. I was the first, the only one, her heart had thought of for a minute. I knew it, for she told me so, in phrase which was divinely moulded. She wrote a charming hand. And, oh, how sweetly all her notes were folded. Our love was most like other loves. A little glow, a little shiver, a rosebud and a pair of gloves, and fly not yet upon the river. Some jealousy of someone's air, some hopes of dying broken-hearted, a miniature, a lock of hair, the usual vows. And then we parted. We parted. Months and years rolled by. We met again four summers after. Our parting was all sob and sigh. Our meeting was all mirth and laughter. For in my heart's most sacred cell, there had been many other lodges. And she was not the ballroom's bell, but only Mrs. Something Rogers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Echo and the Lover by Anonymous from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the Lover and Phone as Echo. Echo and the Lover Echo mysterious nymph declare of what you're made and what you are air mid airy cliffs and places high sweet echo listening love you lie you lie thou dost resuscitate dead sounds hark how my voice revives resounds sounds i'll question thee before i go Come, answer me more apropos. Po, po. Tell me, fair nymph, if e'er you saw so sweet a girl as Phoebe Shaw. Pshaw. Say, what will turn that frisking coney into the toils of matrimony? Money. Has Phoebe not a heavenly brow? Is not her bosom white as snow? Ass, no. Her eyes, was ever such a pair? Are the stars brighter than they are? They are. Echo, thou liest, but can't deceive me. Leave me. But come now, thou saucy pert romancer, who is as fair as Phoebe? Answer. Answer.
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Echo by John Godfrey Sachs from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator and phone as Echo. Echo I asked of Echo t'other day, whose words are few and often funny, what to a novice she could say of courtship, love, and matrimony. Quoth Echo plainly, Matter of money. Whom should I marry? Should it be a dashing damsel gay and pert? A pattern of inconsistency or selfish mercenary flirt? Quoth Echo sharply, Nary flirt. What if, a weary of the strife that long has lured the dear deceiver, she promised to amend her life and sin no more? Can I believe her? Quoth Echo very promptly, Leave her. But if some maiden with a heart on me should venture to bestow it, pray should I act the wiser part to take the treasure or forgo it? Quoth Echo, with decision, Go it. But what if, seemingly afraid to bind her fate in Hymen's fetter, she vow she means to die a maid in answer to my loving letter? Quoth Echo, rather coolly, let her. What if, in spite of her disdain, I find my heart entwined about with Cupid's dear delicious chain so closely that I can't get out? Quoth Echo laughingly, Get out. But if some maid, with beauty blessed as pure and fair as heaven can make her, will share my labour and my rest till envious death shall overtake her? Quoth Echo, Sotto voce. Take her. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nothing to Wear by William Allen Butler. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9. Tragedy and Humor, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter S. Harry. And phone as Flora McFlimsy. Nothing to wear. Miss Flora McFlimsy, of Madison Square, has made three separate journeys to Paris, and her father assures me, each time she was there, that she and her friend Mrs. Harris, not the lady whose name is so famous in history, but plain Mrs. H., without romance or mystery, spent six consecutive weeks without stopping in one continuous round of shopping, shopping alone and shopping together at all hours of the day and in all sorts of weather, for all manner of things that a woman can put on the crown of a head or the sole of a foot, or wrap around her shoulders, or fit round her waist, or that can be sewed on, or pinned on, or laced, or tied on with a string, or stitched on with a bow, in front or behind, above or below. The bonnets, mantillas, capes, collars, and shawls, dresses for breakfasts and dinners and balls, dresses to sit in and stand in and walk in, dresses to dance in and flirt in and talk in, dresses in which to do nothing at all, dresses for winter, spring, summer, and fall, all of them different in colour and shape, silk, muslin, and lace, velvet, satin, and crepe, brocade and broadcloth and other material, quite as expensive and much more ethereal, in short, for all things that could ever be thought of, or milliner, modiste, or tradesman be thought of, from ten thousand francs robe to twenty sous frills, in all quarters of Paris, and to every store, while McFlimsy and Vane stormed, scolded and swore, they footed the streets, and he footed the bills. The last trip, the goods shipped by the steamer Arago, formed, McFlimsy declares, the bulk of a cargo, not to mention a quantity kept from the rest, sufficient to fill the largest-sized chest, which did not appear on the ship's manifest, 
but for which the ladies themselves manifested such particular interest that they invested their own proper persons in layers and rows of muslins, embroideries, worked underclothes, gloves, handkerchiefs, scarves, and such trifles as those. Then, wrapped in great shawls like Circassian beauties, gave good-bye to the ship and go-by to the duties. Her relations at home all marvelled, no doubt. Miss Flora had grown so enormously stout for an actual belle and a possible bride. But the miracle ceased when she turned inside out, and the truth came to light, and the dry goods beside, which, in spite of collector and custom-house sentry, had entered the port without any entry. And yet, though scarce three months have passed since the day this merchandise went on twelve carts up Broadway, this same Miss McFlimsey of Madison Square, the last time we met, was in utter despair, because she had nothing whatever to wear. Nothing to wear, now. As this is a true ditty, I do not assert, this you know is between us, that she is in a state of absolute nudity, like Powers' Greek slave or the Medici Venus. But, I do mean to say, I have heard her declare, when, at the same moment, she had on a dress which cost five hundred dollars, and not a cent less, and jewellery worth ten times more, I should guess that she had not a thing in the wide world to wear. I should mention just here that out of Miss Flora's two hundred and fifty or sixty adorers, I had just been selected as he who should throw all the rest in the shade by the gracious bestowal on myself after twenty or thirty rejections of those fossil remains which she called her affections, and that rather decayed but well-known work of art which Miss Flora persisted in styling her heart. So we were engaged— a troth had been plighted, not by moonbeam or starbeam, by fountain or grove, but in a front parlour, most brilliantly lighted, beneath the gas fixtures we whispered our love, without any romance or raptures or sighs, without any tears in Miss Flora's blue eyes, or blushes, or transports, or such silly actions. It was one of the quietest business transactions, with a very small sprinkling of sentiment, if any, and a very large diamond imported by Tiffany. On her virginal lips, while I printed a kiss, she exclaimed as a sort of parenthesis, and by way of putting me quite at my ease. You know, I'm to polka as much as I please, and flirt when I like. Now, stop, don't you speak, and you must not come here more than twice in the week or talk to me either at party or ball, but always be ready to come when I call. So don't prose to me about duty and stuff. If we don't break this off, there will be time enough for that sort of thing. But the bargain must be that, as long as I choose, I am perfectly free. For this is a kind of engagement, you see, which is binding on you, but not binding on me. Well... Having thus wooed Miss McFlimsey and gained her with the silks, crinolines, and hoops that contained her, I had, as I thought, a contingent remainder at least in the property, and the best right to appear as its escort by day and by night. And it being the week of the Stuckup's grand ball, their cards had been out a fortnight or so, had set all the avenue on the tiptoe. I considered it only my duty to call, and see if Miss Flora intended to go. I found her, as ladies are apt to be found, when the time intervening between the first sound of the bell and the visitor's entry is shorter than usual. I found, I won't say I caught her, intent on the pier-glass, undoubtedly meaning to see if perhaps it didn't need cleaning. She turned as I entered. "'Why, Harry, you sinner!' I thought that you went to the flashers to dinner. So I did, I replied, but the dinner is swallowed and digested, I trust, for it is now nine and more, so being relieved from that duty I followed inclination, which led me, you see, to your door. And now will your ladyship so condescend as just to inform me if you intend your beauty and graces and presence to lend, all of which, when I own, I hope no one will borrow, to the stuck-ups, whose party, you know, is to-morrow. The fair Flora looked up with a pitiful air, and answered quite promptly. Why, Harry, mon cher, 
I should like above all things to go with you there, but really and truly I've nothing to wear. Nothing to wear? Go just as you are. Wear the dress you have on, and you'll be by far, I engage, the most bright and particular star on the stuck of horizon. I stopped, for her eye, notwithstanding this delicate onset of flattery, opened on me at once a most terrible battery of scorn and amazement. She made no reply, but gave a slight turn to the end of her nose, that pure Grecian feature, as much as to say, How absurd that any sane man should suppose that a lady would go to a ball in the clothes, no matter how fine, that she wears every day. So I ventured again. Wear your crimson brocade, second turn up of nose. That's too dark by a shade. Your blue silk. That's too heavy. Your pink. That's too light. Wear tulle over satin. I can't endure white. Your rose coloured, then, the best of the batch. I haven't a thread of point lace to match. Your brown moire antique. Yes, and look like a Quaker. The pearl coloured. I would, but that plaguy dressmaker has had it a week. Then that exquisite lilac in which she would melt the heart of a Shylock. Here the nose took again the same elevation. I wouldn't wear that for the whole of creation. Why not? It's my fancy. There's nothing could strike it as more comme il faut. Yes, but dear me, that lean Sophronia Stuckup has got one just like it, and I won't appear dressed like a chit of sixteen. Then that splendid purple, that sweet mazarine, that superb point d'argile, that imperial green, that zephyr-like tarlatan, that rich grenadine. Not one of all which is fit to be seen, said the lady, becoming excited and flushed. Then where, I exclaimed, in a tone which quite crushed opposition, that gorgeous toilette which you sported in Paris last spring, at the grand presentation, when you quite turned the head of the head of the nation, and by all the grand court was so very much courted. The end of the nose was portentously tipped up, and both the bright eyes shot forth indignation as she burst upon me with the fierce exclamation. I have worn it three times at the least calculation, and that and most of my dresses are ripped up. Here I ripped out something, perhaps rather rash, quite innocent, though, but to use an expression more striking than classic, it settled my hash, and proved very soon the last act of our session. Fiddlesticks, is it, sir? I wonder the ceiling doesn't fall down and crush you. You men have no feeling. You selfish, unnatural, illiberal creatures, who set yourselves up as patterns and preachers. Your silly pretense. Why, what a mere guess it is. Pray, what do you know of a woman's necessities? I've told you and showed you I've nothing to wear, and it's perfectly plain you not only don't care, but you do not believe me. Here the nose went still higher. I suppose if you dared you would call me a liar. Our engagement is ended, sir, yes, on the spot. You're a brute and a monster, and I don't know what. I mildly suggested the words, hottentot, pickpocket and cannibal, tartar and thief, as gentle expletives which might give relief. But this only proved as a spark to the powder, and the storm I had raised came faster and louder. It blew when it rained, thundered, lightened, and hailed interjections, verbs, pronouns, till language quite failed to express the abusive, and then its arrears were brought up all at once by a torrent of tears, and my last faint, despairing attempt at an observation was lost in a tempest of sobs. Well, I felt for the lady, and felt for my hat too, improvised on the crown of the latter a tattoo, in lieu of expressing the feelings which lay quite too deep for words, as Woodsworth would say. Then, without going through the form of a bow, found myself in the entry, I hardly knew how, 
on doorstep and sidewalk past lamp-post and square at home and upstairs in my own easy chair poked my feet into slippers my fire into blaze and said to myself as i lit my cigar supposing a man had the wealth of the czar of the russias to boot for the rest of his days on the whole do you think he would have much to spare if he married a woman with nothing to wear since that night taking pains that it should not be bruited abroad in society i have instituted a course of inquiry extensive and thorough on this vital subject and find to my horror that the fair flora's case is by no means surprising but that there exists the greatest distress in our female community solely arising from this unsupplied destitution of dress whose unfortunate victims are filling the air with a pitiful wail of nothing to wear researches in some of the upper ten districts reveal the most painful and startling statistics of which let me mention only a few in one single house on the fifth avenue three young ladies were found all below twenty-two who have been three whole weeks without anything new in the way of flounced silks and thus left in the lurch are unable to go to ball concert or church in another large mansion near the same place was found a deplorable heart-rending case of entire destitution of brussels point lace in a neighbouring block there was found in three coals total want long continued of camel's hair shawls and a suffering family whose case exhibits the most pressing need of real ermine tippets one deserving young lady almost unable to survive for the want of a new russian sable still another whose tortures have been most terrific ever since the sad loss of the steamer pacific in which were engulfed not friend or relation for whose fate she perhaps might have found consolation or borne it at least with serene resignation but the choicest assortment of french sleeves and collars ever sent out from paris with thousands of dollars and all as to style most recherche and rare the want of which leaves her with nothing to wear and renders her life so drear and dyspeptic that she is quite a recluse and almost sceptic for she touchingly says that this sort of grief cannot find in religion the slightest relief and philosophy has not a maxim to spare for the victim of such overwhelming despair but the saddest by far of all these sad features is a cruelty practised upon the poor creatures by husbands and fathers real bluebeards and timones who resist the most touching appeals made for diamonds by their wives and their daughters and leave them for days unsupplied with new jewellery fans or bouquets even laugh at their miseries whenever they have a chance and deride the demands as useless extravagance one case of a bride was brought to my view too sad for belief but her last was too true whose husband refused as savage as charon to permit her to take more than ten trunks to sharon the consequence was that when she got there at the end of three weeks she had <laughs> nothing to wear and when she proposed to finish the season at newport the monster refused out and out for his infamous conduct alleging no reason except that the waters were good for his gout such treatment as this was too shocking of course and proceedings are now going on for divorce but why harrow the feelings by lifting the curtain from these scenes of woe enough it is certain has here been disclosed to stir up the pity of every benevolent heart in the city and spur up humanity into a canter to rush and relieve these sad cases instanter won't somebody moved by this touching description come forward to-morrow and head a subscription won't some kind philanthropist seeing that aid is so needed at once by these indigent ladies take charge of the matter or won't peter cooper the cornerstone layer of some new splendid superstructure like that which to-day links his name in the union unending of honour and fame and found a new charity just for the care of these unhappy women with nothing to wear which in view of the cash which would daily be claimed the laying out hospital well might be named won't stewart or some of our dry goods importers take a contract for clothing our wives and our daughters 
or to furnish the cash to supply these distresses and life's pathway strew with shawls collars and dresses for poor womankind won't some venturesome lover a new california somewhere discover oh ladies dear ladies the next sunny day please trundle your hoops just out of broadway from its whirl and its bustle its fashion and pride and temples of trade which tower on each side to the alleys and lanes where misfortune and guilt their children have gathered their city have built where hunger and vice like twin beasts of prey have hunted their victims to gloom and despair raise the rich dainty dress and the fine broidered skirt pick your delicate way through the dampness and dirt grope through the dark dens climb the rickety stair to the garret where wretches the young and the old half starved and half naked lie crouched from the cold see those skeleton limbs those frost-bitten feet all bleeding and bruised by the stones of the street hear the sharp cry of childhood the deep groans that swell from the poor dying creature who writhes on the floor hear the curses that sound like the echoes of hell as you sicken and shudder and fly from the door then home to your wardrobes and say if you dare spoil children of fashion you've nothing to wear and oh if perchance there should be a sphere where all is made right which so puzzles us here with the glare and the glitter and tinsel of time fade and die in the light of that region sublime where the soul disenchanted of flesh and of sense unscreened by its trappings and shows and pretence must be clothed for the life and the service above with purity truth faith meekness and love o oh, daughters of earth foolish virgins beware lest in that upper realm you have nothing to wear end of poem this recording is in the public domain the sea by eva l ogden from the world's best poetry volume nine tragedy and humor part one read for LibriVox.org by phone as the narrator and liang yao as the women the sea she was rich and of high degree a poor and unknown artist he paint me she said a view of the sea so he painted the sea as it looked today that aphrodite arose from its spray and it broke as she gazed on its face the while into its countless dimpled smile what a pokey stupid picture said she i don't believe he can paint the sea then he painted a raging tossing sea storming with fierce and sudden shock a towering mighty fastness rock in its sides above those leaping crests the thronging sea-birds built their nests what a disagreeable daub said she why it isn't anything like the sea then he painted a stretch of hot brown sand with a big hotel on either hand and a handsome pavilion for the band not a sign of water to be seen except one faint little streak of green what a perfectly exquisite picture said she it's the very image of the sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Proud Miss McBride, A Legend of Gotham, by John Godfrey Sachs, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humour, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org, by Craig Franklin as the narrator. Phone as Miss McBride. Jason in Canada as Jim. And Leanne Yao as the former friends. The Proud Miss McBride, A Legend of Gotham. Oh, terribly proud was Miss McBride, the very personification of pride, as she minced along in fashion's tide adown Broadway on the proper side. When the golden sun was setting, there was pride in the head she carried so high, pride in her lip and pride in her eye, and a world of pride in the very sigh that her stately bosom was fretting. Oh, terribly proud was Miss McBride, proud of her beauty and proud of her pride, 
and proud of fifty matters beside that wouldn't have borne dissection. Proud of her wit and proud of her walk, proud of her teeth and proud of her talk, proud of knowing cheese from chalk on a very slight inspection. Proud abroad and proud at home, proud whenever she chanced to come. When she was glad and when she was glum, proud as the head of a Saracen over the door of a tippling shop, proud as a duchess, proud as a fop, proud as a boy with a brand new top, proud beyond comparison. It seems a singular thing to say, but her very senses led her astray, respecting all humility in sooth, her dull auricular drum could find in humble only a hum, and heard no sound of gentle come in talking about gentility. What lowly meant she didn't know, for she always avoided everything low, with care the most punctilious, and queerer still the audible sound of supercilly she never had found in the adjective supercilious. The meaning of meek she never knew, but imagine the phrase had something to do with Moses, a peddling German Jew, who, like all hawkers the country through, was a person of no position. And it seemed to her exceedingly plain, if the word was really known to pertain to a vulgar German, it wasn't germane to a lady of high condition. Even her graces, not her grace, for that was in the vocative case, chilled with the touch of her icy face, set very stiffly upon her. She never confessed a favour aloud, like one of the simple common crowd, but coldly smiled and faintly bowed, as who should say, You do me proud, and do yourself an honour. And yet the pride of Miss McBride, although it had fifty hobbies to ride, had really no foundation, but, like the fabrics that the gossips devise, those single stories that often arise and grow till they reach a four-story size, was merely a fancy creation. Her birth indeed was uncommonly high, for Miss McBride first opened her eye through a skylight dim on the light of the sky. But pride is a curious passion, and in talking about her wealth and worth, she always forgot to mention her birth to people of rank and fashion. Of all the notable things on earth, the queerest one is pride of birth. Among our fierce democracy, a bridge across a hundred years without a prop to save it from sneers, not even a couple of rotten peers, a thing for laughter, fleers and jeers, is American aristocracy. English and Irish, French and Spanish, German, Italian, Dutch and Danish, crossing their veins until they vanish in one conglomeration. So subtle a tangle of blood, indeed, no heraldry Harvey will ever succeed in finding the circulation. Depend upon it, my snobbish friend, your family thread you can't ascend without good reason to apprehend. You may find it waxed at the farther end by some plebeian vocation, or worse than that, your boasted line may end in a loop of stronger twine that plagued some worthy relation. But Miss McBride had something beside her lofty birth to nourish her pride. For rich was the old paternal McBride, according to public rumour. And he lived uptown in a splendid square, and kept his daughter on dainty fare, and gave her gems that were rich and rare, and the finest rings and things to wear, and feathers enough to plume her. A thriving tailor begged her hand, but she gave the fellow to understand by a violent manual action. She perfectly scorned the best of his clan, and reckoned the ninth of any man an exceedingly vulgar fraction. Another, whose sign was a golden boot, was mortified with a bootless suit, in a way that was quite appalling, for though a regular suitor by trade, he wasn't a suitor to suit the maid, who cut him off with a saw and bade. The cobbler keep to his calling. A rich tobacconist comes and sues, and thinking the lady would scarce refuse, a man of his wealth and liberal views began at once with, If you choose, and could you really love him? But the lady spoiled his speech in a huff, with an answer rough and ready enough to let him know she was up to snuff and altogether above him. A young attorney of winning grace, was scarce allowed to open his face, ere Miss McBride had closed his case, 
with true judicial celerity for the lawyer was poor and seedy to boot and to say the lady discarded his suit is merely a double verity the last of those who came to court was a lively beau of the depper sort without any visible means of support a crime by no means flagrant in one who wears an elegant coat but the very point on which they vote a ragged fellow a vagrant now dapper jim his courtship plied i wish the fact could be denied with an eye to the purse of the old mcbride and really nothing shorter for he said to himself in his greedy lust whenever he dies as die he must and yields to heaven his vital trust he's very sure to come down with his dust in behalf of his only daughter and the very magnificent miss mcbride half in love and half in pride quite graciously relented and tossing her head and turning her back no token of proper pride to lack to be a bride without the mac with much disdain consented old john mcbride one fatal day became the unresisting prey of fortune's undertakers and staking all on a single die he founded bark went high and dry among the brokers and breakers but alas for the haughty miss mcbride it was such a shock to her precious pride she couldn't recover though she tried her jaded spirits to rally twas a dreadful change in human affairs from a place up town to a nook upstairs from an avenue down to an alley twas little condolence she had god what from her troops of friends who hadn't forgot the airs she used to borrow they had civil phrases enough but yet twas plain to see that their deepest regret was a different thing from sorrow and one of those chaps who make a pun as if it were quite legitimate fun to be blazing away at every one with a regular double-loaded gun remarked that moral transgression always brings retributive stings to candle-makers as well as kings for making light of serious things was a very wicked profession and vulgar people the saucy churls inquired about the price of pearls and mocked at her situation she wasn't ruined they ventured to hope because she was poor she needed a mope few people were better off for soap and that was a consolation and to make her cup of woe run over her elegant ardent plighted lover was the very first to forsake her he quite regretted the step twas true the lady had pride enough for two but that alone would never do to quiet the butcher and baker and now the unhappy miss mcbride the merest ghost of her early pride bewails her lonely position cramped in the very narrowest niche above the poor and below the rich was ever a worse condition moral because you flourish in worldly affairs don't be haughty and put on airs with insolent pride of station don't be proud and turn up your nose at poorer people in plainer clothes but learn for the sake of your mind's repose that wealth's a bubble that comes and goes and that all proud flesh wherever it grows is subject to irritation end of poem this recording is in the public domain. On an Old Moth by Frederick Locker Lampson From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humour, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao as the narrator And Jason in Canada as Uncle Barnaby On an Old Muff time has a magic wand what is this meets my hand moth-eaten mouldy and covered with fluff faded and stiff and scant can it be no it can't yes i declare tis aunt prudence's muff years ago twenty-three old uncle barnaby gave it to auntie p laughing and teasing prue of the breezy curls whisper these solemn charles what holds a pretty girl's hand without squeezing uncle was then a lad gay but i grieve to add gone to what's called the bad 
smoking, and worse. Sleek sable then was this, muff, lined with pinkiness, bloom to which beauty is seldom averse. I see in retrospect, aunt in her best bedecked, gliding with mean erect, gravely to meeting. Sambuk and kerchief new, peeked from the muff of prue. Young men, and pious too, giving her greeting. Pure was the life she led, then from her muff, tis said, tracks she distributed, scapegraces many, seeing the grace they lacked, followed her. One attacked prudence, and got his tract, oftener than any. Love has a potent spell. Soon this bold ne'er do well, aunt's sweet susceptible heart undermining, slipped, so the scandal runs, notes in the pretty nun's muff, triple cornered ones, pink as its lining. Worse, even, soon the jade fled to oblige her blade, whilst her friends thought that they'd locked her up tightly. After such shocking games, aunt is of wedded dame's gayest, and now her name's Mrs. Golightly. In female conduct flaw, sadder I never saw, still I faith in the law of compensation. Once uncle went astray, spoke, joked, and swore away, sworn by he's now by a large congregation. Changed is the child of sin, now he's, he once was thin, grave, with a double chin, blessed be his fat form. Changed is the garb he wore, preacher was never more prized than his uncle for pulpit or platform. If all as best befits, mortals of slender wits, then beg this muff and its fair owner pardon. All's for the best, indeed, such is my simple creed, still I must go and weed hard in my garden. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. How Patty Got Under Government by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada How Patty Got Under Government A place under government was all that Patty wanted. He married soon a scolding wife, and thus his wish was granted. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of the World's Best Poetry, Volume 9, Tragedy and Humor, Part 1.